hard time in the city My hair plugs ain't pretty Hard times in the city I'm feeling kinda bad That's right It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show to get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Welcome, welcome to the mop up for October 11th, 2021. You're a, you're a sweet, sweet crowd. And thank you, Professor Mike Steinel. He'll be joining us a little, litter, little, litter on, uh, <laughs> litter, a little later on in the show. John Ross coming up in about an hour and 10 minutes. Welcome to the mop up for October 11th, 2021. Well, we have an amazing show today. Fasten your airbags. It's going to be amazing. This is fasten your airbags. I'm about to talk about something that is going to blow your mind when it comes to Pandora, the Pandora papers. I did a little research over the weekend and I'll give you a little teaser. Fasten your airbags. This is going to be wild. A little later on, I'm going to tell you some stuff about the Pandora Papers that I've kind of uncovered that will, it, it'll just blow your mind. 
uh, it'll not only blow your mind, it'll swallow your mind. It won't spit it out. This is incredible stuff. As a teaser, I, I said about the Pandora Papers that if we sat down with Jerome Powell at the Federal Reserve and complained about the Pandora Papers, he would explain to me, no, no, you don't understand. This money has to be taken out of circulation. You don't. Under and everybody said, no, 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 no. So I did a little research and I'm going to tell you some stuff later on about your country, your Congress and our banking system. Thank you, Leslie, for that coffee. Thank you. I, I asked for a coffee enema. What am I supposed to do with this cup? All right. Thanks. Anyway, I oh, anyway, uh, Welcome to the mop up for October 11th, 2021. I'm David Feldman, barely coming to you from an air shaft <laughs> overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 75 degrees and partly sunny. And uh, I've had no sleep, just so you know, none whatsoever. Office hours this Friday night at 8 p.m. Meet Better People. And we have a big event over at the Ralph Nader Radio Hour this Sunday afternoon. Ralph Nader, Steve Scrovan, who co-hosts the Ralph Nader Radio Hour with me, and I are going to be hosting a town hall for members of Congress Club. If you're not a member of Congress Club, go right now to the Ralph Nader Radio Show website or go to nader.org. Sign up for Congress Club. If you'll notice in the Zoom room or if you're watching us on YouTube, there are phone numbers of our Congress people flashing below me. And I'm asking you to call these numbers and politely ask Josh Gottheimer, Nancy Pelosi, Senator Charles Schumer, Kirsten Sinema, and Joe Manchin to support Build Back Better at $3.5 trillion, not a penny less. I'll, I'll give those numbers out later. So go get a pen. One of the things Ralph Nader has taught us is write to your Congress people, write to your senators, call them, leave messages. That's the only way to affect change. And of course, protest. Let your voice be heard. Join Congress Club. Ralph will send you if you give him your zip code, he will send you ideas for letters to write to your congressional delegation, to your senators on how to move the progressive agenda forward. If you are already a member of Congress Club, you're going to be invited to meet with Ralph this Sunday via Zoom for a special congressional uh, town hall. So Congress Club is having a town hall. It's our first one. Please sign up for Congress Club by going to Nader.org or the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Sign up for Congress Club and come join us Sunday afternoon for a town hall meeting with Ralph Nader, Steve Scrovan, and me. So that's a little business I'm taking care of. And if you're watching me on YouTube, by the way, I've been looking at my YouTube channel. It's slowly growing. I'm kind of surprised about this. So if you're watching me on YouTube right now, please hit the like button and give us a good review. And wherever you're listening to this nonsense or watching this nonsense, give us a good review. And most importantly, share this show with people who you think would enjoy it. We're not for everybody. This is a bizarre program. We go six to seven hours. People, it's a certain type of listener. It's a certain type of viewer. If you know somebody who you think would enjoy this, please share the show with them. If you enjoy this show, one of the ways to thank us is by sharing us with your friends. We're also on Twitter now, uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm posting little two minute clips of the show on Twitter. And of course, friend me on Facebook. Well, Alan West was a congressman, African-American congressman from Florida. He served in Iraq where he held a gun to an Iraqi's head and fired it, causing permanent ear damage. He didn't 
shoot the Iraqi, but he fired the gun right next to his ear. He's that kind of guy. He's an African-American Republican who is now chairman of the uh, GOP in Texas, even though he was a congressman from Florida. And he's running for governor of Texas. He's trying to get the Republican nomination away from Governor Greg Abbott. He announced on Saturday that he and his wife have tested positive for COVID-19. And he said, even though he's not vaccinated, personal choice, you know, he's pushing seven. He may already be 70 or he's in his 60s. He should have gotten vaccinated. Personal choice. He said he was throwing Joe Rogan's kitchen sink at his COVID. He was uh, taking ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. Those are the two things, two drugs that Donald Trump was taking before he contracted COVID-19. And then uh, on Sunday, he said he was experiencing a low-grade fever and light body aches. And now he's got COVID pneumonia and he's in the hospital. We wish him well. We do. We're not rooting against these idiots, even though they're killing us. They are killing us. They refuse to get vaccinated. And then they go out in public. And if you ask them to wear a mask, they will kill you. They will try to kill you. That happened over the weekend here in New York City, where I bought my iPhone. I bought an Apple iPhone on 14th Street a couple of weeks ago. And a security guard working at Apple told one of the customers he couldn't come in because he wasn't wearing a mask. And the customer stabbed him. The guard was stabbed in the arm and once in the forehead, in the forehead. And uh, he's, thank, thank goodness, he's, uh, he was taken to the hospital, no life-threatening injuries. But this is what we're up against. There's so many important things that we should be taking care of right now. Jobs, evictions, the, you know, ending the war on terrorism, all these things. And we have to worry about getting stabbed by these Cretans who refuse to wear a mask. Unbelievable. Well, Kaiser Permanente, that's some good coffee. Kaiser Permanente is a nonprofit healthcare provider. They had revenues last year of $2.2 billion. Kaiser Permanente serves California, Washington, D.C., Oregon, and uh, several other states in America. When I lived in Los Angeles, I had Kaiser Permanente. Today, uh, a union representing 24,000 of Kaiser's 50,000 workers voted to authorize a strike over wages. Workers will not go on strike quite yet, but the threat of a strike will hang over negotiations that are going on right now between Kaiser and union reps. Meanwhile, in Hollywood, talks continue between the studios and IATSE, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, whose members voted to authorize a strike earlier this month. They're not yet on strike, but Yahtzee President Matthew Loeb said on Friday his patience with the studios is wearing thin, and he warned that a strike of nearly 50,000 Hollywood workers is a distinct possibility. 1,400 members of the Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco Workers, and Grain Millers International Union are striking Kellogg's in Michigan, Battle Creek, right? Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Nebraska. These Kellogg's workers produce ready to eat cereals like Rice Krispies, Raisin Bran, Fruit Loops, Corn Flakes, and Frosted Flakes. They are striking Kellogg's because Kellogg's is threatening to ship even more jobs down to Mexico if their workers, if Kellogg's workers don't accept salary cuts, reduced health care and retirement plans, as well as fewer 
vacation time. So I would assume, I don't know whether or not we should be, I, I wonder if it's like Nabisco where we should still buy Kellogg's, but only Kellogg's that is made in the United States. I will find out. I don't want to make a mistake of saying don't buy Kellogg's. A lot of people made that mistake with the Nabisco strike when in fact you were supposed to only buy Nabisco products made here in America. So I'm not going to tell you whether or not buying Kellogg's is a great idea quite yet. Well, nearly a year after Americans took to the streets to protest the murder of George Floyd and countless other unarmed African Americans, well, calls to defund the police, it turns out, are not coming about. They're, they are not defunding the police in the big cities. According to the New York Times, one year after the, the, the summer of protests, cities like Los Angeles and New York plan to boost spending on police, not defund police, boost spending on police in response to rising crime. New York has already added $200 million in additional funding to the police, and Los Angeles has increased spending on the police by 3%. United States representatives met with Taliban officials over the weekend, and Associated Press is reporting that America will provide humanitarian aid to Afghanistan, which is suffering an economic disaster ever since America pulled out. America and the Biden administration will not recognize the Taliban as the leader of Afghanistan, but we are providing some humanitarian aid. Today, Monday, is Columbus Day, which commemorates Christopher Columbus discovering the new world and the new world discovering smallpox and genocide. Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Monday is also National Coming Out Day, where millions of members of the LGBTQ community celebrate and encourage others to be proud of how they were born. So in honor of National Coming Out Day, I have an announcement. Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina is a bachelor. I thought I would do that for him. He is a bachelor. Monday is also the Boston Marathon. Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema is running today in the Boston Marathon. She says she's not hoping to win. She just plans to slow it down to a painful crawl by drawing needless attention to herself. Donald Trump wanted to appoint his daughter, Ivanka, to head the World Bank. There's a sentence I never thought I would utter seven years ago. President Donald Trump wanted to appoint his daughter, Ivanka, to, <laughs> to head the World Bank. Seven years ago, I would have bet my, you, I would have put, bet everything I don't have on that sentence not being true seven years ago. And so he wanted to make his daughter, Ivanka, the head of the World Bank. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, who has more ticks than the sheets at a Trump hotel, uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin uh, talked Trump out of this idea. That's according to The Intercept's Ryan Grimm and Max Uthberg. So Trump didn't succeed in appointing Ivanka to head the World Bank. He did, however, succeed in making Scott Baio chairman of the International Monetary Fund. So uh, that's something, you know, we took our eye off the International Monetary Fund and Scott Baio is making usurious loans to third world countries. Not true, just uh, making crap up. Kind of like Trump at his rally in Iowa on Saturday. House Minority Whip Steve Scalise, he's from Louisiana. He describes himself as David Duke without the baggage. He appeared on Chris Wallace's Fox Sunday 
And he would not he would not say that Joe Biden won the 2020 presidential election. Chris Wallace asked, do you think the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump? And Steve Scalise, who is part of the Republican leadership, refused to say that that Donald Trump lost and that Joe Biden is a legitimate president. ABC's Jonathan Carl reports Trump, when he was president, asked his director of national intelligence, John Radcliffe, to look into reports that China, I'm not making this up, to look into reports, Trump wanted him to look into reports that China had manipulated Georgia's 2020 election results to favor Joe Biden by using wireless thermostats sold in America by Google. Isn't that incredible? They can make a thermostat that throws a U.S. election, but nobody from Enterprise can tell me how to prevent my rental car's windshield from fogging up every time I decide to turn off the air conditioning in the middle of a blizzard. I swear to you, I rented a car last winter, and the only way I could see what was in front of me was by turning the air conditioner down in a freezing blizzard with black ice on the road. They can't get the thermostats to work over at Enterprise, but these wireless thermostats can throw an election in Georgia, Georgia or Georgia. Uh, Jonathan Carl from ABC writes, the, this Chinese thermostat fixing our elections theory was introduced to Trump by then United States Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Division of the Justice Department, Jeffrey Clark. I'm gonna talk about Jeffrey Clark for a second. Harvard graduate, Harvard graduate. By the way, Josh Gottheimer, Harvard Law. Jeffrey Clark, according to new reports from the Senate Judiciary Committee, violated Justice Department protocol in the waning days of the Trump administration by meeting in the Oval Office to plot the overturning of Georgia's presidential election results. Trump reportedly promised to make Jeffrey Clark the new attorney general in the waning weeks of the Trump presidency if Clark could somehow get the Justice Department on board and officially declare Biden's Georgia win corrupt. The Senate Judiciary Report, it came out last week, says Trump's White House counsel, Pat Chipolin, warned that such a move would result in mass resignations inside the Justice Department. And Chipolin also threatened to resign. So Trump backed off this idea. Nevertheless, this is worse than anything that happened in Watergate. And it's amazing. It's, it's truly amazing, not that there's an entire political party that sees nothing wrong with anything Trump has done. What's truly amazing is there's an entire political party on the other side that still hasn't been able to lock him up for this. The corruption isn't Trump. The corruption is that he's not already in prison. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. How is it possible that Trump has not been locked up or we haven't seen his tax returns? How is this possible? What does that tell you about the Democratic leadership? What does that tell you about Richard Neal, the Democratic Congressman from Massachusetts, who's chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, who could easily get his hands on Trump's tax returns and leak them, hasn't done it. Well, if you remember Georgia, it's a traditionally red state that Trump won in 2016, but it went for Joe Biden in 2020. As I said earlier, the Senate Judiciary Committee issued a report last week on Trump's 
blatant attempts to overturn the 2020 election results. It's worth taking a look at this report. It's entitled Subverting Justice, uh, how the former, this is what it's called, Subverting Justice, how the former president and his allies pressured the Department of Justice to overturn the 2020 election. It's an ama- It's a short read and it's all true. They've held hearings. They're getting their hands on more and more presidential documents from the archives. This is unbelievable. Not that it happened, that Trump is not in prison already. Trump reportedly coerced Justice Department officials to sign an official statement declaring they discovered enough voter irregularities in Georgia to justify Georgia convening a special legislative session to reverse the results of the presidential election in favor of Trump. Again, it's it's the Justice Department. You would think the Justice Department would turn around and prosecute Trump for this. That's my squeaky chair. Uh, the, The Judiciary Committee in the report says that after Attorney General Bill Barr stepped down on December 15th, 2020, saying there was no evidence of voter fraud, after Bill Barr resigned as Attorney General on December 15th, 2020, there were a flurry of calls and meetings between Trump and Justice Department officials during which Trump and his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, formerly Congressman Mark Meadows, one of the leaders of the Freedom Caucus, far right wing loon, Mark Meadows and Donald Trump urged Justice Department officials to file phony lawsuits, launch phony investigations, and lie to Georgia election officials and tell them their investigation shows evidence of corruption. Why did the Justice Department not immediately turn around and indict Donald Trump and Mark Meadows for this? Why does the Senate Judiciary Committee have to hold hearings when we have a a a Justice Department and an FBI that should be prosecuting Trump and Mark Meadows immediately. Remember Comey? When he was head of the FBI, he launched an investigation. Those days, I guess, are over. The FBI and the Justice Department will no longer investigate a president who's a criminal. That stopped with Comey. All these meetings and phone calls are in direct violation of everything, including the Hatch Act, which prohibits the president from using government employees for political purposes. The Hatch Act, I mean, really, you're going to cite the Hatch Act when overthrowing an American election is treason? It also violates a longstanding Department of Justice rule prohibiting the White House from discussing any criminal probes with the attorney general's office. The president is not allowed to call the attorney general and say, I think you should do an investigation into this person. I I, I think there's a crime here. The attorney general's office has to be independent. And you certainly can't dragoon the Justice Department into your attempts to overthrow an election. It's it's incredible, not that Trump did this. We knew he was going to do this. What's incredible is we don't have an FBI or a Justice Department that will stand up to this clown. Former Trump chief of staff, Mark Meadows, asked the Justice Department to meet with Trump's attorney, Rudy Giuliani. This was in late December. Mark Meadows, Trump's chief of staff, 
asked the attorney general to meet with Rudy Giuliani, who at the time was promoting Italy Gate. This is a new one for me. I didn't know about Italy Gate. This is came from the fevered mind of Rudy Giuliani, Italy Gate. It's his theory that the Central Intelligence Agency, which, as we all know, part of the deep, dark state that hates Trump, Italy Gate maintains, it's a theory that the CIA was working with an Italian contractor to manipulate Georgia's voting results by using satellites in the sky. This is like Marjorie Taylor Greene talking about the Rothschild family setting fires with space lasers. This is this is what we're dealing with. One of the, I mean, low hanging fruit like Rudy Giuliani. We always go after low hanging fruit in the Justice Department and the FBI. They went out. You now they got Paul Manafort and Roger Stone. You always lock up the Cretans first. They can't even go after Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani is still walking free. And as crazy as this all sounds, thermostats, fixing elections from China, or these Italian laser beams overturning Georgia election results, Trump, Trump understands something about the American voter, the Republican Party, because he understands marketing. Just keep repeating the same message over and over again until it gets branded into enough people's brains that they believe it. So he is pretty intent on galvanizing Republican voters around one issue to the exclusion of all others, and that is the election was stolen that Joe Biden is not a legitimate president. Every part of my being says this is not worth dignifying or paying attention to. It's so bogus. It's so patently fake. Why even read about it? But one of the things I've learned is you ignore the other side at your own peril. This is what Trump openly admitted. I don't know if you saw his Iowa rally on Saturday. He was surrounded by the Republican leadership. Grassley, the, the senator, the 85,000-year-old senator from Iowa, he was there. All the Republican mucky mucks from Iowa were there standing behind Donald Trump and showing support for him because he plans to run again for president. And he's going to run in Iowa. This is what uh, Donald Trump said out in the open, out in the open. He said, because his speech was mostly about how the election was stolen from him, even though he's lost 60 lawsuits. He's challenged the election 60 times. He's lost every challenge, every recount, the ones he paid for. The last one he paid for showed that Biden got even more ju- more votes in Maricopa, Arizona. This is just a blatant lie that's not worth dignifying, but his supporters believe it. And as I mentioned earlier, Steve Scalise, the Republican whip, would not say that Donald Trump lost in 2020. So even though I don't think this deserves respect, This is what the Democratic Party will be facing in 2022 and 2024. And Trump is just open about this. This is what he said in front of his crowd. He says, I'm telling you, the single biggest issue, as bad as the border is, and it's horrible, horrible what they're doing, they're destroying our country. But as bad as that is, The single biggest issue, the issue that gets the most pull, the most respect, the biggest cheers is talking about the election fraud of the 2020 presidential election. 
his antenna, you know, he didn't win the popular vote in 2016. He didn't win it in 2020, but he does have antenna. And what he's picking up is all the issues are too complicated for the Republican voters. Simplify. And the simplest, easiest calling card is they stole the election. Biden is illegitimate. Our democracy is at, is at stake. And it's working. It's working in the Republican Party. He's turning Ashley Babbitt into Horst Wessel. Remember Ashley Babbitt? She was the, the vet, <clears throat> the veteran who uh, was shot to death by Capitol Police as she tried to climb through a window. He's turned her into a, into a martyr. She was, her birthday was over the weekend and he recorded some message for her family. He is convincing the entire Republican Party and Republican voters that January 6th didn't happen. Mike Pence was making the rounds of talk shows this weekend, downplaying January 6th. He says, you don't judge my relationship with Donald Trump on one bad day. Really? So we shouldn't judge O.J. Simpson on that one bad day he had with Nicole and Ron Goldman. That's what Mike Pence is saying. They were calling to, to hang Mike Pence, but he's thinking the media is overreacting to January 6th. So again, if you think the midterms, which are right around the corner, are gonna be about immigration, inflation, climate change, Afghanistan, COVID, jobs, you're wrong. Trump is going to control the narrative, even though he's not running in 2022. The Republicans always control the narrative. And that narrative will be every Democrat, including Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin and Josh Gottheimer, are socialists. And Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. They stole the election. They are enemies of democracy. And the Democrats will be on their heels, backing up and defending themselves as we go into 2022, trying to prove that they're not socialists and that the election was legitimate while we ignore climate change, evictions, winter is coming, people are living on the street, starvation in our schools, kids are starving in our schools. The war on terror, he's gonna control the narrative. And he, he knows what he's doing because the Republicans, he knows that he can't run the Republicans on the issues, they're wrong on everything. It doesn't hold up to scrutiny. They're, if you debate raising taxes on corporations and the richest 1%, the Republicans can't win. They can't win on climate change. They can't win on anything. Nothing, therefore, can, can be proven to make sense. So you have to stir up insanity and lies like, Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. Low information voters are rampant throughout the Republican Party. And people who are on the fence are low information voters. If, if you are somebody who can't decide whether or not you're going to vote for Biden or Trump, you're a low information voter. And so you can sink your teeth into something as stupid as our democracy is under attack because Joe Biden stole the election. And uh, the Democrats are screwed. The Democrats are screwed. And it's basically their fault. Uh, the only thing 
that can lend legitimacy to a Biden presidency is build back better at $3.5 trillion. The only way to make Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer look legitimate to the voter is by passing Build Back Better at $3.5 trillion. Now, the president of the United States is the supposedly most powerful man on the planet. If Joe Biden really wanted Build Back Better at $3.5 trillion, do you think Kirsten Cinema, Mansion, or Gottheimer would get in his way if he really wanted it at $3.5 trillion? We've talked about this. You know, Trump is in Iowa on Saturday. Where's Joe Biden? He's at a, a relative's wedding. That's where he's at. He's literally going to a wedding. Why isn't he in West Virginia right now? Campaigning for Build Back Better. Why isn't he saying to Joe Manchin, I'm going to be in West Virginia selling Build Back Better to your voters? I hope you'll be on board. That's a big thing for a president to go to West Virginia or Arizona and say to Kirsten Sinema, I hope you're going to be on the, on the stage with me. If they don't appear on the stage with the president of the United States, they get primaried. But Joe isn't doing it. He thinks it can all be solved making backroom deals. So, listen, I hope he's right. But it better be $3.5 trillion. Uh, because even the people who think the election was stolen, who think Biden stole the election, they're not going to care if Biden stole it. They're still going to support Biden and the Democrats if Biden and the Democrats succeed in lowering prescription drug prices, provide dental, hearing aids, and eye care for Medicare recipients, universal preschool, free tuition at public colleges. You start making that $300 a month payment to kids permanent. The low information voter who's susceptible to believing Trump when he says Biden is an illegitimate president, they're going to say, well, maybe he stole the, maybe Trump's right, but I'm doing much better than I was when Trump was president. And that's the only way the Democrats win in 2022 and 2024. And if they don't win, it's over. You know what these Republicans are like. This Build Back Better bill at $3.5 trillion is the only thing that's keeping us right now from a full bore fascist state. It, it, it's, it's Mansion and Cinema and Gottheimer and Biden, Schumer and Pelosi. I mean, I, I, I don't really think Schumer, Pelosi and Biden want Build Back Better at 3.5 trillion because if they really wanted it, they could get it, but they don't want it. A new CBS YouGov poll is out. This is very upsetting. It shows that the Democrats have a messaging problem. Maybe it's a messaging problem, or maybe they really don't want Build Back Better to be passed. I prefer to think of it as a messaging problem. And again, the only thing that keeps a big red wave in 2022 is build back better at 3.5 trillion. And yet, and yet, according to this poll, most Americans only know what build back better costs and they have no idea what's in it. Whose fault is that? How is that possible that we're a couple of weeks past the deadline that Nancy Pelosi set to vote on Build Back Better. The deadline has passed. 
They're kicking the can down the road and only 10 percent of American voters know what's in the bill. 90 percent of Americans, the only thing they know about Build Back Better is what it costs. Why? How is that possible? When Lyndon Johnson was passing Medicare and Medicaid, Social Security, uh, when Roosevelt was passing Social Security, Americans knew what was at stake, what they were voting on. Nobody was talking about, oh, yeah, that $400 billion bill that Roosevelt once passed. It's too expensive. Well, what's in it? I don't know. Something about senior citizens. People knew it was Social Security. People knew it was Medicare in the 60s, Medicaid. Now it's just money. Why? Why are the Democrats only talking about money and not constantly driving home that Build Back Better expands Medicare coverage, that it lowers prescription drug costs, it provides a pathway to citizenship, perhaps, for the dreamers. It possibly gives us free universal daycare, free college at public universities. Why, after the deadline that Nancy Pelosi set, why do only 10% of Americans know this? What does that tell you? Why? Why don't Americans know this? The poll goes on to say that only one third of American voters think Build Back Better would benefit them personally. Two thirds of Americans think Build Back Better is for someone else. They don't know what's in it. They don't know about the, the, the massive spending on climate change, the new jobs that will come from attacking climate change. How is it possible that the Democrats can't message that? All Americans know is it costs $3.5 trillion. And according to the poll, the thing they know most about Build Back Better is it raises taxes. That's when you ask Americans, what is the one thing you know about Build Back Better? The, the thing they circle the most is it'll raise taxes. Yeah, on people making more than $400,000 a year, on corporations and billionaires. That they don't know. Now, when this poll, you go into the internals of the poll, and all polls eventually become what are called push polls where you say, are you for something? And you get a yes or no. And then a push poll is, well, would you be for this if I told you this about it, right? That's what a push poll is. And when, it, when this poll becomes a push poll, when the people asking the questions begin to describe what is in the bill, Americans support, they support Bill Back Better by an even larger margin. When the poll starts to push and explain the bill, Americans say they're in favor of increasing taxes so long as those increases are imposed on corporations and the richest 1%. They're for the IRS being given more money to go after tax cheats. A majority of Americans, 58% of us, favor increased funding for the Internal Revenue Service to collect money that is owed. That's a remarkable number when you consider the 40-year war that has been waged against the Internal Revenue Service by Reagan Republicans, Bush and Trump Republicans. They have demonized the Internal Revenue Service, and yet 58% of us think the IRS is underfunded, which it is. They have not increased funding 
for the IRS in 40 years. So as the it's not keeping up with inflation, as our population grows in relation to the IRS, the population gets bigger and bigger and the IRS gets smaller and smaller. We have defunded the IRS. We have defunded the police. We have defunded the police. The IRS are the ultimate police. You don't pay your taxes, you're going to prison. Republicans, they have no problem defunding the IRS, and they have. Now, I mentioned on our last show that the head of the IRS told Congress he estimates that Our government leaves $1 trillion a year on the table. Each year, $1 trillion is left on the table because the IRS is understaffed. And it's been suggested that if we threw $60 billion at the IRS, we could go collect that $1 trillion. We don't need to raise taxes. We just need to collect the taxes that are already owed by corporations and by the richest 1%. There's a lot of money out there that the IRS can't collect because the richest 1% hires these tax attorneys who tie the IRS up in court. And so you're more likely to get audited for the income or the earned income tax credit, then if you're poor, you're going to get audited on the earned income tax credit more often than you are if you're Jeff Bezos. You're more likely to be audited if you're poor than if you're rich, because in America, we go after the low hanging fruit. And yet Rudy Giuliani, low hanging fruit, he's still walking free. Uh, I guess his fruit isn't hanging low enough. Americans, you know, I beat up on Americans, but we're, we're capable of being good people. Our country's been taken away from us. We have values. We see the value in taxation. We believe in taxation. The Washington Post did a story I think it was on Saturday, maybe Friday. And they cite a poll that says 87% of Americans think cheating on taxes is immoral. Isn't that interesting? 87% of us think cheating on our taxes is immoral. We've all been hearing that, you know, everybody cheats on their taxes. And, you know, Donald Trump gets applause when he says, of course, I pay little in taxes. I'm smart. And the Republicans applaud that. But that's not how most of us were raised. Most of us were raised. You want your roads and your bridges and your schools, pay your taxes. The Internal Revenue Service issues a report each year about unpaid taxes. This is stunning. And, and, you know, I beat up on the American people because we are a horrible, horrible people. But we're also, most of us are decent. This is what the Internal Revenue Service reports. Each year, 83.6% of federal taxes are paid voluntarily and on time. Think about that for a second. 80, 84% of Americans don't have to get a letter from the IRS. They pay their taxes on time. I, by the way, I filed an extension. So who are the, what is it, 83, 84, so that's 16% of Americans uh, don't pay their taxes on time. So some people have to file extensions. Only a rare few, though, avoid taxes by any means necessary. I 
I offer up the, uh, I'm going to say that 99.9999% of Americans pay their taxes voluntarily and have to file extensions sometimes because of a divorce or a death in the family. But it is that select 1% of the 1% who don't pay their taxes voluntarily. And they are un-American and they're our enemy. There was a story two weeks ago in the New York Times how this is legal, it's, it's, it's as outrageous as Donald Trump calling the Justice Department up and saying, hey, fix the election in my favor. And the Justice Department, which is supposed to prosecute that kind of stuff, not prosecuting Donald Trump. Again, why are we holding hearings? Why are we wasting time? holding hearings on a crime that has been committed. The FBI and the Justice Department were witnesses to a crime. They should have indicted and arrested Donald Trump immediately. Why does the the Senate Judiciary Committee have to hold hearings on this? It's black and white. And by that, I mean, if Donald Trump were black, he'd be in prison already. So there there was a story in the New York Times two weeks ago. It's incredible that nobody is arrested after this comes out. Tax lawyers and accountants, tax accountants who work at these big firms, part of their plan is to take sabbaticals from the big private firms to take low paying jobs over at the Internal Revenue Service. And when they go over to the Internal Revenue Service, they surreptitiously rewrite tax code to favor their former firm's top clients. And they do their time working for the IRS, one or two years for the IRS, and then they go back to their old firm and are immediately made partner and their salary at the very least, is doubled. So how can that be legal? It's the revolving door. At at a level of arrogance, I never dreamed possible. I know that people who work at the Pentagon go to work for Boeing and Raytheon. And that's kind of a bribe. But to waltz back and forth between the IRS and the accounting firms and to to rewrite tax code to favor your wealthy clients, you should be, this is why the guillotine was invented. So the Pandora Papers, this is what our country has become. We've been financialized. Everything is financialized now. And it only benefits the richest 1%. And we're left paying the taxes. And when they crash capitalism, we have to bail them out. I said on the last show that the biggest news to come out of the Pandora Papers is that America is now the number one tax haven in the world. It's incredible. We are, it's not Switzerland. It's not the Isle of Jersey. It's, it's not the Cayman Islands. It's America. We are the number one tax shelter, tax haven in the world for drug dealers, oligarchs, and corrupt politicians overseas. America is the safest place to hide your money if you're an overseas client or an American client. This is the safest place to hide your money from credit from creditors and the government. All you need to do 
is establish what is called a trust. And you set it up in Delaware, where Joe Biden is from, or South Dakota. And then your money is shielded from the glare of the Internal Revenue Service, creditors, prosecutors, ex-wives. I did some research over the weekend, and I read a report from the Tax Justice Network. America, this is unbelievable. This is absolutely unbelievable. And, and we live in a cloud, a fog of ignorance. We think we, think we know this country. We think we, we know what our leadership is about. We don't have a clue. And it's pure greed and corruption. According to the Tax Justice Network, America accounts for 22% of the world's offshore financial services. I know a lot of my listeners are flatlining right now when I talk about offshore accounts. These are purposely Byzantine. They're hard to understand. But the purpose, and I don't understand it, and you're not supposed to understand it, because if we understood it, we could find the money. It's a maze of complications, so we can't get the money. The purpose of an offshore account is to take ill-gotten gains and hide it from the police and the tax man or from people you owe money to. That's why people hide money overseas. Now, the important thing to remember here, this is what's key. This is what what blew my mind. When you put money into an offshore account, you're not just hiding the money, you're collecting interest on the money. I always thought that, okay, you know, I'm a drug dealer, I have a million dollars, you know, I want to put it in a bank for safekeeping. No. You want to find a financial services corporation that will take your $1 million, launder it, and then pay you interest, help you invest it. I didn't know that. I just assumed you, you'd be happy with the $1 million that you didn't deserve. You want to invest it, have it work for you. So these financial services companies in the Cayman Islands, in London, Switzerland, they're all competing for dirty money because they make money by holding on to dirty money because if they're paying interest to the Haitian baby doc, If they're paying him interest for the money he stole from Haiti, that means they're taking his money and lending it out. They're putting his money to work. They're competing for this money because they I never really understood this until over the weekend. Banks want dirty money because like any bank. You get to lend it to other people and make money off that money as long as you agree to pay some interest on it. So this is according to the Tax Justice Network. It says that while America demands financial transparency from places like Switzerland, the Cayman Islands, it doesn't go both ways. When when our FBI wants to prosecute somebody. We demand transparency. We want to see all the bank accounts in Switzerland and the Cayman Islands. But America, which has been the leader in calling for financial transparency, has refused to sign on to the transparency that they've demanded. America refuses to share information with any countries that are trying to track down stolen or hidden money kept inside an American trust. Because of our growing financial secrecy laws here in America, money stolen 
by government leaders or money earned from drug cartels or any other crime, it gets deposited here in the state, specifically Delaware or South Dakota, their banks, with no questions asked and no no observation, no transparency. This is how it works. And it's, a, it's I'm not that smart. So it takes me a while, to, especially when it comes to like these money things. This is how it works. The banks want foreign money, dirty foreign money, because they can invest it. They can put it to work. The house you bought in South Dakota, the money being lent to you, there's a good chance that that was drug money in a secret trust in South Dakota that the bank was putting to work so it could pay interest to the drug lord. It's incredible. So the uh, it all started 100 years ago. Congress was pressured by Wall Street. This was 1920, 1921, 100 years ago. Wall Street, 100 years ago, the banks urged the, the federal government to create opacity, to make it hard to, uh, to see what was in the bank account of a foreigner, foreigner's money. They wanted to get foreigners to deposit money in American banks. And the only way you can do that is by guaranteeing that nobody's going to look at your money. And how do you do that? Well, you pass a law, and that's what they did in 1921. You pass a law that says foreign money collecting interest in an American bank is not subject to taxation. So if you are a foreigner and you put a million dollars in an American bank and it collects, you know, I, I can't do the math, uh, you know, $10,000 a year in interest, you don't have to pay taxes on that. It's, it's not subject to the IRS. So of course, if you're a foreigner and you have a choice between depositing your money in my country like Haiti or in America, I'm going to put it in an American bank so I don't have to pay taxes on it. That's how it works. That's why people hide money in American banks. If you're a foreigner, you steal from your country, you're a drug dealer. You hide your money in America tax free. Now, if you're an American, you do what Tony Blair did. He's a Brit. What you do is you create an offshore company in the Virgin Islands, and that company is a foreign, is foreign money. And then you use that foreign, that, that company that was set up in the Virgin Islands to buy property in London that is not subjected to taxation. Or if you're Tony Blair, you somehow convince the British government that this money you've earned uh, constitutes money from a, a foreign entity. So the money's deposited in the Cayman Islands and Tony Blair doesn't have to pay taxes on it. I know this sounds a little confusing. It's supposed to be. And I hope I'm not making anybody feel stupid because I'm stupid, but I'm old enough to know that they want me to feel stupid about tax havens. They don't want us to know how this works. The bottom line is, if you're a foreigner, you can deposit money in an American bank collect interest tax-free. Park money in America, collect interest tax-free. It's incredible. Now, why does this go on? Why? 
Well, I kind of explained it. Dirty money, it turns out, benefits our banking system. The American banking system is built on dirty money, as is the, the, the strength of the dollar. Now, I'm going to talk about the trade deficit. I know this is hard to wrap your head around. I know it's complicated. I know it's hard to understand what the budget deficit is and the, the debt is and the relationship between the trade deficit and the strength of the dollar. So my suggestion is you learn this stuff. It's hard to learn. It's hard to remember and keep, keep it straight. But this, this stuff is how we get screwed by not knowing about the relationship between a strong dollar and a trade deficit. The banks for 100 years now have been lobbying Washington, D.C. to allow America to become a tax haven from the, for the rich, for the oligarchs, and for the drug dealers. Because as I said, the banks want that dirty money because they can lend it out. And they can also charge a hefty price to the oligarchs, to the drug dealers, to make sure that their money is invested properly. And they have convinced our government for the past 100 years that dirty money deposited in American banks helps our trade balance, the balance of trade. See, we don't manufacture that much anymore. So we have a trade imbalance and that makes for a weak dollar. So uh, we don't manufacture, we don't make anything. The banks have convinced Congress that if they're allowed to deposit dirty money in banks here in the United States, that decreases our trade deficit and bolsters the dollar. This is stuff I'm punching way out of my weight class here, but this is stuff we all need to learn. And because we haven't learned it, because our senators and Congress people haven't learned this, they get talked into allowing America to become the number one tax haven for drug dealers, because senators don't understand how money works. And when a banker, when Jamie Dimon says privately, I know it's unseemly that we're you know, holding money from the Sonola gang, but it's good for our economy. It strengthens the dollar. Better this drug money is here in the United States because it reduces the trade deficit and makes the dollar stronger. And senators and Congress people who understand this as much as I do go, oh, okay, Jamie. Okay, we won't prosecute you for money laundering. Wall Street, they got a great thing going. They ship jobs overseas. And then when we no longer manufacture anything, they make up the trade deficit by laundering money for oligarchs and drug dealers. And it, they can claim that it's helping the trade deficit. 1966, there were people in Washington who wanted to get rid of the tax exemption for foreign money. And a Senate report came out, and this is Democrats in 66, a Senate report came out and said outright that getting rid of the tax exemption for foreign money in American banks would chill further deposits from overseas, criminal, overseas criminals which would have an adverse effect on our balance of payments. That's the trade deficit, our balance of payments. They were just out in the open. 
they said, if we get rid of the, the tax exemption for foreign money, it'll affect our trade deficit. We need dirty money. It's incredible. And Chase, this is Jamie Dimon's bank, in the 60s, they wrote a series of memos to leaders in Washington whining that they couldn't compete with Switzerland in the, quote, lucrative field of hiding money, unquote. Chase, in these memos, complained that Americans were at a, American banks were at a disadvantage. They were, quote unquote, penalized by all the financial oversight. Chase, its business model was getting penalized by all the financial oversight, making America's banks less appealing to foreigners who wanted to hide money. As the banking sector grew, you know, the banks were not that big a part of our gross national product in the 60s and the 70s. And then by the time Reagan became president, and now with you know, Bill Clinton, the uh, financial sector is the largest sector of our GDP. As the banking sector grew, it gained more and more leverage in Washington, D.C. And it became transparent in its opacity. In other words, the banks were open, openly saying to the Federal Reserve and, and to the House and Senate banking committees, we, if you start looking into our deposits and, and you get rid of the, the tax exemption for foreign money, banks are not gonna be a good investment anymore. The Tax Reform Act of 1976, it was all out in the open. It made clear that Washington was intent on helping the banks turn America's financial services industry into tax havens for foreign capital. 1976, it was out in the open. Banks were looking to grow their business by offering secrecy and tax avoidance to foreign money. Florida Senator Dick Stone, <laughs> that was Dick Stone. That's a great name, Dick Stone. That, that should be the name of the guy who invented Viagra. Dick Stone, who was a Florida Senator. I'm in the well of the Senate in 1976, Florida Senator Dick Stone said, we have to keep foreign money exempt from taxation because I owe that to my constituents in Florida. Florida banks are staying in business because of foreign money. He said in Miami, one third of all money deposited in Miami banks came from Latin America. Well, who was depositing money in a Miami bank in 1976 from Latin America? Drug dealers, generals who had to leave, former presidents who looted their banana republic and needed to hide their money somewhere. In the debates, on the Senate floor in 1976 as to whether or not to pass the Tax Reform Act of 1976, Senator said out in the open, they warned that if we remove the tax exemption for foreign deposits, America's banks would not be able to compete with foreign banks for international deposits because secrecy, when it comes to globalization, secrecy benefits American banks. And as I said earlier, it strengthens the dollar. More money deposited 
in American banks means our balance of trade is not weak and our dollar gets strong. That's what the financialization of America has done to us. We no longer manufacture. We no longer make things here in America. Your iPhone, your iPad, your cars, your washing machine, it's all made in another country. How do you offset the trade imbalance and make the dollar strong? You take dirty money. You take drug dealers' money. You take the money from the Shah, from Baby Doc, from Putin, from the Russian oligarchs, and you deposit it in American banks. And that offsets the trade imbalance from not manufacturing anything. It's sick. And this whole country has been taken over by these financial charlatans. The whole country has become a money laundering operation. New York City, and I'm just talking about banks. I haven't even talked about real estate in Manhattan or London. We learned all about that five years ago when Donald Trump became president. He's not a bank. He's laundering money for drug dealers and oligarchs working with Deutsche Bank in Germany to clean up money, to hide it. And you walk around Manhattan and you, you see it. You see that this whole thing is a sham. The jobs at these retail outlets, it doesn't matter if they sell a shirt or don't sell a shirt. It's a money laundering operation. And that's why David Graeber was so prescient when he said most jobs are bullshit. Most jobs are bullshit because the work you're doing has nothing to do with the money being made. This whole country is a money laundering operation. The war in Afghanistan, Afghanistan didn't attack us on 9-11. That was a money laundering operation. And both parties are to blame. The Democrats are in bed with Wall Street. Obama and Hillary got more money from Goldman Sachs than McCain, Romney, and Trump. The Democrats are in on the laundering. Chuck Schumer is a bag man for Wall Street. Chuck Schumer, the senator from New York, the reason he's majority, why do you think he's majority leader? Because of his charisma? Because he carries bags of cash for Wall Street. Harvard, and he has two daughters who went to Harvard. So going back to that, that poll where how where I ask, how is it possible that only 10% of Americans know what's in Build Back Better? How is that possible? Well, I think it has something to do with Chuck Schumer not wanting Build Back Better or Joe Biden from Delaware wanting Build Back Better. Because Build Back Better would tax the people who put them in office. And America is one big tax avoidance scheme. Delaware is a state for one purpose, to avoid paying taxes. Biden was put there because he promised not to go after the credit card companies and not to tax foreign deposits or corporations. The only way to pay for Build Back Better is by taxing the money that's already owed to us. You think for one second, Schumer and Biden want to bite the hand that feeds them? 
Meanwhile, Pelosi was uh, with the Pope this weekend to uh, real estate wizards. I don't know who owns more real estate, the Catholic Church or Nancy Pelosi. It's close. This is uh, this is what we're up against with Build Back Better. Both parties don't want it because they know who has to pay for it. And the media, they're not going to report on this. They're not going to tell you that they're not going to tell you what's in Build Back Better because we get our news from corporations and millionaires. Rachel Maddow, 30 million a year, Rachel Maddow to read the news. Why do you think they give Rachel Maddow $30 million to buy her silence? And when you have $30 million, you align with the corporations. You don't want to be taxed. These news organizations, MSNBC, CNN, they're all funded by drug companies. All you see are ads for drug companies. And those ads, I've said this countless times, nobody sees an ad for Lafargean and says, hey, you know, my butthole is sealed shut. Have you heard about Lafarvin, doc? Nobody sees an ad and acts on it. The reason the drug companies advertise on CNN and MSNBC is to buy the silence of the news media, who at best, at best, MSNBC gives lip service to skyrocketing drug prices. But they benefit from skyrocketing drug prices. The more money the drug companies have, the more MSNBC can charge for advertising and pay Rachel Maddow $30 million a year. So they keep it, they keep all of us low information voters, even senior citizens don't understand what Medicare Part D is or Medicare Advantage. We have senior citizens who actually think Medicare Advantage is a good thing. How is it possible that 10% of Americans know what's in Build Back Better? Because it benefits everybody if we're ignorant, especially the consultants and the lobbyists who make a fortune rich people and corporations and the drug companies. They pay consultants and lobbyists fortunes to kill Build Back Better. There's more money in fighting Build Back Better than in supporting it. We're the lobbyists for us. Who do we, we have public citizen? Who do we have fighting for Medicare for all? When you look at what we're up against, they own the airwaves, they buy the advertising, they spread the disinformation about how if we negotiate drug prices, it'll only, I saw one ad, if, we, if we're allowed, if Medicare is allowed to negotiate drug prices, the prices of drugs will go up. And of course, it's running on CNN. And you think CNN is going to say uh, that ad we just ran about drug prices going up if Medicare can negotiate? That's a lie. That's a lie. It's in the best interest for the consultant class for 2022 to be the most important election of your lifetime. Because that means 2024 will be the most important election of your lifetime. And as long as we keep having these most important elections of our lifetime that boosts fundraising and ad spending and consultants get 15 percent of all the advertising that's bought. David Axelrod, who helped get Obama elected, was pissed off because he felt he was entitled to 15% of the ad buys in 2012. And Obama said, no, you're not getting it. These consultants get 15% of all the ad buys. So they want these elections to be tight. If it's a blowout, you don't need to advertise. They don't want landslides. The Democratic lobbyists, They don't 
when they go on CNN, like Joe Lockhart, who was he was always introduced as Bill Clinton's press secretary, never introduced as a lobbyist for the drug companies. He's not pushing for what's in the bill, even though he's a Democrat, because he's working for the drug companies. They're lobbyists. CNN doesn't tell you Joe Lockhart's a lobbyist or William Cohn, the former defense secretary. They don't tell you that he's a lobbyist for the military industrial complex. They don't want the consultants don't want a blowout in 2022. And there is a way for a blowout in 2022. Give the American voter what they want and need. If you pass Build Back Better, spend $3.5 trillion, puts the consultants out of business. You don't need consultants when you give Americans what they need. I'll give the numbers of our leaders who you should be calling. You are listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. I believe Johnny Ross should be here. Are you here, John? We've had a, we had a problem. I'm here. Oh, good. I just spilled some water. Uh, so. Oh, that's it. Mop, it's mopping it up. Well, this is the mop up. This is the mop up. All right. Are we doing this? Are we starting? What's going yeah, on? I only kept you waiting two minutes. Let me clear my throat with this. That's right. You're listening to the David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. Let us now go to Deerfield, Massachusetts. He's still my friend, one of the few I have left. Say hello to gentleman farmer and comedy writer. You love him, John Ross. So we're doing we're doing this again. This has become a thing now. It's an insult. So so now we're we're recording a show on Indigenous Peoples Day. Do we have is there there's no respect at all? My wife is in the kitchen right now, uh, preparing a, an indigenous person for us to eat. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Normally we're vegan, but uh, right. today we yes. need a delicious indigenous person. And so uh, I, it seems very, so why, well, what are these phone numbers? What are these for? What, are, what, are, what am I supposed to call these people? Yes. And, and what, offer them money? Because that's <laughs> the only thing that's gonna, you know, well, why don't I call Steve Bannon while I'm at it? Hey, well, you should show <laughs> up. At the, like, these people don't care if I call them. They just want money. Unless I'm going to offer them, you know, a few million dollars, they have no interest in what I have to say. We, uh, Smigel and I worked on a show where we were offering fake money to senators. <laughs> as prank calls. And we got them on the phone. We yeah. got them on the phone. If you offer them money, they'll, they will talk to you. Yeah. But listen. Yeah. You call the, the numbers on the screen. Get a pen. I'm going to give you all the phone numbers. It does make a difference. It do, I'll give you an example of how it makes a difference. Tell me. Tell me how it makes a difference. Do you read the chat room? No. Ah, you'd be amazed at the number of guests who come on the show and fixate on comments in the chat room. Now, I love the people in the chat room. You, you don't care what the chat room says. People how, can, how can I pay attention to the chat room when I've got this scintillating, compelling, <laughs> this, 
is absolutely transfixing <laughs> conversationalist there in front of me who I have to try to keep up with. I'm going to put one eye on the chat room and hope that I can go toe to toe with David Feldman. Are you kidding me? I love you. Uh, <laughs> oh, somebody wanted you. Somebody. Well, anyway, so comment like comments. I, I have a friend who doesn't do the show anymore. He would go on YouTube and into iTunes and respond to the comments that people take these comments very seriously. So when you write a letter to your congressperson or senator or when you leave a message, as long as you're not a lunatic, it's heavily weighted. It is. Hey, why do you think, hang on? Let me challenge you on something. OK, why? Why does so much comedy stink? Now, it's because of YouTube. It's because of the like button. It's because performers are afraid they're going to get a thumbs down. And all the networks now are giving jobs to comedians who will get more likes than dislikes. People, it matters what people think that the TV executives want to know how many Twitter followers you have, and they want to know how many likes you have on iTunes. And if do, they see that. Do you think Joe Manchin gives a shit what anybody thinks? Yes. But, but the only people he gives a shit what they think are the executives at the fossil fuel companies who give him money. Those, those are the people he gives a shit what they think. He thinks uh, he doesn't care what people think, and neither does Kristen Cinema. If she did, they would have completely different attitudes. I I just cannot believe that they are doing this out of anything other than self interest. If you believe that, because human nature hasn't changed, and this country hasn't changed, it, it only seems to be getting worse because we're living through it. But this country has always been a shithole, and it's always been the greatest country on the planet simultaneously. You think we could have had this conversation in 33 about Social Security, and there were people who you couldn't move until you can. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's real. You have a daughter, don't you? I do. I still do. You, would you tell your daughter it doesn't matter? Your vote doesn't matter? That's why American I don't Idol? let her listen to this show. When you're watching American Idol, do you say your <laughs> vote doesn't count? Would you say that to her? No, I would never say anything uh, negative about, uh, what's that show, American Idol? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, here's, sure. another, here's another reason. It takes one, another reason. Ralph Nader says it takes one percent of the country. If you have one percent of the American people who want something bad enough, they can have it. Just one percent of the country. OK. All right. Well, I, I hope so. I'm uh, here's another reason. Um, I know you you're you've fallen out of love with Barack Obama. Yes, here's another, I still another, love him. He's like an ex-wife. Well, here's another reason. You can. Oh, no, he's not like an ex wife. I still love Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> um, here, here's another reason to dislike Barack Obama. He brought us that mope Merrick Garland. <laughs> That's that where mope. he comes from. That mope. He's a mope. He's a mope. He's, he's a, a mope. mope, right? Uh huh. That guy could be doing so much more if he just had. Some cojones, but the guy's <laughs> got sclimbats. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. He nothing. does nothing. And at these, you know, the whole time, remember before um, uh, McConnell uh, denied him a hearing, mm -hmm. the word on the street about Merrick Garland was this is a guy even the Republicans like. <laughs> right? Wasn't that the, the word on him? That's, that's why Obama picked him. And that's why Obama picked him is because, look, this is a guy that even the Republicans like. And now we see why. <laughs> yes. Yes. This is the perfect Republican judge. He, of course they like him. He's a what mope. did he do? What did he do? What did he do? That's nothing. That's the thing. <laughs> He's not doing anything. He, he could be. They could be charging these people. He's how come, you know, they're. Um, Defending the the Jean E. Carroll Jean uh, case, mm -hmm. 
they've decided to side with that the rapist. Bullshit. Yeah. It's a terrible decision. And, not, and the, it, there's so many people they could be all. What about the charges in the Mueller report? The 10 charges. He could just pick those up. Supposedly that was a map, right? It's like, here, right. if you want to charge obstruction of justice, here's 10 charges. Go ahead. Merrick right Garland, now he okay. could, he could do that right now. He could do that right now. Right. What's he busy doing? There, there's no statute of limitations. He could prosecute Trump right now. Absolutely. There's a million things he could be doing, and he's he's sitting on his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is incredible that they haven't prosecuted that that they're, that Trump is still walking free. That Giuliani they they don't even get the low hanging fruit. It's yeah. madness. They, yeah, they, they. That's the other thing that you know. You listen to this. Um, you know, one by one, the the people from the uh, January sixth subcommittee investigation or whatever they come on the radio and they go the american people they want to know the truth about what happened on january the american people know the truth it happened on tv we all watched it it's like find out the truth we watch people in fucking bear skins and horns with trump signs and trump tattoos like beating the fuck out of police and breaking windows hey let's find out what really happened Thanks, detective. You're going to figure this one out? <laughs> You're gonna absolutely gonna right. Like, and, and even still, you know, so much of the stuff is not. Ah. Well, you, you know, these books are coming in now. They've had nine months since yeah. January 6th. The Woodward book is pretty good. This Jonathan Carl book is even I, I like this thing about it was revealed that Donald Trump wanted to name Ivanka Trump as president of the World Bank. That's the big. I knew that two years ago. That wasn't something new or the big revelation in this Jonathan Carl book. He writes for ABC is that Kevin McCarthy was on the phone with Trump saying, you know, call call your jackals back. Call, and, and Trump said, well, apparently they're more upset about this election than you are. I knew that on January 7th. Yeah, we and all heard that. Car- yeah. And we Jonathan but they're presenting like explosive revelations in this new Jonathan Carl book. You're absolutely right. We need to get to the bottom. We know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> because we watch, and then it's, because we saw it on TV. Right. And then you're, yeah. and then you're, you're gaslit by these other people who are saying, what do you mean? They were tourists. They came in, they took a couple of pictures and they walked mm-hmm. around. You got an autograph and then they left. You know, and you go, OK, I guess I'm insane. I must have seen something else. Uh, it makes you crazy and it makes you think that, you know, it's one thing when it's just jerk offs on the street, you know, and you see them get interviewed saying stuff like that. But it's a guy it's like, oh, that guy's in Congress. That guy's a senator. And he's saying that. And n- n- there's nothing you can do. It, it, right. it makes you feel pretty hopeless. Hopeless and powerless because there, you know, I just spent a long time explaining how money laundering works and why it's in the best interest of our banking system to launder money, why it's profitable. And I barely understand this. It is the responsibility, not just of the media, but of the president of the United States to go on national television and explain this. You know, uh, Roosevelt, his fireside chats, he explained how the banking system worked. When he when when he shut the banks down, when he had that bank holiday, he explained to the American people how banks work. He knew that most of us don't understand banking. The Lendley's program, he went on the radio and explained what it means to lend a fire hose to somebody who's building is on fire. And so we're going to lend the brick. He would explain this. Nixon used to explain why he was going after the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Cambodia. He went on. a Nobody's nobody's teaching us. They want us in the dark. I mean, even Nixon explained things to us. But 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 to some extent, and, you know, I I don't want to keep blaming the American people. But, you know, 
you got bad students. You know what I mean? Like, look, my dad never went to college. My dad had a high school education, but a high school education then was like a college education. He was an intelligent guy. He was smart. He was well-read. You know, now you've got people who really have like a fifth grade education and they're walking around and, and Dunning Kruger, they're the ones who are absolutely certain that they know more than you and they've got the inside track and they're hearing the truth and they're, they're morons. There's no explaining to that. Why don't you write, let me give you an assignment. Where are the law offices of Dunning Kruger? We will take, <laughs> you will yeah. t- we will take your slip and fall all the way to the ICC, the International Criminal Court and The Hague. We are Dunning Kruger. <laughs> we will take yeah. it. That'd be a funny, uh, we're the law That's office. A funny Dunning sketch. Kruger. I just can't, it God forbid, sketches. God forbid somebody watching this show, give me $3 billion so I could hire a writing staff and keep all the money. And, just, yeah, and I right. can pay There's, them. I can pay, pay them $100 a week each. Hey, it, I had a bad, come on, man. I don't have any money. What about you that think that million? crawl across the bottom of the screen is free? <laughs> what about that $3 billion? Oh, uh, that's, uh, that's my milk money. Anyway. Well, what do you do? Yeah, it's frustrating. It's very it, frustrating. It, it, it is. So. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's always been this way, except for the planet dying. It's always. Yeah. Has it always been this way? I mean, has the voting been like so gerrymandered? So my black friend over here. I mean, 100 years ago, women women couldn't vote 100 years ago. Hey, hey, let's just think about that for a second before we. Let's, so, let's, let's just let that sink in and think about how far so we. So you're saying it, it was better. No. <laughs> no. Canceled. Uh, you're no, canceled. No. I am canceled. You can. You know. You see Chappelle special? I have not seen it. Interesting. But I, it does seem like the cancel thing is backfires. Like it just, I don't think his special would have gotten as much attention as it has if it, it hasn't been for this whole cancel thing. Like whatever happened to the old days when you, you said, hey, yeah, I watched this special, this one part of it, like really fucking sucked, it's stupid. And you just say that and that's what goes around. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. I, I used to think he was better, but he's not as good anymore. Like, as opposed to no, Netflix is not allowed to, they must ban him. Like then he has a, a reason to fight back but you can't fight back against people saying you you kind of sucks you know what i mean somebody called me to do stand up for 25 bucks the other night really is and i go they, <clears throat> then i go turn on dave chappelle's special you don't think i'm looking for reasons to cancel him wait you don't think i'm you don't you think the, the crime that dave chappelle has committed is how prolific and funny he is. And I'm being offered a $25 gig at a bar. I'm going to go over everything he says with a fine tooth comb to look for excuses to, to cancel him because I'll feel better about my comedy that way. Yeah. In all seriousness, the, he's so funny. Uh, he nice. really is. But, but the, the transgender stuff, it would be... It's, you know, he talks about this transgender person he knew who committed suicide. Anyway, it's, uh, he, I think it's sick what he's doing. It, but, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure it is sick and I'm sure it is uh, all the, these things and I'm sure I wouldn't like it. But I mean, I'm, my question is, is it really having an impact on, is it raising the amount of violence there is towards trans people? Is he having that kind of impact or is it just- One trans person he formed a relationship with killed herself Uh and he blamed Twitter 
and he lets himself off the hook. He doesn't maybe consider the the role he might have had in all that. It's worth watching. Right, but I I, I guess I will watch it. I I, ha- I asked the question: Does him just talking about that? raise the issue with people to think about it who wouldn't have thought about it before. Now they go, oh, a trans person who committed suicide. That is something that had never entered my consciousness. Now I've watched the special, it's entered my consciousness. I mean, are people like lighting torches and going out and going, oh, I saw Actually, the Dave he, Chappelle special. Actually, he blames a the left-wing Twitter cancel culture for her suicide. So he, I mean, he, watch the special. And tell me what you think. Okay. Here's my, by the way, today is National Coming Out Day. Did you know that? No, I did not know that. National Coming Out Day. And so I'll just prolong this conversation just a tad because coming out, when you come out, it's the hardest thing to do. It's the hardest thing you have to do to come out to yourself and then to your parents and your family. A lot of people can't do it because of how they were raised or where they live. And they can't love the way they want to love. And that makes them among the most vulnerable in our community. Sure. And of the LGBTQ, transgender people are the most likely to get beaten up and the most likely to commit suicide. As Dave Chappelle's friend makes evident of all the topics of all the people to fire your arrows at. Why transgender people? What what does that accomplish by? uh, What's the point? Of doing that. Why would Dave, of all the things that Dave Chappelle could talk about, especially right, Dave right. Chappelle, since he can talk about anything. But that, that so that, that's my point. Right. It, it, this is where that discussion belongs is comics talking, giving their opinion, and saying, gee, Dave Chappelle, why this? Why that? It's not, you know, you're so much better than that, as opposed to. We got to call Netflix. They've got to take that off the air or I'm leaving Netflix. Though artists have that right. You know what I mean? If another artist, uh, some somebody who was working with Netflix, who was transgender said, yeah, I'm not going to work with them anymore if that's what they're putting on. I and that's their that. right to yeah. do. And, and that's great. They, they <laughs> should do that. I'm just, this whole, the campaign to cancel, it's like, okay, now we got to get him. Like, you're not saying let's get him. You're just saying, I'm offering my opinion. He shouldn't do that. My opinion. Well, I, I say let's get him because he's a better comedian and more successful than I am. Right. But you got a lot of people to get ahead before you get to him. <laughs> Take a number, Dave Chappelle. Yeah. Well, w- w- laughter. Have you ever been laughed at? And doesn't laughter make things OK? In other words, if he's saying gender is a fact. Does that does that lend support to somebody who doesn't want their kids taught by a transgender person? Does that when he says gender is a fact, when he trivializes what these people are experiencing, is he empowering people not to hire transgender people to discriminate? I think he is. Having not seen it, I feel like I can't comment because I don't know what he said. So yeah, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but I, 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 I have so Okay, comment. We have five minutes. Uh, so I'll change the subject. I think when Jerry Falwell attacks gay people, it gets gay people killed. Uh, yeah. He's in a different ball game, though. I don't think it's the same. I don't think the people who are watching Chappelle's show have the same mindset and are accepting the information the same way the people who are watching Jerry Falwell. I think that's a different set of people and it's coming from a different place and and, and there's a different um, authority that Falwell speaks with that Chappelle is not speaking how many with. People do, how many people do you think 
you know, I, I've said that there are people who are listening to this show and I have a small audience. There is probably a guy listening to this show who masturbates to rocks, who just gets a rock and stares at it and then jerks off to it. Wait, he gets his rocks off. <laughs> well, okay. So in other words, if you're reaching how many millions of people? Yeah. yeah, yeah. All it takes is putting one idea in somebody's head. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's true. But if you're going to get down to one, you know, if that's the case, then if you talk about rocks, then one person is going to come try to kill you because you said something bad about rocks. So <laughs> I don't think that's how you can, you know, decide what you want to say. You know well, what let me I mean? ask you a I, more I think, important question. Please. The peepers. Ah. Or the peepers this year. Or the or the leaves. You're not good with the leaves. leaves. What? What's going on with the leaves? You live in one of the most beautiful parts yeah. of the world, especially during autumn, right? Yeah, People this time of year. All the, over the world. The leaf peepers come to look. It, it's um it's all very dependent on the weather conditions and the season. And we, it seems like we've just had so much water uh, that the leaves have kind of drowned. The, you know, a lot of my fruit trees, like I've said, the fruit just sort of rotted on the tree, uh, just too much water. And it looks like there's plenty of beauty, but it's, it, the, a lot of them are going straight to yellow brown. They're not really stopping in that red orange place. They're going to red and then falling. It's nice, but, you know, they're also saying it's going to be a little later this year. So maybe in a couple of weeks, it'll be better. But right now it's kind of brown. Right. And the seas, are you excited about autumn and things slow down for you in the winter, right? You don't have to do as much. Don't have to do as much. I got to get playing a baseball tournament in January. So I got to get ready for that. So that means the grapefruit that. league, right? Uh, uh, no, it's, it's the Red Sox old training facility is where this uh, tournament takes place. And so I'll be working out indoors. Uh, though I'm still playing fall ball. I pitched an inning. I had a five pitch inning. I came in for one inning because all their pitches are getting ready for the tournament. I came in, I faced three batters, five pitches, got them out. And, th and that, this team is going and they're playing in a division ahead of, above us. So these guys are some boppers. It was toward the bottom. You know, I would love you to do. <clears throat> I would love you to come on the show sure. and tell me what's going on with the World Series. Oh, that's my problem. I don't really follow professional sports because I'm either, you know, running the batting cage or playing in a game. And so, I, you know, I just don't watch other people play um, or I'm swimming. I'm working out. I'm trying to stay in shape. I don't have time to watch other people play. Yeah, I know. You look great. What are you reading? Thank you. Well, um, I just finished uh, The Dutch House by Anna Patchett, and uh, I'm listening while I swim to a book by, is it, uh, that's the problem. When you just listen to it, you don't see the book every day, and you don't know the title of it. Uh, Tana French, is that her name? Uh, it's about, he's like a Chicago cop who retires and buys a place in a small town in Ireland and then solves a case over there. So I'm reading that, or I'm listening to that. Dirty Cop? He's from Chicago. Is a Dirty Cop? No, he's a good guy. And then after that, I got a Richard Price book uh, ready to go. The Whites. Clockers, The Wire. He's great. Did you yeah. see The Night Of? What's That's The Night Of? That's pretty interesting. The Night Of is a series, and it was it's on HBO. And so I had heard about it, and I heard it was really pretty gritty and dark and great. And then I realized, oh, it's Richard Price. My wife loves Richard Price. So we sit down to watch it. And it says executive producer, James Gandolfini. And we're like, wow, hmm. that's weird. So, but what it turns out was James Gandolfini was supposed to star in this. And that's why he was the executive producer. And they, in fact, filmed a bunch of scenes. And it uh, stars the kid from, uh, what's the movie? Uh, the, heavy, the Heavy Metal, The Sound of Metal. You know, did you watch that one? That was no. a powerful movie. Rez Aslan, is that his name? Um, and so 
they, they filmed a few scenes with James Gandolfini and I think he died while filming this thing. So then it went on the shelf. And then um, I think De Niro was maybe supposed to play the role. And then they maybe shot a scene or two with him. And then it went back on the shelf and it ends up being John Turturro and this kid, Rez Oslan. And it's, it's, it's dark, but it's good. So I, I don't know. All right. Very good. Johnny Ross, follow him. Thank you on uh, Twitter by typing in fun with friction. Thank you. We'll see you next week. I hope I'll be around if you want to have me yeah. depress your audience. I can do it. You were great. Watch this. Take before you leave. Watch this. We'll be back okay. with Howie Klein. <laughs> Welcome back. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, and follow Howie Klein on Twitter at Down With Tyranny. Let's go to Los Angeles, where the founder and treasurer of the Blue America Pack, Howie Klein, is standing by. Hello, Howie. Hello, David. Good to hear your voice. Any candidates we should be booking on the show before we start? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we have a brand new candidate that we just endorsed, uh, and he's running against a blue dog in Honolulu. So the blue dog is Ed Case. Some people may know of him. He's a, a really bad character who's been in and out of Congress uh, several times. Really bad guy. And our candidate is someone who, unless you are following uh, Down with Tyranny, will live in uh, Hawaii. You probably never heard of him before. And he um, uh, he just uh, he hasn't even officially announced yet, but he has filed his paperwork and and uh, we jumped out ahead and endorsed him. And he's a, a fantastic uh, young guy and a, an attorney. And um, we just did a uh, we just did a fundraiser for him. And I hope everybody uh, is interested in getting rid of a blue dog and and placing him uh, with with a great. <clears throat> young uh, progressive who uh, whose name is Sergio Alcubilla. Sergio Alcubilla. Great. Hey, before we start, uh, so, so I, should we should we book him? Absolutely. You introduced me to somebody from Hawaii four years ago. We had him on the show four years ago. He worked. He was running for Congress. Kenny Ella. Kenny Ella. I'm sure. Yes. And I just saw his name, Kenny L. Ng, right? Yes, Kenny L. Ng, the, the most, uh, you know, the, he was the most progressive member of the state legislature. He ran, <clears throat> he ran for Congress. He didn't win. And he's doing other kind of work now. I'm sure he's a young guy. He'll get back into politics eventually. But he, he, he decided he wasn't going to run against Case. He was really interesting. He stood out because I remember he was in the state assembly or state senate. But he yeah, also but he also worked at a hotel, I believe, in maintenance. He had a real job, as I remember. Well, he has a family. He has he has to have some kind of job. I, I didn't know he worked in maintenance in a hotel. I wasn't aware of that. Right. So have you seen this big story that's come out about people who go to work for the Democratic Party all being hyper educated? They have money, they're white, and they go out and campaign for Democratic candidates and are pushing voters away. Did you see this story? It was in Politico, and I forgot. I did. You did? Yeah. It, it made, it, it's what I've been saying, uh, and you've been saying, we have a serious problem in the Democratic Party. The people who are, who are, knocking on doors are too many of them are white people of privilege, even though we can't win without black women. Were they, were they actually talking about these rich people knocking on doors or were they doing other things? Well, knocking on doors and of course making policy, but the retail end of, 
politics, as you know, is very important. That first touch point is too often a white college educated kid who's knocking on doors, who doesn't relate to voters. He has no interest. It's just they're just a stepping stone and voters pick up on that. Do you think how much of a role do you think these hyper educated white kids play in Democrats nominating? I, I don't know. I, I you know, I, I I I don't know. I don't I don't know who is motivated to uh, to go knocking on doors. I don't know how much good it does. Uh, you know, I read it does good. But I just don't know. Um, I, I, I've never done it. I mean, I did when I was young, very, very young. I didn't like it and I didn't do it again. Right. And, and it's the same thing with, with calling. I, I never get that either. I mean, if, you know, I, I don't like being bothered in my house <laughs> by somebody who I don't know telling me who to vote for. And especially when, you know, when they don't know the person, you know, you know what I mean? I get calls from people who are reading from a script and, and I, I, you know, it, depending on what I'm doing, I either like curse them out or, or hang up on them or, or, you know, fool around with them and make them feel horrible. Right. Uh, you know, yes, the retail uh, end is very, very important, but you got to get you got to do it right. OK, let me ask you about Morgan Harper. But first, I. Yes, Morgan. Oh, she's so fantastic. Did you watch her? Did you want, did I put a, her video up? Today? Yeah, yes. Did, and, right? and, you, and you have a piece over down with journey entitled, which is worse, Facebook or Amazon. I want to talk which, about, but you start off talking about Fiji water. Yeah. You, you know that, you know that. It from Amazon. And I, oh, I, oh, please don't give me a lecture about how I shouldn't be using it anyway. I, I've had that so many times already today. Oh, you got, you heard about the Resnick family. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not hearing about the Resnick family. I'm hearing about how uh, damaging it is to the environment or something like that. Yes. Yeah, and you're not interested in... in I've heard it over and over and over again, but, uh, you know, I, uh, my doctor told me that I have to have a good pH balance um, for uh, uh, a medical condition, and he told me it's uh, Fiji, Fiji water is the way to go. And I like the way it tastes. What I wrote about in my in my story today was that um, uh, I, I I bought it from Amazon. I buy Fiji water from Amazon. I get large bottles in um, in cartons, and they they sent they they sent me they sent me it, and it didn't come in a in a Fiji a box. It came in a plain uh, Amazon box. And that's the first time that's ever happened. And I've been ordering it for, since the beginning of the pandemic. I, I've been having them bring it to my house. So, and then, and then I opened one and, and drank it and it was, it was, it was putrid. I mean, Fiji water tastes really good. This was absolutely putrid, Un, undrinkable, horrid, like, like sewer water. Right. So, I, I, you know, it, it, it's very, very hard to get in touch with Amazon and to get them, you know, to get away from a bot and get get something out of them. But I uh, but I finally did it. But you know what? It was really easy to get in, in touch with Fiji Water. They have very, very good customer service. And it was uh, it was a pleasure to working with them. And they even though they had nothing to do with this, I was just calling them because I was wanted to volunteer to. um uh, to be a witness if they wanted to sue uh, Amazon. That was the only reason I was calling them. <laughs> They're sending me uh, a box, a free box, even though I said, I, you know, they didn't need to. I wasn't blaming them. I was blaming Amazon. By the way, mathematically, Fiji water is is horrible. Amazon is horrible. But if you do the math, if you buy Fiji water Why is through oh, Amazon, right, go ahead. Why is if, but if you buy Fiji water through Amazon, uh, two negatives two negatives make a positive, so it's okay. <laughs> I don't know, but, but why, you know, I mean, I hear about the the ecological problems with Fiji water. I understand that, but you're you're talking about some business thing that's bad. Well, Mother Jones, Google Mother Jones and Fiji water. Uh, we have a problem with Mother Jones. No, oh, no, I love it, but I'm, I have a problem with Google. Oh, okay. Mother Jones wrote a piece about Fiji water, I don't know, about eight years ago. 
They prop up, they prop up a military dictatorship there. The people who bottle the water in Fiji don't have po potable water because the Resnick family is taking it all. The, the working conditions are terrible. And then it's an ecological nightmare, putting water in plastic, then on a cargo ship and sending it to the United States. Plus, where, where Google drains it anyway and uses it for themselves, they send it to uh, they send it to that that, uh, that other planet where the owner of Google has a uh, colony and then they fill it up with uh, sewer water. And I, I can attest to that. Is that true? Yeah. OK. Anyway, the and the Resnick family, which owns Fiji Water and Palm, are uh, some of the biggest users of uh, water in California. And What's Palm? It's a it's a like a pomegranate drink. Oh, oh, I know that thing. Oh, yeah, I, I drank that when it uh, a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, they, many, many, many years ago. They have all the time. water rights in in California, and they don't share it with. The, the workers who need to drink it, they're bad people, the Resnicks, really bad. And they buy, you know, and they, they're like the Sacklers. They put their name all over museums and they just donated all this money uh, to one of the universities. It's dirty money, but they're, you know, cleaning it. Anyway, uh, book the testimony, Ms. Haugen, the whistleblower, do you honestly believe that Facebook, like I, I will say that Facebook is evil and it's causing the spread of misinformation and destroying democracies. I'll, I'll say that. I want to believe it. I just don't, I don't understand. I don't really mean it. I, I kind of know it's true, but I don't, I don't, see it. I don't. Do you believe that Facebook is as evil as I say it is? Yeah, you do. You you do. You, do you witness this no, firsthand? Is the right word? I mean, I, I mean, in other words, are, are we talking about intent? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know about that intent part. That, that's that's the problem. Well, that's what that Miss Hagen, her testimony said that they know. They yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm talking about something bigger than that. I, I mean, in terms of evil. Um, so I don't know if they're actually like, are they serving Satan? Yeah, I mean, there. I, I, I believe her. I, I believe. I believe her, that what I heard of her testimony. I, I thought it was right on. And if you did, you read that post that I put up about yeah. uh, which is worse? Yeah. And which is yeah, worse. so you know, uh, and and Roger McNamee is an old friend of mine. And I definitely believe him, and he's and not just because he's a friend of mine. I believe him because he's he's a really super knowledgeable guy. And if he, you know, if he says it, it's for real, right? And Amazon, was, you know, Amazon is worse, the, far worse. What? Amazon is far worse. Aha! So you have an answer to it. Yes. Okay. What are you cooking? Okay. Well, I mean, I'm getting. Uh, some, I'm getting some uh, feedback from people who are saying Amazon is worse. I'm getting feedback from other people who are saying that uh, Facebook is worse. Why do you think Amazon is worse? Worse. It it has decimated Main Street. It put yes. bookstores, record stores, retail outlets out of business. It wasn't the purpose. I mean, they they did that purposefully. That, that, this is what I meant when I when I was talking about. Uh, um, uh, Facebook. So they did that. They, 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 they went about doing that, but that wasn't the goal. You know, the, the goal was not putting, uh, putting mainstream out of business, but it was, you know, an, 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 uh, I mean, it was a strategy. Yes, it was a strategy uh, to, to get, to get to their own goal, which was getting rich, which is the only goal. Mm, you don't, you don't think, I mean, I can remember 10 years ago, 12, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, bookstores were going out of business because of yes, Amazon. I remember horrible. That I mean, and I mean, I, I love bookstores, like love them. I spent, you know, large 
amounts of, t- of my life in bookstores, just lo- just loving being in them. Right. Well, that that pleasure has, has been taken away from us by Jeff Bezos. Now, is it a pleasure or a necessity? I think it's a necessity. I think without bookstores, you cannot have the enlightenment. You know, they talked about coffee houses. There was no there would be no enlightenment without coffee houses. Without bookstores where readers can gather and identify each other and sit and talk and and be surrounded by books, that stunts the that stunts progress. For some people, I mean, certainly it was important for me all my life, but uh, I, I, you know, people don't really use them anymore. I mean, at one time, libraries were like so crucial and so important. And now do people use libraries? Some, I mean, some do, of course, but you know, how many? I use the library. I love the library. Libraries, are, they're a miracle. Tell me about, we had some good news over the weekend, Zephyr Teach Out. live in New York, right? Yeah, Zephyr Teach Out. Before we get to Zephyr, uh, now I would imagine that the, that the libraries are probably in better shape in New York than in many places, but how, what are they like in New York? Uh, I... I, I they have a great selection of books. They also have e-books. Oh, no, I meant in terms of usage. There's a homeless problem. There, there's a problem of unmedicated homeless people who uh, use the libraries, unfortunately, uh, but they have to go somewhere. So it, it makes sitting in a library, which is one of my great pleasures, problematic. So, yeah. So, so, okay. So, but aside from you, are there other people in the libraries using them these days? Yes. Yes. There's students. Yeah, okay. there, there are students and there are retirees. Why are they on the library instead of, why are they in the library instead of uh, online? Because their parents can't afford daycare. So you drop them off at the library and you know, they're safe. Ah, you mean not very young students? Yeah. You know, teenagers. Their parents are working. We don't have well. Teenagers get daycare. They don't get daycare, but you know, they they their parents want them to be in the library instead of in an unsafe apartment with maybe an abusive boyfriend or something or an abusive sure. roommate. So, like, we need the li- library. That libraries are made, you know, are where people hide from other people. Well, can you imagine if somebody came up with the idea of a library today? Like nobody ever like the 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 library of Alexandria was burnt to the ground. Nobody remembered it. And somebody said, hey, why don't we have a library now? People go, are you out of your mind? We have where I live. uh, There's a laundry room. And there's a, you know, leave a book, take a book, leave it. And I think. Well, that's a beautiful thing. Very few people leave a book and take a book and nobody wants to share anything. Like, like my neighbor gets Time Magazine delivered and then puts it in the recycling. You would think somebody would say, why don't we leave all your magazines out and all your books out that you're going to throw out? Mine. It's my garbage. Why are you going through my garbage? Seriously, if I went through in New York City, if I went through somebody's garbage, like they're recycling, which is clean. Oh, the New York Post and started taking it. And somebody saw me do that. They'd report me to management. He was going through people's recycling. Well, it's better off than in uh, Texas where they just shoot you. (laughs) Tell me about Zephyr Teach Out. Um, well, you want you mean the history of? Well, she is. She has a new book out, and yes. is she going to run? What is she going to run for in New York, Attorney General? Yeah, if Letitia James uh, is, is indeed runs, which looks very very likely, if she runs for governor, then um, then Zephyr will run for Attorney General. And didn't she run 
two years ago for something here. Didn't she run for governor? She ran for, um, let's see, well, she ran for Congress. Uh, did she run for governor? She, if she did, it was quite a long time ago. I can't, right. I can't remember. Yes, yes, she did. She ran for Congress. I remember uh, Tim Wu was her uh, lieutenant governor. It was, it was a great, uh, a great ticket. And they, they actually did really, really well um, upstate in the Democratic primary. They, they won lots and lots and lots of counties. They were running against Cuomo, and it shocked people how well they did. Uh, right. In fact, there's a lot of people who think that the only reason that Cuomo won was because he, uh, he had the, um, you know, the, the machines in Queens and Brooklyn and Manhattan, uh, you know, pulling, uh, you know, pulling strings Right. So she's one absolutely great. She's got a new book about uh, antitrust and breaking up corporations. And uh, she is uh, she's somebody worth paying a lot of attention to. And of course, if she does run, uh, we, we will endorse her. Great. The midterms are a year away, which means the primaries start in a couple of months. But we have two off-year elections that are important in New Jersey and Virginia. What should we be paying attention to in New Jersey? Uh, Governor Chris Murphy, he's going to win, right? Is he popular in Jersey? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know how popular he is, but he's um, he's definitely, uh, you know, there are enough Democrats in New Jersey so that Democrats now win elections in New Jersey. Right. Are there, is there any race we should be paying attention to before we discuss Virginia? There probably are races, to be honest with you, that we should be paying attention to in this off-year cycle. But there are no federal races; there are local races. I, I'm not. Um, I'm not up to date on them. I mean, here and there, I'm up. You know, like I know, for example, that there's a mayor's race in Jersey City. Uh, that's that's important, but uh, uh, it's not really something that's uh, that's in my purview. Uh, mostly because it's just it's just a democratic state, and Democrats are going to win, and you know that right. is what it is. A year ago, you introduced us to Carter. I believe he was uh, in Virginia. He was running for. Yeah, we're talking about Virginia now. That's a that's a way way, way uh, more controversial. An exciting race, right? What happened to Carter? Did he? Is he no he lost primary? He lost the primary, but is he out of politics? Well, for now, he he was he was somewhat bitter about it. I don't know if he's permanently out of the politics, but but uh, he he did he did pretty poorly, and he was treated badly. Uh, and he, you know, he, he's I, you know I didn't speak to him, but he he seemed somewhat bitter. I loved him. He was a, an Iraqi war vet. He s served in the Virginia, what do they call it? The, uh, the delegate. Uh, the delegate. And he was an Uber driver. And was he an Uber driver at the same time that he was a delegate? Yes. Yes. Because he was a carpenter as well. Well, he was an Uber carpenter. And th <laughs> this is who we should be sending to Washington, D.C. And is it uh, Terry McAuliffe? Is he the one who's running for governor? Yes, Terry has was governor once before, and he's you know he's a very typical kind of uh, Clinton uh, hack, and you know just a just the worst kind of Democrat that you can imagine. Uh, you know, corrupt neoliberal. Uh, I wouldn't if I lived in Virginia, I, I just wouldn't vote for him. But he's run, he's running against someone who's really horrible, who's much much worse than him. Like much much worse, not a little worse. Like really, really a lot worse. A hedge so fund for people guy, right? who are all sort of into this whole lesser of two evils thing, um, you know, they 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 have pissed off at me when I write things saying uh, how terrible uh, Terry McAuliffe is. They can't really defend him, but they just get angry at me for like bringing it up. Right? Is Virginia purple or blue? Uh, it, well, it, 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 it's, it's purple, but it's, it's moving in a, blue, in a bluish direction. Right. But there are big swaths of, um, of Virginia that, that are beat red. Right, right. Is, so, Arizo uh, is Arizona purple or blue now? 
Oh, definitely not blue. Right. Uh, purple at best. Right. And the $3.5 trillion Build Back Better, held up by Cinema and Mansion. Well, Cinema and Mansion in the Senate, but there were a number of um, people skating by in, in the House that are a problem as well, like uh, Josh Gottheimer, your, your sister's congressman. Harvard as Law, well as, he's a graduate uh, of Harvard. Schroeder and uh, uh, Lou Correa. And they're, they're, uh, Ed Case, the guy in Hawaii. So there are a number of, of blue dogs and new Dems who are, you know, they don't want the kind of um, attention that Mansion and Cinema are getting. So they're trying to, you know, cut, kind of do it on the on the sly. But there are definitely some Democrats in the um, in the House who are also a problem. Now I should mention that uh, Pelosi is a far more skilled. Uh, political leader than Schumer is. Schumer is a kind of a disaster. So, so people think, well, she, well, Pelosi is going to be able to, you know, bend them to her will anyway. She always does. So, the, and that may be true, but um, it, it's still, it, it's still very, very much a problem in, in both houses of Congress now. Right. The build back better bill. When do you see that getting voted on? Not this year, right? They're going to, they're, it's going to be voted. no, no. They they will. Yes. Yeah, I, I, well, first of all, let's define our terms here. The Build Back Better bill that we have now, I see that never being voted on. Uh, that that's not going to ever come in, uh, to anything because um, you know President Manchin has said uh, said no. So now they they have to cut it back. Uh, you know, I don't know how much they're going to cut it back, but it's not going to be a small amount. But it'll they, they will cut it back significantly. And by the way, when, I just wanted to be fair when I say, um, you know, the, the, that, you know, the problem is uh, cinema and mansion in, in the uh, in the Senate and Gottheimer and Kurt Schrader in the House. That's all. That's true. But then that, I, left, I left something out. It's also every single Republican in, in each body. I mean, there's not one Republican who's willing to go to bat for either one or, or even vote for either one. So, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's a very big problem. And what? there was a time in American politics when that wouldn't have been the case, when we, when we would have had Republicans backing these kinds of bills. But now we don't. Right. There now was, we have there's Ted a, Cruz, right. Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene, saying that she will spend millions of dollars against any Republican who backs uh, any of these bills. When you see a poll... CBS has a new poll out, CBS YouGov, 10% of Americans. Well, that's the, the, that's the YouGov, because the YouGov is the economist poll. Is that, uh, so which was the, what is this? all right, tell me the poll. I, I've memorized it already, so go ahead. It's, I, I thought it was the CBS YouGov poll. I thought, I thought. The YouGov poll is, is, a, is an economist poll, unless there's another one I don't know about. Well, maybe if you, you start, if you start explaining it, I'll, I'll know right away. Okay, I, I, maybe CBS and the, the economist teamed up. It's a poll of voters' awareness of what's in Build Back Better. 10% mm -hmm. of Americans could tell no, no. the pollsters what was in Build Back Better. Right. Well, they don't know the specifics of it, but they know enough about it so that they like it. So they, so they, so in other words, they read it or, or they read about it, I should say. No, they didn't read it. They read about it. They liked it. And then they, uh, they it registered in their minds. Yeah, this is good. And then they moved on. And one third of them think that there's something in it that can help them. Yeah. So the Only end, one third. Really? Yeah. One third of Americans think build back better will affect them. They mostly think it's just about raising taxes. Whose fault is that? On a, you know, there are a lot of people are responsible for this. Is it Biden's fault, Pelosi's fault, Schumer's fault, Bernie's fault that the American people have no idea what's in Build Back Better? I mean, that's outrageous. That would be like nobody knowing what was in the Medicare bill. Yeah, I, I don't know that 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 is accurate anyway. Uh, I don't believe it is. 
um, people, uh, people, people seem to, um, I mean, all, the, all of the polling that I've seen for months and months and months say the opposite of that. They say that, that people are generally aware of it, love it. There's a, a, a very, very big um, number, of, I mean, in terms of, the Dem- of Democrats, it's overwhelming support. In terms of independence, it's, it's, it's very good support. And then with Republicans, they like lots of things in it and other things they don't like, but that's to be expected. And they, uh, but over, overall, Americans like it. So, you know, you know, you can believe whichever poll you want to believe. Right. What are you cooking tonight? Right this minute? Yes. I am uh, making the stuffing that's going to go into both um, uh, a really interesting squash that I'd never seen before that I, I was in the grocery store and I saw this really weird looking squash. So I decided to get it and eat it <laughs> and uh, some peppers as well. Great. Howie Klein is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America PAC. They raise money for progressive candidates, some socialists around the country. Read him every day at Down With Tyranny. Thank you, sir. Let's talk. Uh, try to get some more candidates on if you have time. Oh, I'm, I'm delighted to. I, I, I never know if you want me to or not. Always. I'm, I'm, oh, great. Oh, great, I, great, great, great. Uh, in fact, there was something yesterday. Myla held a town hall with three of your candidates on Zoom. Were you there? Yes. Yes. Uh, no, I, I, I couldn't make it. But yes, it was, uh, it was actually. Yeah. She, Myla was definitely part of it. And it was actually well, three of it was a California thing. So it was uh, Bruno, who, who you had, Bruno right. Amato. And uh, uh, Brian Osorio, who's also been on the show. Love and him. then one of our, oh, and you've had Michael Ortega too, right? Yeah. 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 yeah so you had all three of them. And then also uh, Kevin, Kevin DeLeon was part of this thing as well, who's running for mayor. From the, uh, the uh, Sacramento. No, Kevin's from LA. But I mean, he, wasn't he like a, a senator or? Oh, he was the, uh, speaker? He, he was the, um, uh, the Speaker of the House. He had Willie Brown's the speaker, job. Wow. Willie, the Speaker of the Assembly. Yeah. Right. He's a big deal. Medicare and Kevin's for all. great. Now a city councilman here in L.A., and he's run, He's going to run for mayor now. Fantastic. Thank you, yeah. Howie. We'll talk to you next week, right. I hope. Thanks. Thank you. You're listening Bye. to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. When we come back, we will be joined by good David. Good David. David Cobb joins us right after this. Let us now go to Humboldt County where David Cobb is standing by. He's been coming on once a week, and we're grateful for that. He ran for president on the Green Party ticket and ran Ralph Nader's presidential campaign in Texas. How are you, sir? I'm mighty fine, David. Uh, and you've got new uh, intro music, or at least that's uh, new to me. So that's exciting. Yeah, I've been playing with Premiere Pro and After Effects and trying to learn. It does nothing other than keep me out of trouble. It doesn't help the show. It's just something where I I doodle over the weekend playing with various programs to stay out of trouble. Now, what you out of trouble is good. Let me, I just want to say out loud, though, that last one with the, the blues beat at the David J. Until the Dirty. I like that one. So for what well, it's worth. Uh, Professor Mike Steinell. Let me hang on. It says Howie Klein is on the phone. So two questions. We have posted the numbers of Senator Kirsten Sinema and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and all the members of the Democratic leadership, like President Joe Manchin, as Howie Klein calls them. And these are their district offices. They, except for Kirsten Sinema, you can leave a message. I try to leave a message with Kirsten Sinema, not only does her answering machine not work? She doesn't offer up anything for Spanish speaking constituents. But then again, she represents the state of Arizona. 
she doesn't have any Spanish speaking constituents. They're all Canadians, right? Well, then, uh, you haven't been paying attention. Actually, if you want to talk to cinema, you have to go to the ladies' bathroom. Like that's, yes. that's actually the only place a constituent can actually get to her. Right. And I, by the way, I was glad to see that uh, she finally got to see what it's like try, having trouble passing something. Uh, <laughs> you know, I wrote that this You're morning. Saving that one up. You've been well, saving that one. <laughs> well, you know, thank you for that. I, I, I came up with that this morning and I thought that was a week ago. Somebody must have come up with that on late night television. That's a. Uh, Every comedy writer had a week to come up with that. So. That's a good one. That's a good one. I appreciate it. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, does it, what uh, John Ross was on earlier, he said, they don't care if you make a call and they don't care. Is that true? I think they care. Look, I think that they care, but it's marginal, right? Like, so uh, look, uh, I make the calls. But I also understand how pathetic and weak uh, of an action uh, that really is, right? Like the, the reality is that, uh, like, I don't know exactly what game cinema especially is playing. Like, it's not clear to me what she even really wants. Uh, 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 so I, I, I can't tell what her actual politics are. I, I really can't. Malignant narcissist. I mean, she ran the Boston Marathon today. She is a United States senator who was doing an internship at a California winery. People are getting, a, you're a United States senator, a Democrat. People are being evicted right now, are being pushed out onto the streets. And you're taking a, a winemaking class? Again, I, I don't understand the politics here, right? I, I really don't. Uh, so again, as you know, David, uh, I, I believe that we have to use all the tools that are available to us. So lobbying, making phone calls, uh, you know, having these conversations are, are important. But I also recognize that there is a very limited utility to that. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, the uh, the reality is that cinema is, I think, already got in mind what she's going to be doing. Uh, I don't, and it's hard to negotiate with somebody uh, if you don't really know what it is that they that they want. And, and I honestly can't tell what Kristen Cinema actually wants. But as a legislator, I mean, right? If you were Chuck Schumer. Could you make her if you were, if Chuck Schumer really wanted build back better at three point five trillion? Could he get, make it happen? I think so. I mean, but yeah. it's a level if it's a it's a level of hardball. It, literally, it would be to threaten to remove her committee assignments. It, it would be a, a level of discipline that we have not seen uh, like the the uh, the Democratic Party uh, uh, whip exercise, at least in my lifetime. You know, you're the first person who has said that. Marjorie yeah. Taylor Greene had her committee assignments taken away from her because she's crazy. She's yeah. Why doesn't Schumer take away mansions and Marjorie Taylor Greene? Oh, because then they'll go join the Republican Party. See, I think that's I think that's part of what uh, is going on here, David, like because we, we're having to read the tea leaves because honestly, I don't think Schumer wants the three point five trillion uh, build back better. I think that Biden and the rest of the neoliberals really, really uh, uh, don't want the entire they don't want Bernie's bill. Right. Like and, and that's actually what's going on here. So th there is a level of negotiating in public and negotiating in private. Uh, that's happening. And I think that those of us on the outside actually trying to get good progressive politics are having to second and second guess and infer what we think is really going on there. But I'll right. tell you, actually, like this is this would be a good time uh, to get Alan Minsky on the show. I mean, like, uh, and look, you know, I'm a green. Uh, uh, Alan Minsky is a progressive Democrat. And Alan Minsky is somebody who puts progressive before Democrat, right? Like, like right. uh, I'm just here to tell you, I, I would trust Alan 
to give you his best assessment about what's really going on there. And he's playing it in that toxic soup. So I would like that. The, the question would be to Alan Minsky, what's really going on? Well, we have we have him on the show every Thursday night. He seemed and I'm talking to him tomorrow. He seemed a little despondent as we all it it it, it just you try to believe in the Democratic Party. And I know most of my listeners, I don't know. I don't know. I, I suspect most of my listeners think I'm a fool for believing that you can turn the Democratic Party into a progressive party. You don't. Uh, but boy, the Progressive Caucus, what do you think of Pramila Jayapal, the congresswoman from Washington, the 100, the 100 Congress people who are members of the Progressive Caucus who make Josh Gottheimer look like a radical? Did you ever think that? Let me let me be clear about this. Like, you know, I get grief from because uh, I follow the chat right I, uh, on your show. Right. And a lot there are a lot of folks who think I'm a, I'm crazy or naive or unrealistic or are somewhere in between, you know, for being a green and not like and one of your guests. In fact, even like, you know, provoked me over the edge because she said I quote wasn't actually doing anything because I'm not in the Democratic Party. So I get a lot of grief from folks for not being a Democrat and. I'm not going to join the Democratic Party unless and until I actually saw it as a, a vehicle for progressive change. So, like, that's my assessment. But, David, I want to be abundantly, explicitly clear. Pramila, Pramila Jayapal is the real deal. Mark Pocan is the real deal. No, 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 not Mark Pocan. You no. don't think so? Ask Tell how we find. Uh, I think he, well, Howie Klein says he's a major disappointment. He did support Randy Bryce because he's from Wisconsin. And he, Pocan has turned out to be a, like a problem solver. I think he's weak on Medicare for all. What? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 so. knew, I knew Mark uh, and, or no Mark, and uh, I am shocked to hear this, but look, it's data, right? To me, none of this is personal. Like right. to me, it's all an exercise in or an, uh, it's understanding power and it's understanding the political economy. And you, I'm a broken record here, but I engage in electoral politics, but I'm not an electoral fetishist. Right. I don't spend most of my time in electoral politics. So I, I will always stand corrected, right? Uh, I can tell you that Mark Pocan was uh, introduced the we the people constitutional amendment, which was the first amendment to say corporations have no constitutional rights, not just no right to spend money in elections, but no first amendment right, no fifth amendment right, no 14th amendment right, the, the, the most- This is in response to Citizens United. Correct. And remember, and this is worth uh, pointing out for your listeners and viewers, that Citizens United was horrific to be sure, but the problem with Citizens United was not merely that it said that corporations could give unlimited amounts of money in elections. I mean, that's horrific, to be sure. It's, uh, it's a perversion of the democratic process. But the premise of Citizens United is the idea that corporations, artificial entities, have any inherent constitutional rights at all, right? The, the, a corporation is an artificial entity created how? By statute. That is to say, it is a creature of state government. Therefore, a corporation has statutory rights, not constitutional rights. They're not inalienable inherent. Only living, breathing human beings have inherent inalienable rights. So the fact is that the Citizens United decision, horrific as it was, was based on an illegitimate court-created doctrine that allows corporations to claim constitutional rights. By the way, corporations use those rights to overturn not just campaign finance laws, but environmental protection laws, worker safety laws, public health laws. I mean, they basically make genuine economic democracy illegal because corporate lawyers can go into court and overturn laws when we work our butts off to pass them, which is why I think it's important that we have a programmatic approach to a broad-based uh, mass movement that says we need to democratize politics, 
we need to democratize the uh, 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 democratize the economy and we have to democratize the legal system because our current legal system literally protects property rights, not human rights, and it can't even fathom earth rights. Right, right. The We the People Amendment to the Constitution seemed to me like a cop-out. It's impossible to get a, well, we've had 27 amendments to the Constitution. They're really impossible to get passed when people say to me, the only answer to Citizens United is a constitutional amendment, I say that's cowardice. I say there are other ways around Citizens United. Bernie found a way around it to some degree. The Democratic Party could just say, we're not taking corporate money, period. Full stop. Let the other side take corporate money. We are not taking corporate money. That's all you need to do. And you so have look, that security test. To be, to, be, to be absolutely clear, it is not either or. So, you know, uh, I think it's important to recognize that what you just described is absolutely doable and can be done right now. Just as, by the way, when the Democrats did control uh, uh, Congress uh, and the presidency, uh, they could have actually uh, statutorily codified Roe versus Wade, right? Like there's a whole series of these things. And they could have statutory, I mean, Citizens United, there were ways that Obama and uh, Harry Reid and Pelosi could have gone back. This was, I believe, 2010 when they right. had both uh, Yeah, 2010 was, the, was when the uh, decision came down, correct. So they could have, they could have made... They could have taken the decision and then passed legislation within the framework of the First Amendment to limit campaign financing. And they chose not to. And they said, we need a constitutional amendment. Uh, And then Obama could have just taken public funding when he ran for president, but he didn't in 2008. Again, again, like such a prodigious fundraiser. He was. And. And let's remember something about Obama that really needs to be said out loud. And that is, it, it, remember back when he first ran in his first term, he came out of nowhere, Feldman. It's really important to remember that it was progressive shoe leather, progressive money, and progressive campaign rhetoric that made Barack Obama. I mean, when he was the junior senator uh, from Illinois, he gave what put him on the map nationally was was a rousing speech at the Democratic uh, Party uh, nominating convention uh, that year. Remember, I mean, mm-hmm. it was it was beautiful rhetoric, but it was rhetoric. You go back and look at the folks who actually knew him then, and what you'll see is Barack, Barack Obama, Obama was never a genuine progressive. He was always a You know, I mean, he was the black version of Bill Clinton, an excellent speaker. People liked him. He, you know, he's got a great story and a great narrative, but his policies were always more or less neoliberal policies. And and this is the problem that Democrats fake left and run right. Uh, You know, and frankly, uh, progressive voters let them get away with it. Uh, And that's why you'll hear me say, yes, I engage in elections, but I'm not playing the horse race game. Like I I will support genuine progressives, whether they're Greens, Democrats, Socialists, et cetera. I don't matter. And you focused in on what for me is, in fact, a litmus test. And that is this. Will you make a pledge that you will not solicit nor accept corporate campaign contributions. Because if like, if you're a Democrat and you'll take that pledge, then at least I can trust you, right? And not because I trust you on a personal level. It's because you have not put yourself in a posture to be sold out, right? right. Like corporate money is like a cancer that mathematizes within the body politic. If folks take corporate money, they will end up on the wrong side of issues whenever the chips are down. I really believe that, David. I, I just do. Explain that to, to my listeners. If you, if you're AOC, she doesn't take, I don't think she takes corporate money. I don't think so. I don't think so. 
if she were to take corporate money, but stays in Congress for another 40 years, she's only, not only, my God, $175,000, $180,000 a year is more than enough. If you're, if you're Steny Hoyer, the only job Steny Hoyer has ever had is being a congressman from Maryland, making $180,000 a year. How does money corrupt him? So you donate to Steny Hoyer. The money corrupts him how? Well, I mean, it's because you you can't ultimately trust the 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 process. Uh, you know, the 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 money ends up framing how you see the world, right? So you're just not able to see past it. Uh, and in fact, are you familiar with the ratchet effect uh, in no. in politics? No. Uh, you know, next time uh, I come on, what I will do is have teed up a video for for your your listener. Your viewers could see it, but the listener, I have to find an, a good audio on it. But in effect, it works like this. You know how a ratchet, like if you imagine a worm gear and 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 uh, you, you've got a, 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 a set of worm gears and then you have a, a, a bar that prevents it from going to the left, but it can go to the right. That's what ends up happening with the Democratic Party. It acts as a ratchet. It allows a rightward tilt, but it stops any genuine left movement. That's how the Democratic Party apparatus is currently working. Um, now, that's why I find the, the squad and uh, the, the, a genuine progressive caucus uh, movement actually hopeful. Uh, I don't like whether it works or not, we'll see, but it has the possibility of actually freeing us from the ratchet effect, because as it currently stands, the, the leadership, the neoliberal leadership of the Democratic Party acts to prevent any genuine left trajectory happening in this country under the guise of uh, uh, being rational or under the guise of, oh, wait, you can't go too far. The reality is this, in any other country in the global north, uh, Bernie would be a, a, a center, a moderately center left uh, member, right? Like he's not a ra he's not a radical leftist anywhere except in the United States. Right. I mean, that's just a fact. Like you know, the policies that Bernie uh, Sanders are championing are absolutely you know not only common but wildly popular, and in fact, are the law in almost every other country in the global north. Let me <laughs> go back to what you said because it, if you were in the Biden White House and you truly believed Build Back Better is my signature piece of legislation. It's my legacy. Joe Biden comes to David Cobb and says, tell me how to do this. Again, you're saying he knows how to do it. He just doesn't. But why wouldn't he? Go ahead. What, what could he do? I, I like yeah. it's the, committee it, assignments. It is, it is hardball politics. It is to say, this is the do or die moment for us. This is what we 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 and I believe, and we're going to go to the wall on this. Uh, and you're either with like th that's the approach that it would actually take. Now I don't believe like what Biden wants desperately is the infrastructure part of that bill passed. What he desperately not just reconciliation like. He wants the infrastructure part of that past. I mean, remember, he always poo-pooed uh, AOC and Bernie's version of the Green New Deal. Like, right. so, so, so make no mistake about it. Uh, Joe Biden has not suddenly seen the light uh, and become a progressive champion. Uh, I sadly believe that what he is doing or what he was trying to do was to play the kind of uh, triangulation politics uh, and you know, Pelosi's Bernie, like, Bernie said to him a year and a half ago, you have my endorsement, but I get to be chairman of the banking committee, of the budget committee. And there's going to be you're going to address. They they hammered this reconciliation bill out 
uh, before Bernie was going to endorse him. But he can slow walk it. Can't he? Biden can slow walk this. Absolutely. What would Bur- so I like this. What, if, what does hardball look like? What would Lyndon Johnson, Franklin Roosevelt? We had talked about this earlier. Biden would be holding rallies right now in West Correct. Virginia and Arizona and shaming it. it if the look, president look. of the United States, the head of the Democratic Party, shows up in West Virginia and starts pushing what's in the reconciliation bill and build back better, and Joe Manchin isn't on the stage with him, that hurts Joe Manchin in many ways. You, you've you answered your own question, haven't you, David, right? Like right. in the course of this conversation. But explain how it hurts him. Explain. Because you would be building popular progressive mandate for what's in Build Back Better. And Manchin, as a politician, would have to go to his own constituencies and say, I know you're wanting this. I know you're saying that you want this, but here's why I won't do it. Right now, he's hiding behind it. He's not, there's not, it's almost impossible to build a progressive uh, mandate in West Virginia, Arizona, or any of the Uh, of these states that can really leverage them without, frankly, President Biden leading the charge and using the bully pulpit. And I'm not seeing him do that. Even even Obama went out and sold Obamacare. Granted, there wasn't COVID. To be clear, to be clear, Obama sold Obamacare. What he did not sell, what did he did not champion was health care is a human right or Medicare for all. He didn't even champion the public option. And sometime, David, let's uh, let's let's bring on somebody from the inside of the SEIU and I can show you how the Obama administration sold us out on the public option. That that was another example of triangulation. It brings me no joy to actually say these things. But again, I'm trying to look at this with clear eyes, with, with from a level of understanding how the electoral system is actually operating, which is why my job, our job, is to be clear and unequivocal about what it is that we want, making demands. And that's something I think that the that movements in the rest of the country understand. They don't chase after politicians begging and pleading. They don't allow politicians to set the, the the parameters of what their demands are. That's what we do in this country. Uh, in other countries, they build mass movements that make demands, and then they force the elected officials to react to them. And I think that that's a big part of the problem. And this is why I uh, you will constantly hear me say, I will cheer when an elected official does something good, I will jeer when they do something bad, because I understand my understanding of of how to engage electoral politics is from the bottom up, from movements is where the actual energy comes. We're we're almost out of time. Uh, Dr. Harriet Fraud isn't here. Dan, we can do community billboard if uh, if Dr. Fraud isn't here. What does Biden want? I I think I speak for a lot of American voters who don't understand somebody like Sinema, Joe Manchin, Pelosi, and Biden, because you think they they're not you think they're not monsters, that they know people are being evicted, that people are ending up on the street. So you think that they would want to help, and yet they don't. Is so it- I want to be clear, David. Like I'm not. I don't want to uh, personalize it. I don't think Joe Biden is a monster. I do think that Joe Biden wants to help. I think that the problem is one of positionality. I think that that like it's easier for me, not just because I'm not in the office, but you see, I have a theoretical understanding of how politics works, and I have a theory of change. 
I think that uh, Joe Biden it really genuinely believes in an old style, uh, uh, you know, that he believes in the neoliberal approach uh, to politics. He believes that private markets are, are good and are, are the best solution. Uh, he believes, and remember, he was part of the Democratic Leadership Council, the old DLC, mm. uh, you know, uh, that Bill Clinton and, and Al Gore and others created. Oh, by the way, pop quiz for you. Uh, there, did you know that the Democratic Leadership Council doesn't exist anymore? No. It doesn't. And do you know why? It was taken over by the Blue Dogs. Or th- because it doesn't have to. It became right. the DNC. Right. Like literally, the, it, the Democratic Leadership Council actually succeeded in taking over the Democratic Party apparatus, right? Like, and, and progressives are still allowed to have a voice and a very small amount of power. They, the, 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 the neoliberals will continue uh, to toss bones uh, to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, but, but, but very, very seldom uh, do they actually deliver for progressives, which is why I, I think it's really worth pointing out that what you're seeing is a which side are you on moment that that's coming. And I really do believe, David Feldman, that what you're seeing within the Democratic Party, just like within the Republican Party, like the, the, the center will not hold. Like I'm not creating the polarization. I'm observing a polarization. And I'm observing a polarization because the climate catastrophe and late stage capitalism are creating political problems that our current system can't solve. Fascism is rising for a reason. And fascism rose in the 1930s for a reason. It's not because all of a sudden people got meaner, it's because material conditions are changing. And I, unfortunately, I don't see the neoliberal approach being able to solve these problems. Not at all. Thank you, David Cobb. How do people contact you? Hit me up on Facebook. I'm David Keith Cobb. You can also catch me on Twitter. But uh, if you want to see the local work where I put these ideas on the ground, go to cooperationhumble.com. And next week, David Feldman, I'd like to actually ask if I could bring somebody from the Green Party. I'm going to bring somebody from the Green Party Party to be able to actually talk about this theory that we have about how to engage electoral politics. And again, I believe that I can work with progressive Democrats. I know it because I work with them all the time. Some Greens hate me for it, but I also, some Democrats hate me because I refuse to join the Democratic Party. So I'm getting it from all sides. Great. Thank you, David Cobb. Thank you for what you do. Bye, Thank y'all. you for what you do. Let's do this. Paul LeBeau, do you want to, since Dr. Fraud is looking like she's not going to be here. Would you go, you want to go on early? Sure. Okay. Hey, hey David. I hey. know David. David knows me. He doesn't remember me probably. Oh, but, I'm uh, so sorry. <laughs> we know each other. Well, I apologize. Uh, you gave a, a little presentation with the Alliance for Just Money and I'm on the board. Yes, I do. I, now I do know. I'm so glad. <laughs> By the way, uh, I, I take it then, uh, uh, Paul, that you're going to educate uh, David Feldman on uh, what the Alliance for Just Money is actually about. Because by the way, they're not they're not against the banks. I actually had a nice uh, exchange with uh, uh, with Howard Switzer of uh, Alliance for Just Money. So I hope you're going to correct that mis misinformation. Well, it's partially true. <laughs> so. Thank you. Let me do. Let me do. Thank you, David Cobb. You're listening to the David Feldman Show. DavidFeldmanShow.com. An old friend of our show is back. Paul LeBeau. He is a physicist. That's his day job. That means he's smart enough to understand how money works. He's a founding board member and past vice president of the Alliance for Just Money. They're a national nonprofit advocating for the reform of our money system. For more information, go to monetaryalliance.com. Welcome back, Paul LeBeau. Before we talk, Dan, what is your schedule like? Do you want to, can you come back after Mark Breslin, before Professor Marianne? Yep, sounds good. And I can come back too. I can come back anytime too. I don't know, let's do it this way, if it's okay with Dan. Yep, sounds good. Thank you. 
Paul LeBeau. Yes, uh, sir. So we're going to talk about money. Mm-hmm. But earlier, I was talking about the Pandora Papers and how for the past 100 years, Congress working with the banks have conspired to turn America into the biggest tax haven for dirty money in the world. Mm-hmm. And I want to make sure I understand the trade deficit. I don't know if you heard my opening. No, I did not. No. The, the way, so this is clear to us because we're going to be talking about money and this is, you have to be a physicist to understand how money works, the speed at which money multiplies. It shouldn't be that complicated, but they make it purposely complicated. It's not complicated. It's purposely made complicated. You're so, absolutely right. So I, I, we'll, we'll talk about <laughs> uh, the Alliance for Money in a second. I just want to make sure I'm, I got something right with... America becoming a tax haven for drug dealers and uh, baby, you know, oligarchs and Putin and Russian mobsters. They made an argument as far back as 100 years ago, the banks, that if you can park dirty money in an American bank, pay interest on the dirty money, but make that interest tax-free, it will affect our balance of trade. It will be a net positive and will make the dollar stronger. Is that how David, I am? You're, you're asking the wrong person. I'm trying to simplify the whole, the whole picture. You're of a money. physicist. I, 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 <laughs> hang on. I, I was, I, I, here's, here's the point. I, this is important because we'll get to what you want to talk about it in a second. Mm-hmm. You're a physicist. You understand money. <laughs> That's right. That was one of my basic elementary school courses, money. Yeah. Okay. So the trade deficit and its relationship to a strong dollar. Do you understand that? Well, if the dollar is too strong, then uh, they're not going to want to pay for our products. Exactly. But we don't want a trade. A trade deficit is some people think it's good. Some people think it's bad. It's called or the balance of trade. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. The banks have sold secrecy. Oh, yeah. They they convince enough senators and Congress people that we want foreign money, bad money to be deposited in the United States because that's a net positive in the trade balance. And that props up the dollar, which we want, right? I heard that discussion last week and, you know, to be no, honest- we didn't I have it. We, had, we didn't well, have you, it. You did bring it up a little bit. Um, well, I talked about inflation, not yeah. the trade balance. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, there's a lot of discussion about that, and to be honest, it depends. You know, who you happen to listen to, and some people say it's it's, it's not a problem at all to, to have a, a trade deficit, and it's good for us. You know, we're importing more goods from outside the country. We're getting them cheaper. You know, we, it's a win-win situation. We're, we're we're propping up, you know, developing countries. So. And then we're also exploiting developing countries. So it, it really depends uh, on what your criteria are. But we want a strong dollar, right? That's well, important. I don't, not necessarily, I, 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 don't, I really don't know. I mean, because I- You don't heard, know because you don't understand I, it or there's different schools of there's thought? There's different schools of thought and I don't I understand don't. it. So. And you're a physicist. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Now, there's a lot of physics I don't understand either. All right. So let's talk about modern monetary policy. You, you've come on the show before and tried to explain it to me. And uh, 
I, I've tried for years to understand how the Federal Reserve works. Do they want us to know how no, it works? No, 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 no. They do not want us to know. That's, that's part of the whole system is the secrecy. And it's, it's, it's not even a conspiracy. I mean, it's the system. Is it secrecy or just confusing it's op- on purpose? It's opaque. It is confusing on purpose because it's job security for people. They are the only ones who can manage certain seg- segments of the economy. They're in the know. And uh, it just keeps the whole, you know, scheme functioning. Right. Um, well, let's go over some basics here. Mm-hmm. The Federal Reserve was founded when? Uh, 1913. Right. That I remember. Yes. And the income tax came about around the same time, I believe. Mm -hmm. So the Federal Reserve, that's monetary policy versus fiscal policy. Monetary policy is just what the bankers decide. The Federal Reserve decides how hot, how cold the economy should be. Okay. So- let me just say from the start that what I'm promoting is essentially getting rid of all of this. However, what the Federal Reserve is- Are you, You're for getting rid of the Federal Reserve. Absolutely. Or redefining it. Or basically bringing it, bringing it into the Treasury. So it's an actual arm of the, of the federal government. <clears throat> but the Federal Reserve actually, and I don't want to, it's kind of a diversion, but it's really our payment system. That's what the Fed, the job of the Federal Reserve is the integrity of the payment system. Because before 1913, the economy, uh, there were banking disasters because there there were just a a hodgepodge of independent uh, payment systems. And you had to trust your bank and another bank had to trust your bank. A bank in Illinois had to trust your bank in New York. And uh, they stopped trusting each other. There were runs on banks. It was just a complete mess. And what happened was the bankers got together and decided we got to save ourselves from this mess. And basically the, the, um, the Federal Reserve provided a, a unifying discipline and a kind of a central reserve, a central bank, so that if I catch a check in one bank, we knew that it would, it would, uh, it would be honored in another bank. That was the ma- major reason for having the Federal Reserve. The other function of the Federal Reserve is in a very, very weak and loose manner. It's to control the amount of money in the economy. And the only way they can do that is by um, influencing. They can't even directly control interest, interest rates, but they can influence interest rates. So that, and, and this is jumping the gun a little bit, but the way money gets into the economy is through bank lending. And if they make interest rates too high, people aren't wanting to borrow, aren't going to want to borrow money. So that will lower the flow of money into the economy. The only way money enters the economy Mm -hmm. is through lending. Okay. So like I said, we're kind of jumping the gun a little bit, but it's. Where does money come from? I I thought that's that's a great question. Okay. And, and you know, the funny thing is only you and Michael Brooks are the only two, I guess, uh, progressive media personalities who have ever asked that question, even entertained it. In fact, um, I called Sam Cedar's show once and was explaining the money system and the difference in the body language between Sam and Michael was incredible. My, Sam was kind of had this blank kind of bored look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he was thinking about the next bidet he was going to sell or something. But uh, Michael was nodding his head and he was really interested and it always really fascinated. And it's very unusual for people to even question or think about the money system because it's, it's so complicated. And they say, well, let's just We'll leave it to the. You're not at the beginning of my show. (laughs) 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 I can't. Yeah. I mean, and you've come on in the past and I love this conversation. Uh, It's it's just a hard discussion because it's like discussing physics. Well, Well, you're seeing the problem right here. And the fact that we don't know how to discuss this 
Right. That's the problem. The system has to be completely changed. I'm going to also point out that Michael and I had a few email interchanges uh, before he died. And the week before he died, he sent me a message saying, please send me more information on the money system, you know, with three exclamation points in it. And then a few days later, he died. And I I was devastated. He was crying in the shower kind of thing. Um, Like, you know, so it's rare for people to, I guess, be brave enough to even contemplate wanting to understand the money system. But the way money is created and, you know, people think, first of all, people don't even know what their money is. They somehow think that uh, money is tangible, that it's um, the bank just holds their money for them and they can get cash or coins or whenever they want it. Well, it turns out that when you deposit your money in a bank, the bank owns your money. You do not own that. The bank owns it. And in exchange, they have a liability. They have an IOU to you saying, if you want your money on demand, we'll give it to you. We'll give you cash or whatever you want. But they can do whatever they want with your money. They Is this called fractional it. reserve or something? Is this- Not really. I mean, the fractional reserve, it's, it has a couple of different nuances to it. And it's kind of a myth. And, I, and it's, it would take me a long time to try to unravel it. It, it, it needs to go. There's no reason for it. Um, the whole reserve system is, um, it's a, it's a crazy system and it, it's, it's antiquated. It, it, it's it's the way I understand it is mm-hmm. you, uh, you have a hundred dollars, you deposit it in the bank and the bank can lend right, about right. $80 of that, that 100. That's the myth. Okay. So that is a myth. <laughs> All right. Okay. Banks, when they, when they lend, you say you want to borrow $100,000 buy a house. The bank says, okay. They look at your spreadsheet because that's all your money is. It's just a spreadsheet. And they t- type in $100,000. Enjoy. That's it. There's no, the bank doesn't have to have some pot of money that uh, supports the loan. So how does that make you feel when I just said that? <laughs> I'm looking at the expression on your face. Okay. I don't believe that. Uh, okay, good. All right. So I'm going to give you two quotes from famous people, which explains your reaction. Your reaction is perfectly valid. One is the process by which banks create money is so simple that the mind is repelled. This is John Kenneth Galbraith. Okay. He's a famous person. The other one is only the small secrets need to be protected. The only the what? One, only the small secrets need to be protected. The big ones are kept protected by public incredulity. And that's is that Marshall. Joseph Goebbels? No, it's, that's Marshall McLuhan. Same thing. Same guy. Same thing. So at the point, In a way, <laughs> when you think about it. <laughs> but nah, that's, not really. Not really. <laughs> but that's the way the system works. It, it's, it's crazy. Marshall McLuhan would have said Hitler... Too hot a performer. <laughs> too, this is radio. He's too hot. He, to cool That's him right. It wouldn't come across on radio at all. Yeah. I, I, Marshall McLuhan would have told Hitler to dial it back a little. So, so, but, uh, so but, what did Marshall McLuhan say? <laughs> only the small secrets need to be protected. Only the, the small is, secrets right. need to. So when we see that with Trump. It's just Absolutely. Right, yeah, right. Right. The big ones are kept protected by public incredulity. And you just demonstrated it right there. How can that possibly be that banks can create money and lend money with nothing to back it up? <laughs> yeah. How could we wage war on Afghanistan for 20 years, even though they didn't attack us on 9-11? Same thing. <laughs> yeah. But this is the thing is, people never question money. I never did. I never questioned where money came from. I thought, well, it was always there. It's just there. Money is it's just there. But we're encouraged not to think about it. Exactly. It's, it's, it's dirty. Made, well, it's that's right. It's it's well, money is really a beautiful thing. It's the way that and in fact, it's really not money that's important, it's wealth. 
and wealth is not money. And uh, it's kind of ironic. There is the, probably the biggest contributor to the philosophy of money or the nature of money in the, in the 20th century was a physicist um, who, um, uh, his name was uh, Frederick Soddy. And he got the Nobel Prize in physics in the 1920s. And he, he basically explained the difference between money and wealth. Wealth is what we create. It's the natural resources we have access to. And money is just a means to access the wealth that each of us in society creates so that we can thrive and work together, you know, and, and prosper as a society. That's the real purpose of money. That's been completely bastardized. You know, money as has been- a physicist, you said, you said money is a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah, it's the lifeblood it, of a society. It, it's the char, it, 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 the term charge. Yeah, yeah. And, the exchange that creates new compounds and well, you know, sometimes I think about it in terms of of, of charge moving along a wire. You know, it, it's right. it's the way we, you know, I had a little argument with Richard Wolf when he was on your show. I didn't get to really confront him, but he said, and I asked him about, you know, aren't you concerned about the fact that banks create money? And he says, well, I'm more interested in production. I'm not interested in distribution, you know, as, and I said, you know, that's a pretty narrow view of economics because you can come up with a, you know, the, the ethical way for, for the, the means of production, Marxism, socialism, but if you don't have an ethical way of distributing money so that people can actually get the means of production, you know, you, what's the point? And what we're trying to do, and, and this is not new. I mean, this, this whole money reform thing started in the mid 1800s um, is to change the money system so that the people create the money, not the banks. And you know, when banks create money, um, they're the ones who get to decide where it goes. And, and money goes to, where does the money go? It goes to the most credit worthy. That's that's just the nature of a good right. banker, but who's the most credit worthy? So it's the people uh, who already ha- it's the people who already have money. So right there, you see the root cause of, of wealth and, and income inequality. It's at the very source of money creation. It's going to the people who already have it. It's not okay. the only source. But I subscribe to the Economist. I don't. I don't. And. I don't see this. I, I used to check M1, M2, M3, the money supply. So the, when they say M1, M2, one of them is how much money is in circulation, correct? That's what. Well, okay. It, the one, two, three, I think they stopped the three designation. It's how uh, uh, liquid the money is. So like the money in your checking account, that would be M1 because it's immediately available. If you have money in a savings account or a CD or something. So M3 that, that, would just be assets, cash. Yeah, or- yeah. And, and I, I think they stopped the M3 designation altogether. They just felt it wasn't the Fed, Federal Reserve. They made up these designations. They just decided it wasn't very helpful. Do we know how much, so when, when Steve Mnuchin and his wife were photographed holding up dollar bills that hadn't been cut yet. That's well, printing paper. money. Mm-hmm. Do, do they know how much, how many one dollar bills are in circulation? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, they know that very precisely. Right. I mean, of course, they do know that precisely. But um, you know, of course, people can <laughs> burn their money or hide it under a. You know, a rough. So they have somewhere. a rough idea. Oh, it's pretty close. They know how many, how many bills are printed, and they keep close tabs on that. And that's that's part of the the, the M one. That M one so M0, that's probably M zero, is cash, which is reserves and cash. So my, so the how does the treasury know how much money to print? Well, okay, so the Federal Reserve. Their analysts. And are they replacing? Are they replacing old money? Oh yeah, yeah. Or, or putting new money into circulation? No. So what happens is those dollar bills are actually paid for with money created by banks. 
So what happens is somewhere down the line, the money that's in your pocket was created by somebody's mortgage, somebody's loan that they took out and they paid the builder, the builder paid the plumber, the plumber paid the dentist, and, and eventually you get the money. And eventually the government taxes that money or borrows it. Or the bank needs money for the, their ATM machines. They will take money eventually uh, that essentially was created somewhere down the line in the form of a loan. But who gives the order to the, to, who says print a billion dollars today, print. Well, they don't print. Okay, here's another tidbit. Coins and cash make up 3% of the money supply. All of the rest of the money is just spreadsheets. It's just uh, databases in a bank. So the, our money is actually, it's not that the banks hold our money. The banks are our money. They are the embodiment of our money. It's all in, the, in a bank's record. So theoretically, if a, if a bank burnt down and its hard drives got all vaporized and they, they lost all record of your money, it would be gone. So it's embodied in the banking system. It's, it's <laughs> you know, it's like the matrix. Um, and, you know, these are, the thing is, what we were trying to do I, 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 I don't tell me what you're trying to do. I can't figure this out. If, uh, all right, hang on. I sell you a pen for a dollar, right? I don't use pens, but okay. All right, all right. I sell you a pencil for a oh. dollar. <laughs> yeah. You're, you give me a dollar and like a dollar bill, mm -hmm. right? Out of your pocket. Right. Okay. But you're, this is virtual. So you charge it. You send it to me via PayPal. Mm -hmm. So what is, so is, aren't they taking, so if it's on your credit card, you're making a promise to Visa at the end of the month, you will remove a dollar from your checking account. That's correct. And send it to Visa. Mm -hmm. Visa is sending me a dollar and depositing it in my checking account. Right. Charging a fee. Right. But there's a dollar. That's the dollar. You just described it. That was it. <laughs> so that in other words nobody printed that dollar oh no no that, no, that no. dollar didn't exist the only reason they print dollars is for atm machines so right now. a dollar was added to the money supply just then no no the, the, the money wasn't lent to you it's a little bit different that's credit they, they say that um well they say that they'll at some time later make the payment on your behalf. So they're giving you credit to the vendor. Yeah, I give him that, that uh, pencil and don't worry about it. He's good and we're gonna make sure he's good and we'll, we'll pay you on his behalf later. Th that's not the kind of loan I'm talking about. It, it, that does so contribute- money is not being created in that instance. Um, Short-term money is. It's, but it's kind of the difference between money and credit. And that's a very subtle kind of thing that I'm not too good at explaining, I have to admit. What really happens is these, these large loans that like mortgages and uh, business loans, that's where the bulk of money is created. And the only way government can get their hands on that money is to actually tax it from people or borrow it. The government does not create money. The government issues issues cash, but they sell it to the banks. The bank has to transfer money from its reserve account at the Fed to the Treasury's reserve account or the Mint. And the Mint says, okay, here's your, here's your paper in return. They can stock up your, your ATMs with it. So, and it's, that's actually different than coins. Coins is the only form of money that the government can actually create out of nothing. 
And that's why this whole thing about the trillion dollar coin came up. It's more, it's more of a teaching concept than, than a reality because uh, it's, it's too simplified. But that's, in a sense, what we're promoting is that the government should be the only entity that can create money, not private corporations. Which right. we, we need to do this more often. It, it, it's one of the reasons I've been reluctant is it's so impossible to, for, me to, for, for me to penetrate this. It's just so... Um, so do you believe, just so I understand, uh, do you believe in modern monetary theory? Is that something? Some of it. The problem, see, modern monetary theory is more, when people talk about money, they'll talk about, usually they mean finance or they mean monetary policy. And that's kind of what mon modern monetary theory is about. It's, it's monetary policy. We're talking about the money system. Monetary policy is how much money enters the economy. You know, uh, how much do we need to, to avoid inflation and so on? So when modern monetary theory says that the government can always create the money that's needed, you have to be very careful with that language, okay? Because the truth is it can only do that. Hey, Mark, can only do that if there's legislation passed to allow that to happen. It cannot happen now. So they use a language that is deceptive and um, misleading. Um, so okay. let's, but, let's, let's come back next week. Okay. And we'll keep tackling this. Great. It, uh, I enjoyed it. It's yeah. I mean, it's hard stuff, but I, I maintain that if we're going to talk class struggle, if we're going to talk about build back better, inflation, and if we don't understand what Absolutely. the other side pretends to understand, because they don't understand it, do they? They do not. They do not. Bankers don't understand it. Economists don't understand it. They understand a piece of it. They understand the piece that they're working on. But the Does big Jerome Powell understand it? Some of it. Some of it. And, and this, this is well known. I mean, there, there are bankers, bank presidents who admit that they never understood how money was actually created because they can't tell by looking at their books. And actually there was an experiment done where somebody took out a loan, he knew the banker and he actually traced their books and he found out that banks just create money out of thin air when they make a loan. Uh, he, this has been well understood even before that, but he kind of did an empirical study to show, yep, that's what's going on. If so. you don't under, this is what I tell everybody, and then we have to wrap it up. If you don't understand something, there's a reason you don't understand. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's you know, not your if fault. You're in a relationship, right. If you're in a relationship with somebody and they, and you go, what's bothering you? And they say, if you don't know what's bothering you, that's a red flag. They don't want you to know what's bothering them. Yeah. They're keeping, they're, they're being cryptic on purpose. Yep. Um, thank you, Paul. Sure. Allianceformoney.com or .org? It's .org. Okay. Alliance Let's do this. Next week. Or Monetary yeah. Alliance. Okay. Thanks. Uh, monetary, what, what is the full website? Monetary Alliance. Dot org. Great. Well, let's lots of good, it. lots of good resources there. So. Great. Thank you. Next week. Yep. Thank you. Okay. You're okay. listening to the David Feldman show, David Feldman show.com. Mark Breslin is back. His son is, I hope back in school. So we have him. We'll be back with Mark Breslin. Mark Breslin joins us from up in Toronto. It's been a while because your schedule. Well, anyway, it's good to see you, sir. David, I've missed you and I've missed the show. I've missed talking about it. I've been busy. I've been writing 
some musical stuff. Um, let, let me give you a, a, just a couple of pieces I've been working on, if you don't mind. I don't have a band behind me, but I think you'll forgive me. Um, here's one. You say potato, I say potato. You say potato, I say potato, potato, potato. The founder in a grotto. Let's call the whole search off. <laughs> um, and then, uh, then there's this one. Um, here we come, walking down the street. We find the funniest looks from every Jew we meet. Hey, hey, we're the Nazis. <laughs> but we're too busy singing. Put everybody in the ground. So, you know, you, you kind of make it work whichever way you can. Hello, Jackson. Who is that handsome man? Uh, yeah. Is yeah. that your son? So it's kind of the Brian Jones look we've been going for. Maybe that's not a good example. No, I, I it's see the him. Look, we've been going for. No, that's not a good example either. Anyway, <laughs> you know what I loved? You're in the middle of a bit. He walks in. You're being silly and foolish. He's unfazed. He walks in. And he, he's just grown up around the, this nonsense. Hey, hey, we're the Nazis. I like that. I'm glad to do. Why don't we pitch that? Well, I already did. Um, and uh, Trump liked it. He was going to back it, but um, then he got busy. And he got busy because he lost the, the election. And he got busy because he won the election. Yeah. Uh, well, you've, been away, you've been away. So what else have you seen? So you're writing musicals. But... Well, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but you know we had an election here in Canada. Yes. Did you have anybody on your show talk about it in any detail? Well, we had Professor Adnan Hussein talk about it. Nothing pretty much changes. We understood it, right? Although the, the the racist party got more votes, like some People's Party. Yeah, they got know. about five percent of the vote. Which yeah. it, you know, what's called the People's Party? Kind of what I expected them to do. They're not just a racist party. They're an anti-vaxxer party. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of on that uh, uh, government's not going to tell me what to do. Right. You know, right. You know the government's not going to tell me what to do. Uh, how about stop signs? Well, that's a bit different. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. You're not putting a stop sign in my body. Well, it depends how hard you hit that stop sign. <laughs> so, anyway, um, we actually. So you had an election. Actually, no, I should tell you, we actually inadvertently um, raised money for that party. How did you do that? Because they, we didn't know who they were, and they rented one of my clubs to do a fundraiser. Mm. But I didn't know that until it was way too late. Nobody really knew about it. It didn't make a big deal. We didn't sell any of their uh, tickets through our, through our website. Um, if you went on our calendar and didn't list it, it was just like a private party. We didn't realize what it was. We just thought it was the conservative party. Um, we didn't know that it was that party. So uh, anyway, um, so what amazed me about this election was just how much people hated. And I never knew that they hated P uh, Justin Trudeau. They hate him. I don't know why they voted for him anyway. Because I think the idea was it's better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. But I'll tell you something. Anybody who took a dime of help and his party helped an awful lot of people. Um, anybody who took a dime of help from him um, owed it to him to vote for him. Because I'll tell you something. David, he bought my vote. <laughs> Fair and square. With the UBI. With a, there's a whole bunch of stuff that he did. Um, there's, uh, there's, there, are, there were direct payments for anybody who did not qualify for uh, unemployment insurance, which would mean artists and creative people, gig, gig workers, um, people who are always ignored, um, even by leftist parties, because you know they're, just, they're not organized into anything. Right. They're workers. They'd like to work more. Um, and also, uh, if you have a business, there were all kinds of uh, direct payments for hiring people, uh, paying your rent, the rent of the, uh, of the business, all kinds of stuff. We took a lot of that stuff. How could anybody who did not vote for him? It's, it's beyond me. So why is he disliked? I think they dislike him personally. 
It's a personal dislike of somebody who reeks of privilege. And he does reek of privilege, but the, the complaint is not a left-wing critique of privilege. It's a, a more of a, a populist critique of privilege, which is, a, I think, a totally different kind of thing. Um, it's dynastic. You know, I don't think of the Trudeau, maybe I'm wrong. There were, there were the Kennedys, they started off rich and then they went into politics. The Bushes, finance, went to politics. I think of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the father, but I don't think of the Trudeau name as financiers. Are they, did, were they originally? Gas stations. Gas stations. They owned, I don't know how many gas stations. That's where they made their big money. And Margaret Trudeau. The amount of money, the money they made. They fill it up. Yeah, fill it up. That's right. <laughs> Which is better than, you know, being a... <laughs> Yeah, better than being a dental hygienist and having to say spit. That's <laughs> Which she also... Have you ever wondered why dental hygienists generally are quite pretty? Yes, why? Because only if they were pretty would you stand somebody sticking a piece of metal in your mouth and then saying spit. Right. Spit. Right. Spit. Spit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> are they pretty or dentists just really ugly? Do they just look pretty in comparison? Dentists are not a good looking group of people, are they? Now, my own dentist would be very offended by that, but uh, he's a bald Greek guy and he's a fabulous dentist and a great but guy. I, I, I would not go to a Greek dentist. You wouldn't. Why? I just, because you don't know which cavity he's going to fill. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The, there, goes your, there goes your Greek vote. There goes my Greek vote. Uh, this is why. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, I have a couple of questions. Yes. When so w was the Trudeau family wealthy, or did they just own a, a a chain of gas stations? Well, define wealthy. I mean, I don't think they're wealthy like the Kennedys are wealthy or okay. the are wealthy. No, um, uh, they never show up on the list of you know, 100 richest families in Canada, but they're wealthy. They're wealthy enough that he doesn't ever have, that Justin never had to work. He did work as a drama teacher, as a, um, I think he was a drama teacher, as a ski coach, whatever the things he did. He did the things that rich kids do. Like wear blackface. Like wear, not blackface, brownface, please. There's a difference. Okay. All right. On, a pan, on the Pantone scale, I think he was... Uh, Burnt Sienna. <laughs> He's survived it, though. He survived it because I think most of the people um, who were, I think the people who really dislike him were really, you know, they threw stones at him. And, and I thought this was so Canadian. They did, the people who were protested against him did not throw rocks. They threw gravel. <laughs> that's so Canadian. Because right. gravel, oh, that's annoying. That's right. really but you're not going to get really hurt. Um, I wish I lived. I, I'd give anything to move to Canada. When you say there, it's a parliamentary election. So for the Americans to understand this, he's only running for his seat. Correct. The, Amer the Canadians are not voting for Trudeau. They're voting for their individual representatives in, in parliament. And then you add up all the representatives and whoever has the majority gets to pick who the prime minister is. So all it takes, and what, what does he represent? What, what, do, what part of Canada does he? Well, his strengths are in Ontario, especially Toronto. Well, where's his seat? Oh, his seat is in Montreal, in um, an English, wealthy English part of Montreal that probably <laughs> has never voted anything but liberal. That's interesting. So Qu Quebec. Yes. He's French, in case you hadn't noticed. Interesting. And Pierre Elliott Trudeau was also... also had a seat in, 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 um, in Montreal, and it might have even been the same seat. So the prime minister is French. I didn't know that. I, I'm sorry. And I'm not, I don't mean to like laugh here, but you didn't know Trudeau was French. 
No. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry for my I'm seriously, I, sh- I should have known that he was French. And so is is that a big th- given that Quebec has talked of seceding and they're separatists? What does that mean, having a French prime minister? How significant is that? And and was Pierre Elliott Trudeau, his father, the, the first French prime minister? Did you? Hardly. 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 In, the, in fact, generally, um, the, traditionally, we go back and forth between English-based prime ministers and French-based prime ministers. There have been lots of, lots of French prime ministers and lots of French uh, leaders of parties of, of the major parties. That's that's not abnormal at all, uh, especially among the liberals, because Qu- Quebec has always been a liberal stronghold until recently, when there has been a lot of um, sort of uh, you know Quebec nationalism. Um, but even so, um, the liberals win a lot of seats in Quebec. Right. But before before Quebec nationals, they would win them all federally. Right. Not provincially necessarily, but federally. You know, I used there was a period when I was going to Montreal every summer for like 15, I don't know, 10 years. Yeah, for just for laughs. And (coughs) do if you live in Montreal, you identify as French, Canadian, and Quebec, uh, Quebecois. You have three identities? No, not necessarily. Um, there's an Eng- there's a very strong and used to be stronger um, unilingual, pretty much unilingual um, English uh, population in Montreal, mostly downtown, um, mostly again wealthy. Um, then there's um, if you go out just just I'm slightly, sorry, they're, they're French speaking. Sorry, they're no. English speaking or French speaking? Oh, we're English speaking. They're English speaking. And they're doing business in Montreal speaking just English. Yes. Because they they choose not to speak French or they can't speak French. They're culturally English. Um, they've been brought up in English. They've gone to English schools they in Montreal. Went, yes, they've gone to English universities. If you went to McGill, um, you would take your courses in English. Uh, on the other hand, there's a there are a number of uh, uh, universities that uh, that teach in French. I, I don't know what the names are, uh, but um, I would say probably eighty five percent of the population of uh, of Quebec has French as their first language, and then I would say fifteen percent have English as their first language, and most of them speak some amount of the other language. But uh, and some people are completely bilingual and they work for the government. You can't work for the government without being completely bilingual. It's right. Amazing. The French language in Montreal and Quebec. How different is it? How different is the dialect from Paris? Very different. Very you, different. Could, you could tell somebody you could hear the way somebody speaks French and go, this person's from Montreal. Um, you would hear that um, or you would think that they um, studied French in school. Because when you go to study, I, I went to a bilingual uh, uh, university and I studied French there. And the French I was learning was not Quebec French. It was uh, Parisian French. So if I went to Montreal and I spoke the kind of French that I learned at Glendon College, they would think either I was from, well, they wouldn't um, think I was from Paris because my, my French wasn't good enough. So they would assume that I went to school and learned French there. Um, no, it's, a, it's called the Joual. It's an actual uh, dialect which actually people say, linguists say, is closer to the way that French was really envisioned and the way people really spoke it back in the 1700s when people uh, tra- uh, migrated, uh, emigrated to, to Quebec. And so that, that, that was the purer French. What you hear in Parisian French now actually is a, this more sophisticated academic French that has been learned over the last two, 300 years. But it's, now, is it true that uh, the, Quebec, in the Quebecois dialect, there are 2,000 different words for I'm sorry, but in Parisian French, there's zero? Um, yes, that's true. Also, 
there's two, 2,200 words for poutine uh, in uh, Quebec, and there are none in Paris. You know what? Poutine is onomatopoeta. It, it, it really... It is poo. It's full of or, or something better than poo. I hate poutine. I don't know how people eat that slop. Just to look at it makes me Ralph. Uh, interesting about... Uh, it's so fascinating coming from being an American and living right next door to a country that celebrates this kind of division, the, this the separate, like this idea that there's a province of French speaking Canadians and somehow they, uh, why, this is a, a rude question. What, what is it that solidifies the, the Quebecois from assimilating? Is it, is it a, the French identity that's so strong or the, hatred, the hatred of American culture? That oh, no, no, the Quebecois like America. In fact, they identify very strongly with America. Look at Montreal and the Comedy Festival there and how much they, they adore um, American acts over Canadian acts. That's just one small example. But, but, but the you culture... Know, before you say that, you know, isn't it great? Canada's this place where they have this huge province and everybody speaks another language and everybody just thinks it's terrific. No, they don't think it's terrific at all. In fact, if you go out to Alberta, there's an amazing amount of resentment. Um, about Quebec because Quebec gets all kinds of constitutional and economic advantages, uh, which are, are seen in things like transfer payments and uh, special laws, uh, language laws, for instance. Here's one, and it's a ridiculous one. Um, if you want to buy a box of uh, cereal in Canada, that box of cereal has to be printed in both official languages, even in a place like Alberta where nobody speaks French. And that's resented because if you're a business person, of course, it costs you more money. And if you're not a business person, you're thinking, why am I reading this French? Uh, why am I reading this in French? But the second uh, most spoken language here in Alberta is Ukrainian. Hmm. So, so there's a great deal of, of animosity towards, towards Quebec. But and there are, go ahead. Graphically situated in such a place where um, they cannot really separate. They, they, it's just not practical. And nobody would really want them to separate because it would completely break the company, the, the country up. But if Quebec somehow, and all the French people in Quebec were all in British Columbia on one side of the country, I don't think anybody would care if they, if they left. Because there, there, are there are pockets in Canada, like French speaking pockets way out West, right? Um, yeah, there's a bit in Manitoba. Um, I, I'd say a better example is in the Maritimes. I think in Nova Scotia, there's a lot of French speaking people. Um, in New Brunswick, there's a lot of French speaking people, but definitely not, not in Alberta, not in British Columbia, hardly at all. Uh, not in Saskatchewan, really. Uh, but in Manitoba, there's some French speaker. There are some French people. I should tell my listeners, because I didn't give you a proper introduction. You are Mark Breslin. You're the founder and president of Yuck Yucks, the largest comedy chain in North America, perhaps the world. I used to say to people who weren't comedians, but were native Californians, when I lived in California, I may not be a native Californian, but I've seen more of California than you have because I'm a comedian. And I, I know every nook and cranny of California because I did one nighters all over. Is it safe to say that you have seen every part of Canada? Because well, I've seen the far north, and someday I hope to. What is uh, the far north? Sorry, is that inhabitable? Oh yeah, oh yeah. In fact, Yellowknife, which is in uh, the Yukon um, or the Yukon, as I like to call it. Um, Yellowknife has the highest uh, concentration of PhDs in the country. I would think urologists as well. Probably, probably urologists. Also, and, and uh, Moyles, and Moyles. 
lot of moils. No, there's no Jews in Yellowknife that I'm aware of. I don't think we've got a million there. Um, but I, but yes, I've traveled. I've crisscrossed this country by bus, uh, car, train, plane. This is why I've, I've kind of quietly let it be known that I would love love to become a senator uh, in in Canada. You know, those are, that's an appointed position, not an elected position. And um, you are royalty. You're, you're a duke. Of, aren't you like a duke? He got the Order of Canada. Um, the Order of Canada. Yes. Um, Which is not Poutine, by the way. That's a separate order. That's that a, comes on the side. Order. That's an order I could I could walk away from. Um, but, you are Canadian royalty. The closest. Seriously, you have. I know. Um, but um, I've always thought I'd, I'd make a good senator because, A, I'm not a lawyer. But I have seen this country uh, from every perspective. Um, I've gone on those long bus rides through the prairies that take three days, stopping in every town and going on uh, and performing in every little little place imaginable. No, I feel I know this country well. What do you think you have spread more throughout Canada, comedy or anti-Semitism? Um, actually, uh, probably herpes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think herpes. It's not your own. You would just bring it and... I bring it in vials. And <laughs> when people ask for my autograph, I kind of spill it onto the, onto the page. And they go, oh, wow, thank you. And they touch it and they've got it. The train, the, supposedly there's a train that goes across Canada that's heaven. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you any of you taken it? And actually, I won two seats on that train, on that train ride uh, that goes all across the West. It's a dome and it's in a dome car. And, you, and I gave it to my uh, my in-laws uh, to do it. I just didn't feel like like doing it. It had to be done within a certain period of time. I couldn't do it. And they loved it. Everybody loves that that train ride. It run, it How expensive? Is it just too expensive? Um, it's like, uh, I think it's like $2,800 a seat. That includes all your meals. And of course, it's a sleeper car, and I think it's four nights or five nights. I I love train. I could just sit on my mind. Who loves a train, and that's what the Nazis knew. So, <laughs> like, if they'd said no, if the Nazis said get on the bus, come on, the bus, they would have said, "Are you kidding? A bus? We're not getting on a bus." But when they said get on the train, they went, "Ooh, sleeper cars. Okay, we'll get on the train." <laughs> Who's the porter? How do you think you and I would have done? You know what? Whenever Mark Breslin's here, the conversation always turns to Auschwitz. I don't know what it is. I don't think I've ever had a conversation. I, I don't think I've ever had a dinner with you that didn't eventually turn to oh, Auschwitz. Sure. We have discussed Buchenwald. We have <laughs> discussed Bergen Belsen. We, I, 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 no, I think that's very unfair of you. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, well, let me ask you before you go, yeah. comedy, what is happening with comedy? They're slowly inching back. People always ask the wrong questions, which is, um, how many clubs have you reopened? And the truth is we've opened up nine out of 12 and people say, oh, you must be doing great. But that's not the metric. The metric is how many customers are you serving a week or how many customers are there a week? And pre COVID there were four to 5,000 customer paying customers a week across the country. Now we're somewhere between 1,200 and 1,400. And that's based on the amount of people we're allowed to put in the clubs, uh, plus people's nervousness about going out. People are still nervous about going mm -hmm. out. Um, but in Ontario, they passed a law uh, just recently where you have to show your vaccination passports, um, the proof of va vaccination to get into the club. And I have to tell you, David, people said, Oh, there's going to be so much blowback from this. People are going to, uh, you know, come in and riot. And no, they're all saying, thank you. We're glad that you're doing this. We're glad that this is the law because now we feel safe. And because they feel safe, I think the government is now going to allow us to go from 30% capacity to 50% capacity very quickly. For instance. Interesting. Very interesting. Last night, I didn't sleep. I've had horrible insomnia. And I clicked on Nato Green. He's a comedian. Do you know who Nato Green is? He's from San Francisco. I don't know. And he got me. 
I, he, uh, I saw him playing the punchline in San Francisco on YouTube, where I'm from, YouTube. I'm from San Francisco. You know, I started doing comedy in San Francisco. And then it was like a new club, the acoustics somewhere in San Francisco. There was a piano, there were curtains, and it felt like a really sophisticated, you know, that, that, that kind of sophisticated San Francisco comedy room that only lasts one week, but while it's open, it's the best. And I want the the sound of the laughs. There's a certain type of sound from a room, and I went, "Oh my God, do I miss that? That it's it's a where it's not that echo." Anyway, it's it's a certain type of, and it was Nato, this guy Nato Green, who's a smart comedy. I went, "Oh yeah." Uh, David, I will check him out. But I have to tell you that I have been going to my clubs every single night that they're open. And it's mostly on the weekend. And uh, last weekend, we drove out to Burlington, which is a club that's about an hour away from Toronto. And this weekend, we'll go to Oshawa, which is another club that's an hour away in the other direction. And there is nothing like the sound of that laughter. I don't miss the comics so much as I miss the audiences. Yeah. I miss yeah. The joy. And, uh, that that's been something clicked last night for some, you know, NATO green. It was just, it was just the type of comedy I like and the laughs he was getting. I went, Oh, right. Right. Uh, you don't see that much. You don't see Netflix specials that make me miss live. Not too much. Did you, did you see Chappelle? Yes, I saw Chappelle. I saw the last one. I, I, as I've said before, I find Chappelle a bit too loose for my taste. I'm more of a Chris Rock guy. And I think that's always the question. You know, some people are Chris Rock people and some people are Dave Chappelle people. Um, it's usually too loose and rangy for me. I like the special. I did not have a problem with the Jew joke. Did you have a problem with the Jew joke? I didn't hear the Jew joke. I was listening for the transgender joke. What's the oh, Jew joke? Well, the Jew joke goes, and I hate doing other people's material because I never do it justice, but he said, I'm working on a... Uh, a new, um, uh, a, a new science fiction, uh, a new science fiction st uh, story, and it's about this uh, race of people who inhabited the Earth, and then they went to uh, uh, outer space and got all this extra uh, information, and then they all came back to Earth and owned and owned everything and did everything. It's called space Jews. And a lot of people are up in arms about that. But to me, it's a compliment. When people say, hey, the Jews own the media, I go, only the media? Gee, <laughs> it was flipping. Who do you uh, want to own the media, by the way? The Bosnians? <laughs> if ever there were a people that should own the media, it's... <laughs> <laughs> if that, you broke up. If anybody should own the media, it's the Jews. Yeah. Right. Did he do any jokes about transgender Jews? No. Um, no transactional Jews, but no, no transactional. transactional Jews, but no transgender Jews. This schmata, this little thing. I like and, him. I think he's great, but he's I, 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 yeah. comments, I like even more. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark Breslin. Everybody check out Yuck Yucks. Go see comedy. Live, com there's nothing better than live comedy. Maybe live sex. No, I much prefer it on TV. You're right. Yeah. Live sex is. Uh, well, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it always works in, in, in porn. Nobody in porn ever goes, I'm sorry, I don't know, it's never happened before. <laughs> <laughs> never. Oh, by the way, I have a sponsor. I. I uh, did you know that I'm uh, I have a website, a porn site? It's uh, Christian. It's Christian porn for Orthodox Jews. It's called NIMBY, not in my backyard. It's the kind of porn that God intended. NIMBY, not in my backyard. And, yeah, check it out. Thank you, Mark. Please come back next week. Thank you. OK, Thank bye. You. so that's Mark President. Everybody should go to see comedy in Canada, fly to Canada. They won't let you in if you're an American, I don't think. But if you can sneak into Canada, go to Yuck Yucks and uh, stay there. Stay, stay in Canada. You're better off. Hey, uh, Professor Marianne Cummings is next, but 
is it, oh, we're going to do Dan Frankenberger in the newsroom, if that's OK. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, Office Hours, this Friday night at 8 p.m. Go to my website and it'll take you right to Office Hours on Friday night. Meet better people like Professor Marianne Cummings. When we come back, we will be joined by Dan Frankenberger in the newsroom. <laughs> Welcome back. Let's go to our newsroom where Dan Frankenberger is standing by. Hello, sir. Coming up, Professor Marianne Cummings. Hello, pretentious D-bag. Hello, JAG officer. I am a JAG officer. How do you know? I was in the Navy. Are you coming to expect it? (laughs) How was your weekend? It was fantastic. I went to work and I cooked a bunch of food and everything went well. Nice and smooth. Um, I cooked some uh, a turkey taco salad. Turkey and, taco salad. And I also made deep fried lasagna. Deep fried lasagna. So you have leftover lasagna, but if you but cut it, it into like the, like third of a pieces and then bread it and then deep fry it. Yeah. It's good. Oh, it's good. I'm getting hungry. Yeah. It's pretty I'm gross. <laughs> deep fried. <laughs> what, what kind of oil? I'm just regular vegetable oil. Hmm. And vegetable oil, you can cook at a higher temperature than olive oil. That is true. Yeah. Peanut just, oil gets to the higher temperatures and lower temperatures than vegetable oil would be like a coconut oil or, yeah, there's all different, uh, different, uh, they call it smoke point. The smoke point? Yep. So peanut oil has the highest smoke point? Yep. You'll, you'll see uh, the Asian cookeries with the wax, a lot of times they use peanut oil because- it can get so hot without uh, burning too quickly. And is pe- I, I would assume peanut oil is not that bad for you, right? It's a vegetable. Is peanuts are a vegetable, not a flower or a plant. They're not fruits, right? Mm, good question. They might be a legume. I'm not really even sure. Uh, I've been eating peanuts. Hey, uh, before we go to Community Billboard, this is the seven-day rolling average for COVID. And it seems, well, it peaked, you know, at the beginning of the year, it seems to be going down. It seems to be on the decline a little. So that's, I thought I, we need good news, right? Yep. We sure do. Yeah. Uh, There hasn't been much coming up, Professor Marianne, but look at this. Is that from last week? That's from last week. That's last week's. Those are potatoes. Those, those are potatoes. Sorry. Those are Glenn Cox's. <laughs> Taters. <laughs> those, look, those are delicious. <laughs> How is it up there in Rochester tonight? Um, it was warm all day. I, I dressed too heavily at work. I ended up sweating by the end of the day. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been calm and cool. The, the leaves are starting to fall which I'm going to bring up in a few minutes when you grab the pictures, the uh, Dave and PA, we got a picture of uh, his place that we've seen before, but I'm, I'm going to try to get a, a fresh picture out of him in the next month or so as the leaves change. Cause he's got such a huge uh, landscape and tons of trees around it. So it's going to be oh, pretty awesome. Move there. Well, I'm in the mood for applesauce. applesauce. What is this? What are you doing here? What is, what is this going to stick up to? He makes his own applesauce. So a lot of times uh, the farms around the, the small towns, they'll sell the kind of beat up and ugly looking apples and people will make applesauce out of them. Uh-huh. I made homemade applesauce and yeah, it's wonderful. Just boil it with a little water and sugar and mash it up and you're good to go. Beat up fruits and vegetables. There, there There's a market for that. Yeah, it's been in the news the last couple of years. Uh, I think a lot uh, in Europe where it started, just the, the vegetables that are not uh, uniform. They want, they, yeah. All the vegetables have to look, all the tomatoes have to look like rubber tennis balls, red tennis balls. If they're not aesthetically pleasing, 
Yeah. They, they don't tend to sell them, but there's markets opening up where if you've got a goofy looking carrots and stuff, you know, they get sold. People are yeah. buying them on purpose at similar prices just to not be wasteful. Yeah. And they're interesting to look at. Yeah. They're cool. I know that person. How do you fix a squeaky chair? You buy um, it. I heard you buy another one last weekend. I just, yeah. That's this is Frankenstein, from, right? Yep. This is a cartoony version of Frankenstein's monster from Tom Weber. I've uh, put it up on community billboard before sometime last year, but we're getting into the Halloween spirit here in October. So I thought I'd show it again because it's so cool. And this is a pen drawing um, that he drew and imported into his iPad to add additional digital coloring. He's amazing. How do people buy his stuff? You can go to tomweberart.com and he's got a, a whole bunch of um, pictures up there that he's done both manually uh, with paint and he's got digital stuff and they're all organized by category. So it's pretty cool to go to a site. And Chartreuse had a showing? What? Yep, that's coming up in a picture or two from now. Oh, okay. I yep, jumped, it's coming. I jumped the gun. All right. This is... I'm worried. Am I going to crash the system here? No, that's fake. That's what I was telling you about a couple of minutes ago. Uh, Dave and PA has a, a Airbnb property and it's surrounded by tons of trees. So I'm curious to, to get a picture in the autumn from him in the next few months. That you, just, you can uh, check out the Airbnb. Uh, he's got a tiny URL, which is tinyurl.com, Bertie's Country Cottage. B-E-R-T-I-E-S, Country Cottage, where you can check it out. It's a property that has, uh, it holds five guests, has two bedrooms and uh, one bathroom, and it's in Pennsylvania. It's gorgeous. It's yep, we absolutely show, gorgeous. We show pictures of it once in a while, and yeah. everything about it is awesome. That's where you and I are going to hide after we commit our 10 state killing spree. I'm worried about... I'm loading this up. I'm worried that it's, there we go. This is uh, Chartreuse's. Yep. This is uh, from Kristen Calabrese. She has a show in LA, which is entitled How Things Feel. And that runs from October 8th until November 21st. So it's a, a six week long showing. And uh, she's, she's given me the address to announce, yes. which is uh, 7503 West Sun Sunset Boulevard in LA. Give it again, please. 7503 West Sunset Boulevard, Los Angeles, California. It's running October uh, 8th through the 21st and from 6 to 8 p.m. each night. And uh, John Hayes actually went down there during office hours. I know. Yep. So we were checking that out and she sent me a message that she met John and he's awesome and nice and sweet. So he is. He is. Office hours putting people together still. Yep. And I know who did this, Lane. Yep, this is a piece by Lane. Um, he's called it Shooting for the Moon. And this one is dedicated to another Office Hours attendee, Tim from Canada. Mm -hmm. um, the red lettering on there says TFC. So in the detail, he actually really, really put it on there. He says uh, it's done for an entertaining and often annoying Canadian Hunter S. Thompson type friend from the David Feldman office hours. Tim from Canada. Yep. And he says that uh, his late heroic granddad flew missions during World War II to whom this country owes a great debt. So he said this is a, the first one he's really been happy with with this style. So good job, Lane. That was, that was yeah. awesome. He's amazing. I was watching him play the guitar the other night. And the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, um, this past and most recent episode had con constitutional scholar Bruce Fine was on there and they devoted the entire radio hour to discussing war powers in the United States with Yale historian Samuel Moyen, M-O-Y-N, the author of Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War. And if you look off to the right on this picture, you'll also see the Congress Club link. So if you go there, uh, David was mentioning earlier in the show that they're doing an office hours meeting for Congress Club. And that's yes, this, so this week, right? This Sunday. This I Sunday. don't have the time. I'll, I'll know on Thursday. I want to say 
well, I don't, I, I don't want to say what time it is, but everybody should go to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website and sign up for Congress Club because some of us can't run for office the way Professor Marianne Cummings does. Well, Dan Frankenberger in the newsroom. Thank you, sir. Yep. Send anything you want uh, to get into the community billboard to Feldman at gmail.com. Yes. And I think you and I are going to talk tomorrow, right? Yep. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, buddy. Dan Frankenberger. Nothing gets done here without Dan Frankenberger. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Subscribe to this show wherever you get your podcasts. We have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're watching us on YouTube right now, hit the like button, please, and give us a nice review. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Pandora, Wherever you're listening to us, please hit the like button, give us a good review, and share this with your friends. We're a little show, and we do great work here because we have great guests like Professor Marianne, who joins us after this. That's right. Welcome back. Let's go to Aurora, Illinois, where physicist Professor Mary Ann Cummings is standing by. You're laughing. And Parks Commissioner for Aurora, Illinois. Paul LeBeau, a physicist, was on earlier. Did you see the conversation? I caught a little bit of that, and I would love for us to have that further conversation along those lines. I think we need what we need to do is have a very disciplined hour, probably at the end of the show with Paul and just keep trying to learn money. How much of it were you, not to embarrass you, you are Marianne, Professor Marianne Cummings, you are a, a physicist and you are also Parks Commissioner for Aurora, Illinois. You're also an amazing should I say impressionist? Your art is your art? Are you an Yeah, I would say impressionistic realism is yeah. kind of my tagline. And you're no slouch when it comes to being able to unravel the secrets of the universe. In all honesty, how much are you able to understand about the Federal Reserve and money? You know... I've always been perplexed by it because after forcing myself in, as an undergraduate to learn math and physics, you start be developing habits like, okay, uh, conserved quantities, you know, conservation of momentum, conservation of uh, conservation of energy, conservation of charge. Um, when you deal with, when I took a, the accelerated e econ economics course at Michigan, that was tough. You know, I was, I was badgering the professor. I think he got very annoyed with me because I was trying to like use my physics developing brain and apply it to economy. Like, you know, I'm not seeing a conserved current here. 
I mean, what is this multiplier effect? Something comes out of nothing. Well, I guess in particle physics, it kind of does. But, uh, you know, it was, I did remember finally nailing him down and actually seeing an equation for money flow that went into the Fed's releasing money, which it does by a, you know, indirect means, you know, it offers bonds, it offers treasury notes. But um, it was, you know, I think our economics, because things can be described kind of with differential equations and physics like stuff, you know, there's a, a, there's a real uh, hope and belief on the part of some economists that it's a real science underneath there. And um, I wish I could take credit for it but I can't, I remember in school reading a column that was by some liberal uh, MIT economist, used to have a regular column, wrote, I read it at the uh, Detroit Free Press and he talked about, he said all the confusion of economics, a lot of it centers on it not being a science, but it should be more properly understood as a branch of ethics because you do have, it's not just acquisition of wealth. Wealth gets acquired, well, historically it was just conquest and, and stealing propine also but if you have an economy you have a sense of exchange which means you have an ex sense of a common knowledge of what you're doing like you know my bushel of wheat is worth you know some of your uh hardware you know for for my house or my barn or whatever and uh so it to it, it when once you get and I know, I hope Paul is still listening, but I think once you get beyond, you know, the, that sort of at least uh, potentially honest exchange, you know, I need something, you need something, we collectively as a city need something, uh, you guys over there need something. Once you take it a couple step removed and you get finance, which originally was a brilliant, brilliant idea. One of the best ideas humanity has come up with which solves the space and time problem of enough money, of enough promises, because money is really just promises. It's, it's motivation for people to work and get something done. But when you've enshrined the finance aspect of it, then you get all these enormously elaborate scams. And uh, I, I think I commented earlier because I saw it on, your, uh, on the YouTube channel that what I think is understood about economics, which actually understood is fairly straightforward. It may not, it may take some discipline to actually learn it. And I think Stephanie Kelton's book was, I think, a real eye opener because it wasn't modern monetary theory. It wasn't a theory. It, it, she was actually describing how the federal, how the money uh, producing machine works. So it's, it's an interesting read. But um, once you enshrine finance itself, that's where all the problems come from. That's where all the complications come from. And that's where all the scams come from. Who understood these you know, several tranched tiered uh, it, uh, mortgage backed securities, these derivatives, these, I can't remember what the term was, but was essentially side Collateralized bets. debt obligations. Well, the collateralized debt obligations, but or then the there was something debt. else that were like side bets on these collateralized debt obligations, I'm sure. Dr. Paul would be able to come up with that. But it, but the thing is, is that, you know, I remember us kind of trying to explain it to a couple of people and one of my colleagues, a couple of younger people a few years ago, one of my colleagues turns to me and says, hey, Marianne, I bet you $1 trillion, your Detroit Tigers are gonna suck in the World Series. I go, oh yeah? Well, I'll bet you a trillion bucks that they'll win. And we're good for it. We we signed one trillion, and we signed our names. Poof. Right. You know, we made capital. And then you get it insured by AIG or something. Then then the well, it was yeah. This was a silly joke, but the point is, you know, it's not it's it's not the money. It's not even a pile of inert metal sitting someplace. It's the fact that you have the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, which I guess would include its army that's backing this up. And then you Although add- Somewhere I actually do have, uh, I do have a silver dollar certificate I've been carrying around for about 20 years. I, somebody gave me a dollar bill that looked funny. 
And I just looked at it and then it didn't say $1. It said silver certificate. You know, like they used to, that they used to circulate, but that's now just an anomaly. So I kept it, you know, just as a you know, historical artifact. So. I but, used to have a script when I was, we used to have real, I don't know if, it, you know what? I don't know if it was real Confederate script or not. Hmm. Um, I wonder if it was fake. Um, I'm yeah. sure there's stuff floating around someplace in some attics. You know? I'm sure yeah, some I'm collectors. Sure, I'm sure Donald Trump supporters uh, <laughs> are, clinging on to, are clinging to it. I, I think of economics, an economist to me is like a, a police coroner that you they're they're helpful after a crash they can look back and tell you what killed the economy depending on who's paying them like a coroner will tell you how somebody died based on what do you, what do you need mm-hmm. so if i'm going hello peter b Collins, we're running 10 minutes behind if that's okay with you. So I'm going to turn your, I'm going to turn your video off for a second. Uh, thank you. Peter B. Collins is, is coming up. So anyway, interesting conversation with David Cobb. I said to him, you're Joe Biden. How do you play high, hardball with Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin? He said, committee assignments. You just say to them, you don't support the, if if Joe Biden really wanted Build Back Better, he and Schumer and Pelosi would say you either support this or you're like Marjorie Taylor Greene, no no committee assignments. You're like Steve King, the racist from Iowa, no committee assignments. You either get with the program or you're a non-person. Then of course they can go to the Republican Party. That's the, the, the Republicans one. don't even want Kirsten Cinema. I mean, she's one of the least popular politicians in the state of Arizona. They, they can get somebody else at this point. Yeah. So, but you have a point, like these guys are but not- David Cobb the- said that wasn't what, oh, okay, okay. <clears throat> what I said. But it's a great, I mean, I went, oh yeah, there are ways to- There's ways even like, even tenured professors I knew, there were ways that the administration, if they didn't like you, even if you were a tenured for life professor, there's ways they could make your life miserable. Yes. And okay. there is definitely ways for particularly for, uh, you know, for narcissists like cinema and mansion, there are ways that they can make their life miserable, but they won't do it. Now- So I in other words, they spare, cinema from being miserable, which means millions of us have to be miserable instead. It's a big club and we ain't in it. But but the thing is that Joe Biden wanted to do something, or I would say Joe Biden's staff wanted to do something. I've been thinking about this. Joe Biden should go down to West Virginia and Arizona and even though somebody pointed out, and I didn't, I didn't check this fact, but somebody pointed out in another forum that uh, Bernie Sanders got more votes in his primary, more votes in his primary against uh, Hillary Clinton than Joe Manchin got in his last election. In West Virginia. That's in West Virginia. Okay. So, uh, no, we know that Biden really can't do it. He's not inclined, but what they could do is Joe Biden could go to West Virginia and take Bernie Sanders with him. And he's, you know, got enough of a a sort of lizard brain uh, chops left that he can just introduce his good friend, Bernie Sanders. And then Bernie Sanders can just let both barrels fire, both guns blaze. I mean, you know, uh, figuratively speaking, of course, uh, at uh, Joe Manchin. So, um, and then you can do the same in Arizona. I mean, that, that's the point. When, when I hear even really good Democrats talk about procedure and policy and in principle, there's as many moderate Dems as there are progressives. Which, which set of policies is most popular? 
What set of policies is most popular? This should be, I mean, this, this is a gift. I mean, is very rarely do you have it this easy that what you're pushing for and most of the highlights of the BBB bill, I would call it Bernie Sanders reconciliation bill, is like the, every single one is immensely popular. And the reason uh, why the Democrats are having problems is because I really think that the uh, that the hearts of Democratic leadership really isn't in it. I, I am <laughs> beginning to I, I I hate to agree with you on that. I know it, you do. It, it pains me. It sucks. But, yeah, but you're absolutely right. The, this the, Pelosi had a deadline. The, what was the end of September to vote on these two? Yeah, bits. I think it was the 27th, right? Yeah. And they have not sold this bill to the American people. Most people don't know what's in the bill. When they are told what's in the bill, they support it overwhelmingly. They only know what it costs. This is a new, we were talking about this poll earlier. If they really wanted Build Back Better, we would know what's in this bill. It, it's oh, almost yeah. like people talking about Medicare and going, yeah, Johnson has this $400 billion bill. Uh, I think it's something to do with old people. Yeah, that's, that's what, to not know what's in, for the American people not to know what's in Build Back Better, there's only one person's fault and it's Biden's. It's, well, uh, it's I, I guess there's another clue to their thinking. Uh, I learned a new word. I guess it's a word. I learned a new word this past week. Um, it's called popularism. Jen Psaki introduced that. Not populism, of course, because that's a dirty word in their circus, but popularism. And from the semi-word salad, she was explaining that it was basically um, Democrats should run on popular things. Wow, you know, what a concept. Of course, with, with no intention of ever passing any of them, but you know, that, that's what, and, and I thought, wow, that's almost honest. Actually, that's almost crystal clear honesty coming from right. us. But, and it's like, but in fact, you know, that's kind of been the Democrats' political strategy, strategy for the last 20 years, punctuated by a few bailouts of, uh, of Wall Street. And then, of course, there's always, you know, oof, Republicans, ooga booga, or ter like terrorists before that. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, boy, they are running out of steam. And it's, it's kind of uh, a bankrupted sort of uh, a, a, a philosophy, if there ever was a coherent philosophy. I guess, as I said, I, I would um, direct people to Matt Stoller's article from like five years ago. They basically uh, was in the Atlantic and it was how the post Watergate revolution, all the Watergate babies, they called them, basically came back to Washington intent on reshaping the Democratic Party, you know, sort of severing it from its old, from its creaky, you know, 1930s New, New Deal type roots and a modern party that would emphasize civil rights and uh, high tech and finance. And it was, and, and basically leave the wor working class like pretty much to the Republicans, I guess, or just, you know, basically mm -hmm. not adopt their concerns anymore. And that's been the problem. That's been a rift. I, even when I was a kid, I, I sort of would see the hippies on one side and, you know, the, 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 the iron workers or the auto workers on the other. And, and they seemed that they were both Democrats or ish or lefty ish, but they, their, uh, their agendas were not, uh, they were not in solidarity with each other. That wasn't the word I had when I was eight or nine, but you know, that's what I was kind of groping for at the time. Right. And that's been a problem. Right. What's happening and, in Aurora? What's happening in Aurora? What, what, tell me on a local level, what do we have? Uh, what, what, what we have still is my zip code, which I told you about, and uh, still the lowest vaccination rate, uh, the entire northern part of uh, Illinois. 
by far. It's, a, it's one of the poorest zip codes in the, in the suburbs. It's heavily Hispanic, like over 65%. It's heavily Democratic. But uh, so I've been calling up the mayor's office and, uh, and saying, hey, what are you guys doing about this? You were bragging about how you were getting Aurora vaccinated. Wasn't really him in the last election. It was, you know, the county. So I get the, what I get back from the mayor's office is, uh, that's really a county concern. And I'm going, excuse me. Uh, yeah, I can call the county, but wouldn't it be better if like the mayor of the second largest city in the state of Illinois calls the county right. instead of just some random person living on Lincoln Avenue. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's frustrating, but I'm making a noise. In fact, uh, we've got a, a young, it turns out to be a good gal. She wouldn't call herself progressive, but she is extremely responsive and she's uh, our state legislator uh, representative. And I've talked to her about it and she, she was a little unaware of that. She looked at, into it and she said, oh my God, that's low. Why are we so low? I said, yeah, exactly. Why are we so low? <laughs> so, so that's what I'm kind of pushing a little bit. Um, oh, by the way, happy Indigenous Day, Indigenous Peoples Day. Yes. <laughs> did you How did I know what, that? Uh, a Congresswoman Velasquez called Christopher Columbus a genocidal maniac. I think I used those words back in high school when I was reading about it. I mean, I was like, what the hell? Why are we, you know, anyway. Um, but I, I saw that, um, I was alerted to that, which is why we don't, we didn't have our board meeting tonight. Because, uh, Columbus, I think they still call it Columbus Day um, around here for reasons I wouldn't know. Um, to but, celebrate uh, Columbus, Ohio. That, I, I would be okay with Columbus Day just celebrating the people mm -hmm. from Columbus, Ohio. But I read this morning when I was going through my, um, after I um, drove a friend of, uh, of mine to a doctor's, um, I was uh, back here and up on my Yahoo account was um, an article, uh, Associated Press, yeah, like, uh, and with pictures showing many indigenous people who are protesting in front of the White House being arrested by Capitol Police doing their job <laughs> for protesting the pipelines and protesting inaction on climate change. So happy indigenous day from the White House. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've got the, uh, the, the, the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline is a go. We've got the Line 3 is a go. They are persisting and making these huge investments in like our 100 year investments in the world's dirtiest fossil fuel outside of non-scrubbed coal. So I don't really know how you penetrate through administration unless you don't really have somebody, there's really no there there at the top. They're just riding along this behemoth of a bunch of bundled interests. And you know they're doing their performative thing. Of course, the, the Republicans aren't gonna call it Indigenous Day. They're gonna call it Columbus Day. And the Democrats are gonna call it Indigenous Peoples Day. And I think that'll be about the extent of it. Right. Did you see the piece in The Guardian about Enbridge? Uh, they're laying line three. It's a Canadian company, Enbridge. Mm -hmm. And they've paid United States police officers $2.4 million for arresting and surveilling oh. hundreds of demonstrators. This was in The Guardian last week. Oh, I haven't read it, but I'm not surprised because they were doing this kind of stuff. They had the National Guard like on active duty like years ago during during the Obama administration. So I'm not surprised that they would, you know, buy <clears throat> they, they would buy it's, it's essentially they're they're uh, hiring them as private security. Right. Yeah. Well, if you're arresting people, that's not private security. Well, if you're not prosecuting somebody, that's not private either. But somehow Steve Donziger was just prosecuted by private uh, group of attorneys. I'm still trying to figure out how that one worked. Uh, for people who don't know, Steve Donziger was the lawyer who represented uh, 
the uh, indigenous Ecuadorans uh, against Chevron and won, like almost 10 years ago, a $9.5 billion settlement. It was Texaco at the time, wasn't it? Well, well, it was Texaco first, but then Chevron. Oh, Texaco. And I think Tex Texaco, I can't remember what they did, but they settled early. But Chevron really took it to court and they lost in the Ecuadorian courts. And of course, ever since then, Chevron's been going to war against this guy. And they came, they flew up some judge, spent like $2 million getting a judge to come up here to make some bogus testimony about how Don Ziger bribed him, which was just preposterous on the face of it and with zero evidence apart from what this guy had said. And so uh, it, it's just astounding. He, he was uh, just convicted of contempt of court, Don Ziger was. And uh, he had been in under house arrest, by the way, for over three years. Nobody had been under house arrest for this long on what's essentially a misdemeanor. But, you know, uh, big money talks and Chevron has an infinitely deep pocket for its defense, for, for its legal team. So he'll be doing six months, Don Ziger will. House and, arrest. Huh? House uh, arrest. No, he's going to prison. He's been under house arrest for like over 700 days. He's now going to prison for six months. And, uh, you know, how does this happen? You know, how, how is this happening? But there's a lot of things that I've scratched my head over. Who is this guy in, in Alabama? Siegelman was effectively yeah. was effectively convicted for bribery or something. It was also he somebody he knew he gave a, uh, a, a, a position to that was a non-paid advisory position in his government. And somehow uh, Karl Rove and his allies down there managed to construct a case a corruption case against him for her, for which he went to prison. Right. And I have never understood that either. It's just. I think it had both Don Ziger, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, Don Ziger and Seligman, Siegelman. 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 We're on the Ralph Nader radio hour. I think Carl Rove, it had something to do with, I'm not going to, I'm going to make a fool out of myself. Uh, not that a, that's ever stopped me before. Professor Mary Ann Cummings is a physicist. She's a parks commissioner for Aurora, Illinois, a great artist. And uh, we're honored that you're here. Thank you. Oh, I love, I, I love being on the show. I love this community here, too. It's amazing. Yeah. And I'm really enjoying office hours. I'm just kicking back now and listening. And we, we have to speak to Walter anyway. Uh, oh, well, that you. Walter's Walter's documentary he showed that's still staying with me. Yeah, and we, 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 we should have Diane on the show. You see something <clears throat> like that, and you think you know how bad it is. You even think you have an idea when they dig up the bodies how bad it is. You don't really know how bad it is until you hear it from the people who were victims themselves. Yeah, and today is uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, and yes. We, we should, I should have booked Walter and I didn't. Uh, I'll blame Hannah. Uh, <laughs> when in doubt. I'm looking forward to your segment, segment with Peter. Thank you, Mer Professor Mary Ann Cummings. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We're posting little two minute highlights when we can. We have a Zoom room, a virtual studio audience. And if you would like to join our virtual studio audience, go to my website and hit attend a live taping. And while you're at it, please sign up for my newsletter. When we come back, we will be joined by Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer, Peter B. Collins. It's time right now. For the David Feldman Show He's talking politics And comedy too He'll tell a dirty joke If you want him to He's just a lefty From way back He's a union man With an Emmy for writing Someday he's mad And he feels like fighting Thank you.
It's time right now for the David Feldman Show So get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way Welcome back. Let's go to Marin County, where Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer Peter B. Collins is standing by. Hello there, Peter B. Collins. Great to be with you, David. Uh, oh, sometime to- I'd like to ask you to go to that unabridged dictionary that's in the background behind you and just pick a word and make it the secret word of the day. That's not a bad idea. I'm frozen. <laughs> I, I'm actually frozen. You, you okay. are and I'm not. I wonder if that's my fault. No, I pushed the limits of the program, so hang on for one second. While There's you do that, I'm just going to compliment you on that new bumper. That's really cool. Well, that accomplished. Thank you. There we go. You can see me, right? Yes, and your, your lips are moving. Yes, uh, <laughs> but somebody else is speaking. <laughs> That's a deep fake. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning Premiere Pro just because it keeps me from doing anything truly productive. It has no value other than I, I, I'm just messing around with software that keeps me out of trouble. Peter B. Collins, it's good to see you. Um, David, David, without jumping the agenda, may I just return to your last uh, sequence with Professor Cummings? Yes, Be- please. Because on my podcast before I retired last year, I did extensive coverage of the Don Siegelman case in Alabama. Yes. yes. And just, just to thumbnail it for your listeners, uh, he was railroaded into federal prison. It's correct that Carl Rove orchestrated it. And uh, the swamp in Alabama is just incredible. And Siegelman was the last statewide Democrat elected, except for Doug Jones, who got a couple of years in the Senate because he ran against a child molester who, right. thumped, who thumped the Bible at the same time. Right. Uh, but uh, just to, to, again, summarize it briefly, uh, Richard Scrooge was the co-defendant of Siegelman. He was a wealthy head of uh, a, a medical company, an HMO, uh, called Health South. And uh, Siegelman reappointed him to an unpaid position on an, a state advisory board about health care. And separately, Scrooge's company made a contribution, not even to a Siegelman campaign account, but to a fund that was to pass a state lottery to fund education like so many states have done. Right. This, was, this was opposed by Rove and by um, the, uh, uh, who was the lobbyist in Washington? Abramoff. Yes, Jack Abramoff. And Abramoff rallied the Indian tribes uh, in neighboring states saying this Alabama lob- lottery is going to cannibalize. Did he include can- Grover Norquist and Ralph Reed? Indeed. Yes, yes. So it was part of that whole cabal. Hmm. And I, I got to know Don Siegelman. I met him, actually. He, he went to the Obama coronation in Denver in 2008, which is the only time I've ever met him in person. And Obama never lifted a finger to commute his sentence or even to pardon him after he completed it. And Doug Jones, who I mentioned a minute ago, was actually one of the legal people who took money from Siegelman and then screwed him, uh, which ingratiated him with the Republican establishment, 
which held its nose and supported him against Roy Moore uh, during the Senate race to finish out the term of Jefferson Beauregard Sessions. So that's your quick sketch <laughs> of the- And you, you know, you remind me of David Dayen from American Post. Yeah. yeah, you and he are so great at taking the difficult stories and distilling them down to their essence. You, it's like you have a nose for the hardest stories to not only remember, but to decipher. Am I wrong? Was it was uh, Siegelman also somehow was it part of Rove's attempt to politicize the the Justice Department? Uh, not directly. Uh, you mean when all those U.S. attorneys were fired in yeah. the middle in the yeah. middle of the term? No, right. I don't. I don't believe there's any direct connection there. Right, and the just so we're talking about two thousand three, two thousand and four. Rove was politicizing the Justice Department because of voter fraud, right? He wanted them to prosecute voter fraud, even though it was non-existent. Was that basically what? Not, not so much, uh, David. Uh, I, I think it was down the list. It was certainly one of the things that they would bring up. Um, but, but to your point about the U.S. attorneys, before that mass firing, uh, Rove had installed uh, a woman named Laura, not Laura, L-E-U-R-A was her name, Laura Canary, as the U.S. attorney, who said she had recused herself from the Siegelman case, but she didn't really. And she was the wife of a guy named Bill Canary, who was Carl Rove's political business partner for election campaigns in Alabama. So this is just another angle on how sordid uh, the whole thing was. And uh, Siegelman couldn't get any traction in the courts. Uh, he got several appeals up to the, the, the Fourth Circuit, I guess it is, in Atlanta, and they would shoot him down. I think he got one before the Supreme Court, but uh, you know he never got any justice. And he ended up, uh, his term was kind of split because uh, he got out on appeal for a while. Uh, but he did almost six years, and it was just disgusting. So right. I, if people want to go to peterbcollins.com, just put Siegelman in the search window, and many podcasts will come up. And I also recommend the one that I did with Richard Scrushy. He didn't give many interviews, but uh, when he told the story of how he barely even knew Siegelman uh, until they became co-defendants, and uh, it's just an incredible, incredible saga. Uh, but when you're ready, uh, yeah, I, I want to would... talk to you about who attacked us on 9-11, Gitmo, and the trial of the supposed masterminds of 9-11. So Afghanistan didn't attack us on 9-11. Correct. Abu Zubaydah. Who is Abu Zubeda? Abu Zubeda is a Palestinian national, a citizen of Saudi Arabia. He was a member of the Mujahideen who fought against the Soviets in the 1980s. And that was, was of course, funded by the CIA. And that's where Osama bin Laden entered the picture. But um, he was one of the first people picked up, February of 2002. Where was he picked up? Um, I believe in Pakistan. Because not Afghanistan. I, I'm pretty sure it was in Pakistan. Really? Because John Kiriakou, uh, who I will refer to again later because he co-authored a book about Abu Zubaydah. Kiriakou was the counterterrorism chief for the CIA in Pakistan. And he refused to participate in the torture program and Abu Zubaydah was a uh, torture victim number one. They believed wrongly that he was an Al Qaeda official who had advanced knowledge of 9-11, who was close to uh, Osama, and none of that was true. And despite being waterboarded 83 times, uh, we don't know exactly where because he, he was held in Thailand at a black site. 
He was held in Poland at a black site, and that is the uh, locus of the Supreme Court oral arguments that I'll get to in a moment that were held just a week ago. And so Kiriakou uh, refused to torture Abu Zubaydah, and you know they brought in other people, including these uh, consultants who, who fleeced the CIA for $83 million to devise torture programs. And those guys are named Jessen and Mitchell. Are they psychologists, psychiatrists? They claim to be psychologists, yes. Hmm. Uh, and, and so uh, Kiriakou exits. Uh, they uh, keep trying to extract a confession from Abu Zubaydah. And uh, at one point, even these profiteers of torture, Mitchell and Jessen, cabled back to Washington. And it's believed that the exchange was with this guy, Diaz, who later, uh, he's a CIA top official who later destroyed the videotapes of torture. And uh, they said, look, uh, we've tortured this guy for two weeks. We've almost killed him. And uh, number one, we want cover in case he does die. Number two, we want you to agree that we'll cremate him uh, if we manage to kill him during a torture session. But uh, we don't think that he's lying. And the response from Langley was, you pussies, that's an actual quote, uh, torture him some more. And so they gave him another two weeks of brutal treatment. We don't know if this is when they poked out his eye, uh, but you know, he carries that injury for life. Wow. And so Abu Zubaydah is now down uh, 19 and a half years. It'll be 20 in, in February. And he has never been charged or tried. There has been a habeas corpus petition filed on his behalf uh, since 2014. So this is an episode that Obama could have dealt with. He did not. And so uh, the case before the court nominally is about state secrets. And this is an obscene uh, game that is played because they want to maintain that the torture site in Poland is still a secret. Okay, but it's open knowledge. Now, the exact location and what went on in the torture chambers there is what the lawyers for Abu Zubaydah have been trying to get at. And in the proceedings, the oral arguments before the court, some remarkable things happened because the justices freely used the word torture. And the New York Times, which has been really uh, pussyish, if I can continue to use that word, about and squeamish about actually calling it torture, they used enhanced interrogation up until a couple of years ago. Uh, they report that virtually all of the justices referred to the torture of Abu Zubaydah. Now, the best coverage of this, and I'm going to put up a link in the chat here, uh, is available from a dedicated journalist in, in London. His name is Andy Worthington. He and Carol Rosenberg, who came out of the Miami Herald, is now writing for the New York Times. They have provided the most dedicated coverage of Guantanamo. And I want to mention Jason Leopold, who was at Vice. He's now at um, uh, BuzzFeed. He has followed the Abu Zubaydah case uh, and, and did great coverage of that when he was at Vice. And I have interviews with uh, Andy and with Leopold that are available at my website. So Worthington published a great piece, uh, a wrap up of the oral arguments. He read the transcripts. And it, what, what really becomes clear is that number one, Joe Biden, who to his credit, shut down the war in Afghanistan, has said he wants to shut down Guantanamo, but in the pleadings before the court, his solicitor general, acting solicitor general, maintains the posture of the Trump administration, which maintained the posture of the Obama administration. And that is that the so-called forever prisoners, and the postage stamps are not named for them, mm -hmm. uh, they cannot mm -hmm. be charged or tried 
because they were all tortured and this would expose the uh, methods and uh, what's that other word? <laughs> Means and methods or whatever it is of the CIA when it came to torture. And Obama helped bury that. Uh, one of the few accomplishments of my very senior senator, Diane Feinstein, is that she, when she chaired the Intelligence Committee and, and had all of her faculties, uh, she pushed through uh, a detailed review, 6,500 pages, of the torture uh, program that the CIA ran during the Bush administration. And then Obama got together with the Republican leaders and with uh, Leon Panetta, who had been CIA director and was then Pentagon boss. And they all said, this cannot be published. It cannot see the light of day. So the, th this again, the suppression of things that were pretending are secret uh, for the purpose of uh, really torturing the law in an obscene manner. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring up a fundamental issue that was cited by several of the justices, including Brett Kavanaugh, who put down his beer as he was zooming in to the session because he's on COVID quarantine and said, uh, isn't the Afghanistan war over? And isn't the pretext for keeping Guantanamo open that it's related to the hostilities in Afghanistan? Now, you opened this by correctly reminding people, David, that Afghanistan didn't attack us, and this is all an ugly charade. But it appears that Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, two of the Trump appointees who were really bad on abortion rights and, and bad on a lot of other things, they seem to be ready to do what Congress can't do because of the partisan divide and because Democrats don't really want to be blamed for closing Guantanamo. And they seem to be saying, well, wait a minute. This guy you're saying is subject to state secrets, so we can't disclose what happened to him in Poland, even though everybody knows he was there and he was tortured there. And Gorsuch used the term, it's, it's described by the, uh, the gray lady and Adam Liptak, who's is a pretty good Supreme Court reporter. Yes. Uh, that uh, Gorsuch said uh, that uh, he, he seemed exasperated, says Liptak, by the government's position. Quote, this case has been litigated for years and all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And you haven't considered whether that's an off-ramp that the government could provide that would obviate the need for any of this. He's referring to this phony claim of secrecy. And then Brett Kavanaugh, is the United States still engaged in hostilities for purposes of the blank check, the AUMF, Authorization for Use of Military Force against Al-Qaeda and related terrorist organizations? And so... Other justices, including Breyer and uh, Kagan, and of course, uh, um, uh, what's her name from New York? Um, Sotomayor. Thank you, Thank Sotomayor. You. Sotomayor. Uh, they all uh, appear ready to uh, hear testimony from Abu Zubaydah because the CIA will not permit the actual torturers, Mitchell and Jessen, to testify. And this is part of a devil's bargain, as I mentioned, that was struck when they were first torturing Abu Zubaydah. And they said, we want protection. And the, the CIA essentially said, and this is quoting from um, Andy Worthington, that uh, uh, they, they would guarantee that he would never be able to speak. He would be held incommunicado for the rest of his life. Now, <clears throat> this is as the United States lectures other countries about rules-based order and how we are the beacon of liberty. And Biden has some work to do here. It's, it's not too late, but having his lawyers up before the Supreme Court arguing the same tired bullshit that was pushed by Trump lawyers and Obama lawyers does not suggest 
that he is planning to even allow the courts to do what he has said he wants to happen, which is to shut down Guantanamo, essentially based on a lack of a legal basis to keep it open. Interesting. I always thought the reason they were keeping Abu Zubaydah uh, there and other permanent prisoners is we created terrorists. They, they were tortured and you let them go. They're just, how can you not expect them to attack the United States? But there are other reasons. They're trying to keep the CIA's trade secrets, the secret sauce from entering the public records. But the, the movie Zero Dark Thirty uh, you know, exploited the cooperation of Leon Panetta, who was played in the movie by James Gandolfini while he was still alive. Uh, and the agency cooperated. That's what pissed Feinstein off. She and Panetta never really have gotten along. And uh, so Feinstein said, well, look, <laughs> uh, I, I want to write the book here on what really happened. And her fundamental premise was that torture did not work the way Cheney and Rumsfeld uh, advertised it, that they never got actionable information. They didn't get the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden from torturing anybody. And Z the, the government still maintains that Zubeda uh, was part of Al Qaeda. And the only basis for that could be testimony that was extracted from other people via torture. Right. And we've so, learned that a lot of the men held at Gitmo are there because of somebody settling an ancient grudge on the, on the field. Like they, people turned other people in, not because they were terrorists, but because they insulted my mother. There are 39 prisoners remaining uh, in Cuba. Uh, 17 are described as the forever prisoners. Do you recall the bizarre event when Obama went and delivered a speech uh, at the, uh, it's the crypt where they keep the constitution in Washington? No. <laughs> and here the guy who had taught constitutional law uh, gave this, this bizarre uh, policy that uh, you know he could hold people indefinitely without charge or trial. And uh, you do make a point that we've radicalized these individuals, uh, but we, we have to, at some point, uh, uh, really uphold the fundamental standards of American law. It, it was 2004 in the Supreme Court Hamdi versus Rumsfeld case that it was established that the fiction that because they were offshore, that they were out of the reach of the US federal courts was in fact fiction. And despite that, uh, the Supreme Court has ignored, uh, th th there's also one other critical ruling, which was I think 2007, Boumediene versus Rumsfeld. And that established that the prisoners there have habeas corpus rights. So Justice Breyer last week, asked the, uh, the, the defense lawyer, a guy named Klein, David Klein, representing Abu Zubaydah, uh, you know, gosh, do you have a habeas corpus going for Mr. Zubaydah? And he said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's been going, uh, but the, uh, it, it's been pocketed by the, the second highest court in the land, which is the DC appeals court. And so, it has been packed increasingly with pro-government lawyers of both parties who uh, have simply uh, waved away the habeas claims of, you know, it, it is a smaller population, okay? Uh, Obama released a lot of people. Bush released the bulk of the 700 people who were originally uh, part of the population there. Uh, so this is the most sinister and bizarre uh, episode, I believe, in the American legal system. And the media is complicit in this. Uh, the Times and the Washington Post did cover 
the oral arguments. I haven't seen a second of coverage on television. And, you know, in the downstream papers like my San Francisco Chronicle, not a word mentioned of this critical hearing last week. And, and so let me just wrap up the, the narrative. And then I do want to recommend a couple of things to people. Yes. Uh, right. That, that the, the court does appear to be poised uh, by next summer when these oral arguments will be turned into rulings to do something about A, state secrets, and B, about Abu Zubaydah. Uh, it, it'll probably, given the court's history, it'll be very narrow, um, but it's the only hope we have because Biden's hands are tied by congressional acts uh, that you can't bring anybody from Guantanamo on shore, even for emergency health care. Uh, and this leaves him with maybe a wish. And, uh, you know, I'll give Biden credit for that. I think he does want to close Guantanamo. But politically, he, he, he wants to get the Build Back Better thing passed because right. it's As going he... to, uh, I think politically he wants something that will, he, he'll be able to say, look what we did for you, because he knows that he'll be empty handed at the midterms and whoever's running for president in 24. How, bad, are his, how bad, his numbers are pretty bad. Are they Trump level bad? They're getting there. Yeah. So um, let me recommend a couple of things. There is a book about Abu Zubaydah written by John Kiriakou, who I mentioned earlier, a former CIA officer who did uh, 26 months in federal prison because he admitted to an ABC reporter that we had tortured people and that he had declined to participate. And let's recall the alleged crime occurred during the Bush administration and was prosecuted during the Obama administration. Wait, wait, he, so wait, wait a second. Yeah. He did time by admitting that we torture. Yes. Prosecuted by Obama justice, Eric Holder. I'm ashamed that I didn't know this. Okay. So Kiriakou, I know who was the head of the CIA, Sharon Haspel. Who was the previous? Gina Haspel. Gina Haspel. She uh, she was the one who destroyed the torture videos as well, right? No, she personally was involved in managing torture sessions. She was the redhead played by Jessica in Zero Dark Thirty. <laughs> I'm bad on Hollywood. Sorry. Right. I, I thought she destroyed the tapes. No, that was uh, Jose, uh, Jose, I'm blocking on his name. It's either Garcia or Gonzalez, I think. Okay. So um, Kiriakou co-authored a book about Abu Zubaydah that's very accurate with Joe Hickman. And Hickman is a whistleblower who spent a few years as a tower guard at Guantanamo. He originally blew the whistle uh, on the mysterious deaths of three uh, prisoners who were taken out of the main camp to a CIA black site one late one night and came back dead the next morning. Mm -hmm. um, they they were uh, uh, accused by the uh, uh, commandant of the camp at the time of uh, using uh, asymmetrical warfare tactics. <laughs> asymmetrical. While in custody. Uh, so... Wow. Kiriakou and Hickman's book, I think, is, is very valuable. Also, if, if you want a Hollywood movie that is remarkably accurate about the Feinstein torture review, uh, Adam Driver plays the lead investigator, a guy named Dan Jones, came out in 2019. I should have looked up the title, but... Uh, it's on Amazon, I believe. Yeah, you can, you can find it. And I, I screened it uh, two years ago at the Mill Valley Film Festival. Dan Jones was there and I talked to him for a minute, uh, but it is uh, remarkably accurate for a, a Hollywood depiction. And uh, so the, the other pieces, you could go to the Vice archives and look up Jason Leopold's reporting. He also did a video report with uh, Abu Zubaydah's brother who never had any uh, contact with the law 
uh, is proud to be an American and lives in, in Florida or did at the time. So those are uh, a few resources that people can look at if they'd like more information. And I'm sorry, my phone is ringing here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it's like to have the phone ring. <laughs> my phone hasn't rung in decades. Well, we keep a landline here in case a pollster wants to call. <laughs> Peter B. Collins, thank you. Uh, yeah, but these are these are difficult stories. They get buried and they're the most important. The idea that the only people who went to prison for torture are the ones who revealed it to the press. Julian Assange is wanted in America for releasing videos of our soldiers in helicopters killing innocent civilians. The soldiers in the helicopters are not wanted, Julian Assange. And Chelsea yeah. Manning has paid the, the price of two prison terms, one behind a bogus contempt charge trying to pressure her to testify against Assange. I don't do a good enough job paying attention to this stuff. I don't. Well, thank you for sexy. providing me with the opportunity yeah. to bring your listeners up to date, David. It really is important and it doesn't get covered because it blows a Grand Canyon sized hole into the premise of America. You cannot buy the premise of America when you hear about what happens to whistleblowers in this country. So thank you. But Thank you, David. Thank you, Peter B. Collins. Go to peterbcollins.com for a treasure trove of interviews and radio shows on this subject and many more. Thank you so much, Peter. Well, hopefully I'll see you next week. Let's go to Denton. Are you here, Professor Mike Steinel? There yes, you I am. Are. Yes, I am, David. Can you hear I me? Yes, you're wearing a New York Times baseball cap. Yeah, I wear this when I go up to that small town in Kansas just to show everybody I'm an asshole. Yeah, to piss off the anti vaxxers yeah, That's right, man. Yeah. You can see where I stand. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have a music video. Well, I saw some of it. I've been kind of monitoring this show. I've, I'm not I, gonna... did, I, I don't. It doesn't do your song justice, but I'm going to oh, play it. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, Feldman, maybe do it. Is that the yeah. one? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a scary met, uh, scary motif, I would say. Yeah. yeah Here okay. is Feldman made me do it from Professor Mike Steinel. I have to find it. Here we go. I don't see the video yet. There's no video yet, David. Just can you hear me? Can't play it. I maxed out my software program. Unless it's working. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but not no video played. Yeah. How can, can you, you max out your audio, your your video? Uh, yeah, I'm using a software program that after a while I'm, has a little I'm, mice on a treadmill. I, I just use this thing to death and I, it just gets exhausted. I, if I were to restart everything. Now I you're showing a, a, a very old photo of yourself with a mustache. You don't see me. <laughs> no, I see you with a, I see your picture with a mustache. What? What's going on here? I don't know. And I'm pinned. I'm big. I'm big. Now you see me. There right? you go. There you are. There you are. Yeah. Let me just That's... try one more thing here. Maybe we can play it. I sent you a song. I sent yeah. you the f filibuster song. We don't have to play it. We can do whatever we want. Yeah. Do, 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 do. yeah. I got something live to, to do too, if you want to hear yeah. it. How is your live show? It was fantastic. We had a crowd. I think people are so, it was, first of all, proof of vaccination or test. 
And I thought, that's not going to fly in the middle of Kansas. And son of a gun, it was, it wasn't packed, but it was nearly packed. It was a big hall too. It was a beautifully ornate, restored. uh, They have done such an amazing job. Anybody near Emporia, Kansas, just go downtown to the Granada Theater and uh, go to the office next door and say, just take a tour of it. It's, it's, it's so fantastic. Uh, Gold gilt, you know, it has boxes and it has a beautiful balcony and has a ceiling very uh european and it's in the it's about 900 seats i'd say so it's not mm. a small hall and well, uh, we had a nice crowd and they loved it we did three encore no we did yeah we did three encores you know and uh they had a nice reception i i was beat afterwards i'd i'd driven up there and then and then I did the rehearsal all day and then did the show and then I drove halfway back so I got back to Texas yesterday uh, we celebrated my mother-in-law Nadine her 99th birthday we celebrated it today it's it's two days away but the weather was going to be bad right and so we so we did a drive we did one of those drive-bys you know we got I have a tent like one of these like uh event tents it's mm-hmm. 10 by 10 it's really cool keeps her out in the sun out of the sun and people would come up with their cars and they'd get out and they'd bring her cards well, that's great stuff. it was lovely it was very lovely wow it was, it was great and she really seemed to perk up by having uh that little bit of excitement in the day you know the days are kind of all the same it's uh crosswords in the morning I like that. And then the soft, then the soap operas, little lunch. My nap. stories. She's got to watch her, her stories. stories. Are there nap. any stories left? What, what, what's, what, what does she watch? Young and the Restless and Bold and the Beautiful. Those are still on. Okay. Yeah. And then, then it's nap time and then uh, a little reading. And then uh, pretty soon Nora O'Donnell is on at 530 and then Jeopardy and then and then uh, Wheel of Fortune, and then it's shoot 'em ups, NCIS, and you know, she loves she loves the shoot 'em ups. She loves uh, Blue Bloods. I love to say that Blue Bloods. Blue Bloods. Blue Bloods. Yeah. I, but now, you know, who, is, who are we looking at? Is that Charlie Parker? Oh, oh, I'm so excited about this. That is Charlie Parker. And so you're going to go with that? Is, is that the cover of your book? Yes, I found this. You're going with that instead of the one that I made. Well, you didn't make a cover to my book. Don't you remember at office hours? I slapped together. <laughs> oh, I do remember that. Yeah, no, we're, got, we're not seconds. going. Oh, we're not doing that. This is a. How long did that cover take to make? I'm not going to dignify that. You're, Mine only took 30 seconds. <laughs> I know. And it, it looked like the, it looked like it only took 30 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> This is by a, a gentleman named Rudy Brown. And I started, I'm trying to figure out the cover. And I thought, a ah, photo of Charlie Parker, maybe, but there's issues. And then I ran across his website and he's, he, he, he paints in oil and it's all jazz musicians. Uh, and uh, I thought, this is great. It's called Bird in a Bow Tie because mm-hmm. Charlie Parker in a bow tie. And he very, we worked out, he's very has very generously made an agreement to let me use this on the wow. the book and the CD and the audio book. So it'll be on a white background like it's framed. And up the top, it'll say Charlie Parker, colon, a novel. No, I'm sorry, Saving Charlie Parker, colon, a novel. Right. And then underneath it uh, by Mike Steinel. It's real simple. Just go simple. You but are, you're incredibly prolific. Well, I try to be. I try to be. I try to keep busy. Right. But isn't that a great p- painting? Like, I mean, look at this. Yeah. Look at this face. Yeah. You know, it's it's his the the lines in his. I mean, that's probably from a photo. I think I've seen that photo. It's not with a bow tie, but it's not it's not just a copy of a photo. It's it really captures the spirit. You know, Bird played real. Uh, Charlie Parker played almost motionless. Most great musicians don't move around a lot. You know, I know you see pop guys jumping all over, but guys that really are have technical command tend to play like Michael Brecker, the great 
he would just be rock solid and it's only his fingers would move you know um, i maintain the same applies to not all but a lot of great comics economy of words and motion unless you're you know robin or you know you know you have to be big but it's the, the smaller the better like jack benny i mean just yeah. a look yeah and the timing I watched the Norm, Norm. I watched the Norm McDonald um, special. Boy, that's good. That's so funny, you know. And and, and then I started noticing that because some of the sto- some of the things I've seen before, his whole thing of like his speech where he sometimes leaves out a word, or he'll just say a f- sentence fragment, which you would which you would kind of identify at first as someone's kind of error in speaking an mm-hmm. error e-r-r-o-r but it's so studied and and so f- you know like the timing is so great you know he was he was brilliant he was he hey really you're brilliant was. too man you, you uh, i tell you what the norm is i mean I'm, I'm an algorithm with youtube and so he's so prolific and stuff just keeps coming at me and people keep sending me stuff and I'm sending stuff. I just sent something. I can't even begin to describe what the sum. I mean, it's just great. It's just, and it's high and low comedy and. Right. Yeah. Some of it's, you know, like the thing about auto asphyxiation, you know, that's one of your, things with What's the belt, he, belt a lot about thing. auto erotic association yeah he has yeah, a whole yeah. thing about it it's hilarious i mean it's a horrible thing <laughs> 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 you know <laughs> you gotta but watch that last watch the last special okay it's, did it's talk fantastic about, normally did it's, talk about it's on netflix asphyxiation the last yeah, special to heighten to heighten the uh, orgasm yeah. right yeah i mean it's not <laughs> something it's just you know, you hear that people do this. And if you're a comedy writer or a comedian, you kind of uh, want to f- try to understand why somebody <laughs> has to improve on the Mona Lisa. Like why you why an orgasm isn't good enough. Now you have to wrap a belt around your neck and make it even. But what does he say about it? <laughs> Well, I'm not going to spoil it. I mean, you got to you got to watch it. He basically says, you know, like uh, his bit is like uh, I'm not going to do his bit, but he says, you know, you, a lot of people wonder what happens after you die. You know, I'll tell you this: what happens after you die? You're found. <laughs> 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 and he gets into this whole thing about a son who is, you know, like what, what the memory of a son would be. Right. But he has to find his dad that way anyway. Hey, by the way, I. There are things in your show that have made that have been so funny. I thought you and Guillermo, you kidding him or whatever you were doing about meditation. <laughs> it, that was you just kept at it, and he just he just he kind of did yes and like the you know yeah. the but but he sort of did yes and no you know and he just mm-hmm. and then you just kept going. But you know what's weird? I listened I listened to the show while I'm driving. And I can tell you where I was on the highway between here and Kansas when I heard that. I can tell you exactly where I was. Where were you? I was in, I was coming into Norman, Oklahoma. I had just gone over the Arbuckle Mountains. I was coming into Norman, Oklahoma. Um, I know one. The Arbuckle. People don't know about the, if you haven't been to Oklahoma, you got to go to the Arbuckle Mountains. They're beautiful. And And you go through a tunnel that was bored by a Coca-Cola bottle? I don't know what that means, David. <laughs> what are you talking about? Ar- the Arbuckle Mountains. I bet oh, you know, oh the- Fatty Arbuckle. Okay. Was that a far- Fatty Arbuckle reference? That's yeah. even too old for me, and I'm 70. I, did, did Professor <laughs> Ann Lee get that? I hope she did. I'm, I don't do the chat. I don't do the chat. Let me just check Ann, Professor Ann Lee if she got the... You know, I thought about last week I brought... Yeah, she, uh, yeah. Okay, that's all that matters, <laughs> Professor I Ann. thought about wine in a coffee cup. And then tonight I thought about doing coffee in a wine glass, but I just went with the wine in the coffee cup. What kind of wine are you drinking tonight? Uh, this is a very nice uh, 
I, I go for the red blends because they're kind of cheap. This is called bread and butter. Mm. No, no, this is magic box. 11 bucks, you know. I don't, is I don't spend a lot of Is two buck chuck still on, around? Oh, two buck chuck is not bad. You know, two buck. Yeah. Is that still well, around? I don't, I don't frequent Whole Foods. You can only get it at Whole Foods, I think. Oh, okay. Hey, you know, um, but you know, like there, there, I remember, uh, where I was when Judy Gold said something so funny, a, a, like maybe a fall ago. And, uh, I was, I know where I was when I did, and I know where, uh, I know where I was when I uh, heard your, about your son's memoir. <laughs> that was. <laughs> I know exactly. I've written a little song about that if you want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Just for my, for my <laughs> listeners. So my son, we we're on with the Hershenfelds, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, Freudian psychoanalyst. About a year ago, my son calls me. He says, I'm writing an autobiography. And I said, what's it called? And he said, Daddy, don't. <laughs> and I lost it. And then I told my friends, and they lost it. I did, too. I'm, I almost drove off the road. I know where I was. I was That was right before Guillermo. Yeah. I know, yeah I, was, I know where I was on the road when I heard that. And Dr. Philip Hershenfeld <laughs> summed it up perfectly. He said, it's a Rorschach test. Ah. You, you hear what, do you remember Dr. Hershenfeld yeah, said? you hear what you want to hear. You hear what, it could be anything. Daddy, don't. Don't go. <laughs> don't. I know what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear the song, Daddy, don't? Yes, please. Okay. No, what bit. I heard. That was so great. Here's uh, Professor Mike Steinel's new song, Daddy Don't. Can you hear the piano? Yes. Don't <laughs> Daddy don't Please Daddy don't Daddy please don't Daddy don't please Daddy Let's try it again. Daddy, don't. Daddy, don't. Please, Daddy, don't. Daddy, please don't. Daddy, don't. Please. That's it. Is <laughs> the ultimate Rorschach test. That yeah, is. just three words. I just put uh -huh. please in there, you know, a little bit of please. <laughs> it's one of those. It, it's just great. It just... It's just great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're yeah. welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You, you're, this is this is what I now he's going to hear this and it's, <laughs> it's going to make him more incorrigible. He is one of the funniest people 
I've ever met. I would love to meet him. I think yeah. I'd like to meet your. Yeah. I sort of met Hannah on the. Yeah. You know. You know. On Friday nights. You know. Lovely children. It, my like I said are, last week, I think you were a great father. You are a great father because they oh. stick around you and they seem to. Your son calls you a lot, right? He calls me. <laughs> calls me a lot of different things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, my son is interesting because he's, he's a verbal clown. Like the, the jokes are never at anybody's expense. They're always at his expense. And it, it's bizarre. And uh, it's. it's I can talk to him for an hour nonstop and he'll just make jokes nonstop, nonstop. Wow. Just like I'll have a, a conversation with him and everything is a setup. Uh, and he doesn't want to do comedy. Well, would, he's doing it all day long. Yeah. Maybe, you know, with his friends and with you. Yeah. He's a great I have a kid. question. I have a question. Yeah. Every now and then you say, and then I have my day job. David, are you selling your body on Times Square again? <laughs> <laughs> Is that your day job? <laughs> what were some of my day jobs? I told you. What, what did... I pumped gas in Sausalito. Right. I sold a fat man a burrito. <laughs> I don't remember the rest. We should bring that song back. I was a referee at a cock, cock fight. I was a referee at a cock fight. Yes. I had a fling with Walter Cronkite. <laughs> I was proud of that rhyme. I had a fling uh -huh. with Walter Cronkite. I have some music. I can't play the videos, but I do have the filibuster blues. Yeah, you want to play that, and then we yeah, can, we'll uh, talk for let's talk for a few more minutes. Okay. And, uh, so when do you go back up to Kansas? Not for a while. Not for a while because we got stuff to do here, and uh, you know, it's everything we did all the family stuff and got the house in shape. It's a very comfortable house now. I will have to go up and. Uh, turn uh prepare it for winter you know right. shut the water off and i'm in an apartment i'm in an apartment in manhattan yeah i do zillow the zillow porn and i have these fantasies <laughs> of somehow you know but living in a house is a full-time job isn't it well our house here is very new, you know, it's 12 years old or whatever. So there's not much that goes wrong with it, but it's all, if you, you know, got some, when I you mean, get up in the morning, here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to get up in the morning and see something, then have to make a call, then have somebody come out to fix it and make small talk. And then it's one in the afternoon. And yeah. waiting all day for somebody to fix yeah. a hose. How often yeah. do you do that? I'd lose that my I could hear myself saying, I just wasted six hours of my life because of a effing hose. Well, see, anything you would probably buy in Manhattan would be maybe 100 years old, wouldn't it? Well, I'm not going to buy it. Nobody buys in Manhattan. Nobody you're... buys in Manhattan except oligarchs. Yeah. Oh, oh, ooh, ooh. Varsity Blues. Did you see that little thing about the people? Look, the New York Times and Sunday did a little thing about all the different defendants that have the hedge gone. Fund guy. Yeah. yeah. Here's the thing that's weird about that. Almost all of them got their kids into first a bribe. But then but some sports and then sports. Isn't that weird? Is that what you know? Because that's the thing I know. Yeah. I is they got the kid into Harvard on sports, USC on sports. And some of them and that, like couldn't even uh, one girl hadn't even made her high school tennis team and they right. got her in. The only thing I can think of is that and the rowers, of course, Lindy Lof, uh, what, what are uh, Lofton, Lofton, yeah. when her, her kids, her two girls were. On the rowing team, and they never rowed, right? But so there must be somebody in those schools. Here's the thing: somebody in those schools is putting that idea in their head, right? You know what I mean? Some, 
those got those people went to jail, but it, there had to be somebody knowing what's going on, and uh, in in those universities. Minutes? Did you see sixty minutes last night? They no, I didn't. Professor Adnan Hussein's alma mater on sixty minutes. I, what were we doing last night? I I missed it. What was last night? Sunday. Last night was. Well, I was I was I, you know I I drove back from that concert and I was so. Sh I was wrecked. I was just having some shit face on it. <laughs> no, I was just tired, and I went to bed at eight. And I, th I don't think I watched sixty minutes. But oh, Deep Springs, Professor Adnan Hussein. I think it goes without saying that. Oh, the the place where they 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 grow their own food and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Watch uh, sixty minutes. Their profile on Deep Springs, it, it's uh, where Professor Adnan Hussein went to college. I didn't know that's that. all I'll say. There's a you know, he's brilliant, but you can tell that that's he carries that school inside of him. Yeah, I mean, this this uh, varsity blues thing. Who would do that to a child who would they had this hedge fund manager who refused to plead guilty? But right. Lori Laughlin, low hanging fruit. Uh, here's the thing. She made her daughter pose like she was rowing so it could be photoshopped. Oh, she, man. That speaks volumes to your complete lack of character that you would. It's one thing to lie. I mean, it's. It's bad to lie, but to make your daughter a liar. Be part of that. Oh, that's horrible. That's yeah. child abuse. That really is. It's almost worse than hitting a kid. It's saying it's okay to mislead and lie and to get something you don't deserve. The message is so corrupt. I have no sympathy for Mosimo, the husband, and Lori Laughlin to because they, they involve their daughter. And then the hedge fund manager who got his kid into Harvard or USC, there are two trials going on where they were just found guilty. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? No. Uh, first of all, it's bad enough that you think you should go to Harvard. That in and of, in and of itself mm -hmm. is a character defect. But then to go to Harvard and have your self-esteem built off this f false mammon, false god, and then to discover your father paid him. I think he paid a million dollars to get his kid into Harvard. I know. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. You should, have I your, want to you should have your kids taken away from you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's it's horrible. Uh, but I, I'm thinking that there's got to be somebody on the inside suggesting here's what we do. Mm -hmm. Listen, rowing. No one's going to if you put your right. kid in in uh, like gymnastics, we got a really high level gymnastics thing. Right. They're going to notice that, that they're not that they suck. But you put them in rowing, you know, you give them the, you know, we'll put them on the rowing team. They'll be third, you know, whatever. Bum, bum, bum. Right. And. <clears throat> Nobody will notice. And we'll t we, we know the rowing coach. He, he needs the money, you know, like. Right. I once had a. We, you know, we, used, just, we had a thing at North Texas that was weird. Here was the weird thing. Um, we had very low in-state tuition, but rather high out-of-state tuition. And we had this thing. If you got a scholarship of $1,000, at least all, the minimum thing was $1,000. You got in-state tuition. So we, and we parlayed that. We would recruit kids. Look, you're going to get, we can give you a thousand dollar scholarships, not much, but you'll get in-state tuition. In-state tuition was like 5,000 a year at that time, as opposed to 18,000 a year if you got out of state. And I once had a parent go, hey, uh, could I just give you guys like a thousand dollars you know, for this scholarship, and then you give it back to my kid, and then he gets the in-state. And I said, no, we cannot do that. <laughs> but, I, you know, it's, it's, simil it's a similar thing. It's 
like playing the system, but uh, yeah, Edu that's... students are not consumers. Education should be free everywhere at Harvard. What they should do is these universities with you know forty billion dollar endowments should be cracked wide open. There should be Harvard should be in all fifty states. Yeah, I heard you say that to Gil. Gil yeah, Gil Princeton should be in yeah. all fifty states. Columbia, any college that has that big an endowment should be broken up and spread out throughout uh, the country. West, well, Virginia, yeah. Would, yeah. West Virginia would be a blue state if. But anyway, go ahead. I'm hey, sorry. Did you did you read? Uh... Ezra Klein this week in the which, uh, which story big, uh, you mean Joe Klein no, we no, fought over this? no this week it's Ezra Klein okay and uh, big thing can Democrats find a winning message big two-page spread the one thing I read every Sunday is the Sunday review because it has the editorials but right. he gets into this guy um, David Shores cool. Oh, about the hyper-educated white kids who, who are knocking on doors, trying well, to get... He, one of the things... He, that, he that's was what you're talking about, right? No, there was a bunch of different things. He, first of all, he, he says, says that... Is the 30-some, 30 30-year-old 30 Democrat who warned that one of the reasons Democrats don't win is they have hyper-educated white kids doing retail politics and you don't right. you don't right. get people of color or to, to vote because a, a hyper educated white kid knocked on your door well that's that's one of his things there's a lot of different things and ezra klein does a pretty good job of like disputing some things but there's some so he, this guy is a a polling guy and was he was on obama's team and got Obama elected twice. You got to say that, you know. But he says, like, here's the reality of the Senate. If Democrats only get 40 percent. First, we said everything is skewed since the Senate is like a gerrymandered in a way because the, the small states have the same power. You know, Democrats routinely get a majority of the, sem the Senate votes things. But. Um, they have to get so much more to have any sort of traction. He said, even at the very best, scenario number three, if the Democrats get 53% of the vote and Republicans get 47, in 2022, Democrats gain one seat. And in, Dem in 2024, Democrats lose three seats. They lose three seats because the way the way the states line up. So it's really stacked against, and he, one of the things he says is you got to give uh, Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico statehood, you know, we got to get those states in there. But yeah. here, here's what he said. He said, everybody thinks it's a class thing, you know, that you have, it's up, you know, like, um, that it's a class structure that divides right and left. And what he he's found from his polling is that it, it isn't class as much as education. Because you can have a very upper class, very wealthy person who didn't go to college or dropped out of college and started a, f a company and did great, and they will swing right. Whereas the guy, the adjunct professor making slave wages is going to vote left. So he's, he said it really, it, it's, it's education, you know, more than, more than class. And you can, I, I thought that was interesting. It's a very long article, but you ought to check it out. But those uh he says even if we get 50 50 in the next election we will lose two seats in the senate in 2022 and we'll lose eight seats in 2024 because of the way the states that are rolling over into 2024 what they're going to be you know <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty dire but he he says that the the problem is uh you know you got career um, consultants and everything that just don't won't realize 
that we have the wrong message, you know, that uh, it's, we have to find the things that don't, that, that really, really sell the, the, you know, progressive, the progressive agenda. And he, he, he had an interesting thing. He said they did, they did um, research work with, during the, the um, Kerry and, uh, and what was it? Bush. Carrie Bush. Carrie Bush. Yeah. And uh, they, 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 Carrie they, they, Bush. Watch your language. <laughs> um, they, you know, they had a, a focus group, women, and they talked about immigration. And the more they talked, and, and the, the people, the Democrats laid out their whole thing about immigration, the more they talked about it, the more the people swung to the right. It was, and then if, and he pointed out that, that uh, in the 2012 election, you notice um, Obama never talked about immigration, and Clinton, I think he brought he, Clinton took the bait and tried to like give the 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 positive narrative about the immigration thing, and he says there are certain discussions Democrats should stay away from, you know, because it it hyper polarizes what's you know. It's a very, it was a very depressing article, but um, Ezra Klein, I think, is pretty solid in his analysis. Yeah. Would you, would you agree? Yeah, I, I yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I have some pretty strong opinions about this stuff. Uh, not necessarily correct, but I, I think the Democrats could win by a landslide if they made our lives better. The Republicans make our lives worse. Democrats are supposed to make our lives better. They're supposed to provide us with be, fight for labor rights, raising the minimum wage, expanding Medicare, hearing aids, dental, eye care, free college tuition, universal preschool, elevating the dreamers, making them citizens, taking on Wall Street, getting rid of student debt, arresting corporate hucksters who rip off ordinary Americans, protecting the LGBTQ community, protecting African Americans from the police. That's what the Democrats should stand for, and they would win by a landslide if they would deliver to everybody in this coalition. And they don't. They just cater to Wall Street. And they say, we want to help you, but how do we pay for all this stuff? And the money is out there. It's easy to pay for this stuff. You tax corporations. You tax the richest one percent. You collect the one trillion dollars a year that the IRS leaves on the table because they are understaffed. The money is there. The Democrats are run by Wall Street bagmen like Chuck Schumer, Wall Street bagman, Nancy Pelosi, San Francisco bag man. Paul Pelosi is worth $200 million. Joe Biden is from Delaware. The only reason Delaware exists is so corporations and oligarchs and mobsters don't have to pay taxes. Schumer, Pelosi and Biden answer to the people who don't want to pay taxes. So they make these promises, but they say, but it's pay go. We have to figure out a way to pay for it. And you, you can't tax my benefactors. So we get pretty much nothing. And now they're complaining that the Biden administration isn't getting credit for the three hundred dollar child, three hundred dollar a month child tax credit. I see people on CNN and MSNBC saying Biden should be getting credit for this three hundred dollar 
a month tax credit for children, which isn't permanent, by the way. No. no. And they say he's lifted so many people out of poverty with that tax credit. If you honestly believe that what differentiates a poor child from a not a poor child is three hundred dollars a month, you need to get out of you need to you need to get out of my country. We gave kids three hundred dollars a month temporarily. Why aren't we getting any credit for this? They you know, delivered. They think that's they think that's Medicare and Social Security. You know, the one Hunter the, Biden story. Yeah. One of the things I took away from the Ezra Klein thing was I'm sure Dem- a lot of Democrats are going, whoa, we're going to be in four years. We're going to be the minority in the Senate. There's we've got to keep the filibuster. That's the only way they can have any control, you know, or get rid of the filibuster. Improve people's lives. Yeah. Then get a filibuster proof Senate and bring back the filibuster. I guess I could do that. Yeah. I mean, you could, the Democrats. I don't think I don't think we're going to get I don't think it's going to be. If you read, you should read this article. It's like we're screwed if for the next 20 years. You know, the left is screwed. The progressives are screwed because of the Senate, the, the way that um, it's, it's basically constitutionally gerrymandered to, you know, to lean toward the small states, give them just as much power. Them. I know you, you've talked about you're in favor of, this, of the uh, filibuster. No, no, no. I say get rid of it. Well, you were. In, well, 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 I was. I'm in favor of the electoral college. The electoral college, which is similar but, in a way. Yeah, and I know people get really angry that I say that. The problem isn't the electoral college. The problem is the Democratic Party. These hyper-educated fools who can't figure out how to win a ground game in swing states. It's sickening, and so they go change the rules. We can't. We can't figure this out. We don't want to spend time in West Virginia. Change the rules. No, you you move people to West Virginia and spend time with real people, not Princeton graduates. But the Democrats don't want to do that. Democrats are run by elitists. And, And I remember when George W. Bush used to accuse Al Gore of being an elitist. I was much younger at the time. And I used to say, how can why would they call the Democrats elitists? George Bush is the rich one. Well, you say it breaks down along education more than anything else. And hyper educated people are elitists. They think they're better than other people. They think they think there are people who deserve to be served and people who deserve to be servants. You know, Barack Obama. Is really smart. He thinks he deserves to be served that he should have servants. That's a problem if you're the leader of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Well, it's there's a problem. Yeah. It's 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 an interesting article. I think everybody ought to read it. And, uh, you know, it raises some interesting points. But I think we're in, in for a, a rough time. But I got an out. I, I got a CD coming out and a book. Who cares? What do you mean, what do you mean in for a rough time? I mean, in. that's gonna. I mean, right now we're in pretty good. We're, we're in. They could really do some stuff now, you know. But they're just not. And and it's leadership. And well, all these consultants and whatever, you know. I don't really. You know, I'm just. I'm just a musician who writes novels. I don't really know much about it. But I. But I read. I try to read keep up on it and listen i listen to your show and other shows there are other shows out there i hate to tell you this david but there's a few pod oh i i I thought of uh like doing some awards Mm -hmm. best segment you know i i'm I'm gonna nominate some of your best segments i think uh 
Guillermo on meditation. The, the anti-meditation. You, you just you should you should have like the, the Feldos. Mikeys. The what? The Mikeys. The Mikeys. I'm gonna I'm gonna start that. Yeah. The Mikeys. And and you you come up with the nominees and you just give out the awards and I'll bring them. Uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. we can have a little. We can have some music and they can hold mm -hmm. a statue. Yeah. Uh, okay, Mikeys. I'm working on it. I had an idea. Oh, you can buy stuff. Anyway, I, I in L.A. There was a uh, a company. It was on Pico that just made statues and awards. Yeah. Yeah. And I never had enough money to pull this off, but I just wanted to create my own award because in L.A. they have they have the producers awards, the publicist awards. And I just I think you and, and then you have trophies for teams like my kids. You know, those those, I know, those trophies, trophies. Yeah. Yeah. The participation trophies. It's like at, at some point you have to throw them out. <laughs> the faux marble and they, their names are and you think oh my god i don't want to throw this out and you go they it costs like five anyway let's wrap it up thank you professor mike oh let's play filibuster blues yeah that's in the news filibuster yes, blues in the news filibuster blues in the news new not new music but archive we could find archive. The archive appropriately enough this song is 48 hours what it's a filibuster blues. It should be a 48 hour song. Huh. Here we go. Filibuster blues. some luster but I still got some style I'm not in the Constitution I was birthed by Rule 22 If you want to slow things down I'm just a guy for you I'm getting kind of tired I'm really past my pride I think I should be fired, but Schumer won't get off a dime. Please, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, please. Put me out of my misery. I'm getting down on my knees. You can shoot me in the head. You can drown me in the bathtub. If you think I'm not quite dead, you can hit me with a big club in the chamber of the Senate when nothing's happening at all. Just roll me in a carpet and throw me in the hall.
Now some folks say I'm part of history That I'll always be around Let's do away with the mystery Let's run me out of town I'm ready to go I think I've done my time Just put me out to pasture I'll be just fine Please, Mr. Schumer Mr. Schumer, please Put me out of my misery I'm getting down on my knees That's right Uh Uh-huh It's time for me to go That's all there is There ain't no more to this show Kick me out Roll me in the carpet And throw me in the hall I'm no use anymore To nobody at all That's right It's time You know it Yes it is you're a genius you really are thank you you gotta unmute yourself oh, i muted you am i muted i'm fine that song's a lot like daddy don't i just realized Sam daddy. key daddy don't that could be a classic wasn't there a Wayne Newton song called Daddy Don't You Walk So Fast? Daddy? I don't know. I think it was a Wayne Newton song. There was a voice, Wayne Newton. Whew. Good or good? Yeah, I mean, I mean an amazing voice. Don Cushane, darling. Way up high, you know? Right. Almost like in, a, uh, in a, uh, an alto's range, you know? Clear, beautiful. Then he ruined it by just overplaying Vegas, right? Oh God, he, you can't sing. You can, you cannot sing three shows a night for seven seven days a week for thirty years and not have damage to your voice. You know. You you have Spotify, right? I think I, so. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, 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 there is an album that I play over and over again. It's Count Basie and Frank Sinatra at the same. Oh, Frank Sinatra. That's one of the greatest ones. Yeah. It is. It, like, every, I listen to it every day, and I hear, like, I've got you under my skin with the Count Basie. It's the Nelson Riddle arrangement, but it's Count Basie. Yeah. And uh, every time I hear it, I just hear something new. It, it's, it's not, the older I get, the more I get Sinatra, who I didn't get until I became middle-aged. His phrasing is so subtle and so hip, you know, so, you know, and then that bear, that, he just swings. He's a very swinging singer, you know. He's a jazz singer, even though he doesn't necessarily do scat, he doesn't sing solos, but right. the, way, the way he interprets a song, you know. And, and, I like and, the older Sinatra, the younger when he was a crooner. And, yeah, I just. But uh, yeah, he was great. I had a lot of friends that played on his band, and um, it, he was he was really into music, loved jazz players, and you know, um, very respectful to to j- j- just guys if he heard somebody he, d- he dug he learned who they like a friend of mine played drums on on uh woody herman band ed Sof, you know and they were doing a double bill in vegas might have been during that time so woody herman played and then bassy played with S- sinatra how and much theory do you think sinatra had do you, if they if they said let's sing Let's play this in C or A minor. Well, he just had a great ear. I don't know about that, but I tell you what he did. He did. He was a very school. He studied voice. He took lessons. His diction was perfect. His, you know, 
for singing, it's all about placing the vowels. How you pronounce a word, pronounce a word, uh, determines whether it resonates in your voice. And he, he was a master of it. Without Who was the trombone? Was it Woody Herman? Who was the trombone player? He was, he, play, he used to open for. There was a trombone player who taught him how to breathe. Oh, Tommy Dorsey, Tommy Dorsey. Tommy Dorsey, I'm sorry. Yeah, he was a, he was a singer in the Tommy Dorsey band. Yeah. And Tommy Dorsey, he had that real high, he could play real high on the trombone, you know. Uh, I'm getting sen sediment all over you. I'm getting sentimental over you. There's another one. I'm getting sediment all over you. I'm getting you know, married in the morning. <laughs> is, is Sinatra's version of I'm getting married in the morning? Unbelievable. Let's wrap yeah. it up. Thank okay. you so much. All right. My best to Nadine. Yes, absolutely. Happy birthday. Okay. Thank you. Let's wrap up today's show. Uh, but first, Benji, how are you? Hey, how's it going, David? Good to hear your voice, Florida man. What you up to tonight? No, oh, just talking to some guy from Florida. Steinel, man, is he not cool as a cucumber or what, man? Yep, he's he's unbelievable. Just uh, you can't imagine this show without his music going along with it, man. It just wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be the same. Man. How's life in Florida? Man, I'm just sitting in the la la waiting for my ya ya, man. Just, uh, <laughs> I've been busier than a one legged man in a butt kicking contest uh, or a one armed man with crabs. It's a sliding scale. <laughs> hey, good news, though, man. Uh, contrary to our Florida governor's efforts, the uh, importance of getting vaccinated seems to be sinking in. You know, I just saw yeah. two homeless guys uh, behind a convenience store vaccinating themselves. <laughs> they seem pretty uh, enthusiastic about it, too. You know, it's great to see. <laughs> that's, that's great. Hey, then I was walking on the sidewalk and I found a hat full of money. Yeah. I'm thinking, man, what a lucky day. Then some crazy guy with a guitar starts chasing me. <laughs> now, he wasn't fast enough to catch me, you know. Thankfully, yeah. the crutches slowed him down. <laughs> hey, man, it, as my, uh, my bitter half waits for me, uh, let me ask you, uh, would you consider any of your uh, ex-wives high maintenance? Sure. I mean... I mean, uh, my wife's to say she's uh, she's taking the definition of high maintenance woman to new heights, you know, or lows, depending on how you're measuring. <laughs> but uh, I don't mean the cool kind of high maintenance woman either. Not like the janitor girl I used to smoke pot with. <laughs> she's more like Josh Gabor getting an unwarranted parking ticket, you know, on the day her volume script ran out. I remember that story. She slapped <laughs> a police officer in Beverly Hills. It was crazy. I was going to say that it's worse there. It's worse during certain times of the month, but uh, but menstrual jokes just aren't funny. Period. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you about Tampax's new ad campaign. You know, we're not number one, but we're up there. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to. It's just not funny, man. It's just right. And why I'm at it, you know, poop jokes. They're not my favorite either. You know, they're a solid number two. <laughs> hey, man, uh, things can always be worse, man. Like a friend of mine, first, I mean, it's, gosh, man, first his wife gets run over by a UPS truck. Mm -hmm. then he gets fired from his job as UPS driver. <laughs> you probably saw that coming. Then. No. Nope. Too, too bad she didn't. <laughs> no, but hey, man, I got to get out of here. I gotta, it's time to go tame the shrew, brother. Uh, I'll see you Thursday night, man. I love y'all. All right. Thank you, Benji. Our Florida man. Florida man. Benzie. Good show tonight. I want to thank all our guests. They were John Ross. John Ross. Don't tell me. John Ross. Uh, Howie Klein. Then David Cobb. Uh, Dr. Harriet Fraud is fine. Uh, she'll be back next week. Uh, Paul LeBeau, Alliance for Money. Then we had uh, Dan Frankenberger in the newsroom, Professor Marianne Cummings, Professor Mike Steinell, uh, Peter B. Collins. I'm leaving somebody out. Well, that's our show. If you would like to attend a live taping, go to my website and hit the attend a live taping button. Don't forget we do office hours Every Friday night at 8 p.m., if you would like an invitation, please go to my website and uh, you'll uh, 
be taken right in. Well, I cannot play our closing number. So I'm just going to say goodbye. I can't do it. Where uh, I, my machine got tired. Uh, all right. I know what I'll do. I'll just play Professor Mike Steinel and stare into the camera and then say goodnight. I'm David Feldman. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak. in the city.